Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the day. We're going to begin the morning with a panel on crypto capitals, Web3 around the world. Just a different, you know, trends and patterns and hubs and the diverse way in which everyone's doing it differently. Can't wait to hear about it. Uh, Debbie Nita from Yap Global will be moderating. Welcome. Hello. Hi, good morning. How was the party last night? <laughs> Tiring. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us at main stage bright and early this Saturday morning. Uh, this morning we're going to be discussing the topic, Crypto Capitals Web3 Around the World. You may already know this, but if you didn't know, um, 115 countries are being represented here at ETH Denver um, by over 20,000 people. <laughs> Pretty impressive, yeah. So I think that's, that makes this topic a really good one for us to discuss um, with our panel today. So um, before we jump into the discussion, I'd love to introduce our speakers this morning. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. I'm Deborah. I'm a senior crypto PR strategist at Yap Global. We're a PR firm. Uh, that is Web3 native, and we work with leading projects and conferences like East Denver in the space. We've also got Sota all the way on, the, on your left-hand side. Um, Sota is the founder of Aster Network and the CEO at Startail Labs. In 2022, Sota was listed in the Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia and Japan, and last year he was selected as one, as one of the 100 most respected Japanese in the world by Newsweek. Um, next to Sota, we've got Richard. Richard is the co-founder and managing partner at Fabric Ventures. Fabric has invested in Web3 builders, businesses, and digital assets globally since 2012, like Polkadot, Ocean Protocol, The Graph, Near One Inch. Richard has previously exited three software companies as an entrepreneur, reaching a cumulative market cap of $2.2 billion. And next to Richard and next to me, we have Min, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Ethereal Ventures, a leading crypto venture firm founded by Min and Joseph Lubin. They have over 40 portfolio companies around the world, including Alio, Eigenlayer, Aztec Protocol, and Spruce ID. So yeah, can we give them a round of applause? Thank you for joining us. OK, we're going to dive right in. So um, I thought we could dis uh, start the discussion by discussing the topic itself, crypto capitals. And for our purposes, we can think of capitals in the sense of cities, states, or even countries. The question is, do we need crypto capitals? Um, and maybe we can think about this in terms of um, Men and Richard, your portfolio companies, and Sota, your startups. Does it matter? And why? Anyone can go ahead and jump right in. OK, I can go then. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think in terms of the company and the project, the crypto project is naturally decentralized, right? Uh, we have uh, six, more than 60 people from 19 different countries. And we have uh, uh, four entities in five regions. So it's pretty decentralized. But uh, in terms of the user's perspective, you know, users have to pay tax. And uh, it is always better to, you know, clearly define what's okay and what's not. And uh, it's also, you know, in Japan, it's super difficult to monitor all transaction and uh, understand the tax percentage and actually the exchange crypto to fiat and pay tax. So I think rules have to be clearly defined for users, and then the project can decide which region to start the project. I think. I would, um, I mean, I echo the, the, that kind of uh, distribution of the different sort of centers of uh, gravity within our uh, portfolio. Um, I think we, um, we're actually backed by the European Investment Fund and 
Um, you know, they naturally want us to encourage activity uh, within the EU 27 plus EFTA and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's tricky because, you know, you may have uh, something that's uh, you know, legally instantiated in Switzerland for a foundation uh, that was originally derived from something that was in Berlin uh, and then folks uh, actually are now in Lisbon a lot because they went there over, over lockdown uh, and then are holidaying in, in, in Ibiza and then um, I guess you might reflect, I mean you encourage us to think about it sort of flexibly, um, if there are crypto capitals they, it could be argued that they're actually kind of Denver and then you know Paris for ECC um, you know, Singapore and then Dubai for Token 2049. You know, that's where often the teams meet for the, for the first time. Uh, but you know, I think it's a very good point about tax from a user perspective, and users are part of these networks actually as right. well, critically. Right. Um, but that's kind of distinct from, I think, um, you know, the projects themselves. So essentially what we're saying is it depends on what we're talking about. Are we talking about yeah. the user in terms of maybe legality? Are we talking about teams and where they are working out of? Uh, like we were discussing earlier, um, we have, I've talked to quite a few people who have just met their teams for the first time at this conference in over two or three years of working together and shipping really great products. And I'm sure this is not new to anyone. So you know where teams are, maybe could be distributed, doesn't need a capital. Um, any thoughts, Min? Yeah, I think Ultimately, if you focus a question on like, you know, where are people building cool things like, you know, which is important because I think smart entrepreneurs either want to build close to their users or they want to build close to other like, you know, talented builders so that they can learn from each other from osmosis and us and investors, we generally go where the smart builders are, you know, mm -hmm. and we just follow along too. So as a result, like because crypto is just inherently very global, you do have the emergence of hubs in every single sort of jurisdiction. I think in, um, in the US you have New York, Austin, you know, San Francisco, Denver. Um, in Europe you see pockets in like, you know, London, Berlin, Paris, and in Asia definitely, you know, in Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, um, and Dubai is also emerging quite quickly too. Um, but to me, I think this, the, you know, the most important crypto capital is still online, like, you know, yeah. ideally on Forecaster. So our online Asian friends can also partake in the discussion. Uh, that's what makes crypto cool. Um, but certainly, you know, there's, um, there's a lot that sort of physical presence can't be replicated. Yeah, no, I'd agree, agree with that. I think um, you want to have those coffee shop moments or, or, you know, be able to sort of sit around the kitchen table when you're first getting projects going. Um, and um, I guess I took a decision, actually. Uh, some of my contemporaries from the university actually went to Silicon Valley to go and start building companies, and I took a decision to try and build companies from... Uh, from Europe and, and in particular from London. Um, but, you know, London, there are, I think in Europe in general, um, it's more distributed and decentralized um, than it has been in the US. And we had a sort of thesis around that that was, it kind of stemmed a little bit from the, the, the original city states of mm -hmm. like, you know, say 500 years ago that had very strong a um, academic uh, credentials and universities that grew out of it. Um, and that, so therefore, you know, you, you know, we've got London and all the whole stretch from kind of Bristol through Oxford, through multiple universities in London, all the way through to Cambridge, that's exceptionally strong in both AI and FinTech. And then that's, you know, obviously supports increasingly strength in, in crypto. Um, but across Europe, everybody embraced open source quite early. Uh, it's, quite, it's hard to sort of fully document, but, you know, Linux, MySQL, they all kind of came from... Uh, from Europe, and we've seen some remarkable successes um, of software companies out of Romania, and so I just met uh, one of our LPs in the lift uh, this morning and told him what we were talking about, and he pointed to uh, a technologist out of Sofia, Bulgaria, who's building a, you know, an exceptionally efficient large language, language model. So I think, you know, it can cro crop up everywhere, and we like to encourage that. So it can naturally emerge from what's happening locally, and then it just starts to attract um, and go from there. Actually, this is a perfect segue into the next part of our question or the next part of our section is are, are, we, seeing, are we seeing builders shift towards any particular capital or space or region maybe more over the last six or 12 months? 
Um, you've mentioned a couple of you know, places in Europe. Min, you've mentioned Dubai. Any, any thoughts on where people um, are moving, congregating? Yeah, I, I, I live in Singapore right now, and originally from Japan, and I'm traveling a lot. I visited, I think, four or five cities in the last two months. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of the developer goes to, like, you know, good, friendly environment, like Dubai, or maybe Singapore and so on. But I, at the same time, in terms of the capital market, it's obviously led by the US. So, but in terms of the adoption, I think a lot of the users are in Asia because let's say NFT or you know, Gamify and so on. It does, not, it does not make sense to earn, let's say, $5 or $3 per hour in the US. But it does make sense in Southeast Asia, for example. So because there are a lot of the users. So much more valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So developers are located in Europe, I guess, Europe, or maybe uh, Dubai. But actually, users are in Asia. And financially speaking, it is led by US. So from the entrepreneurship mindset, it is really important to understand the dynamics of the market and leverage the best part of the country. And I think in terms of sheer numbers, obviously, Asia has some of the largest um, populations who are increasingly or rapidly coming online yeah. and getting familiarized with, with crypto. And we, and, we, and we made the point earlier um, as well made that obviously, you know, users need to know where they're going to get sort of taxed. Um, but underneath that, um, as a group, when we were preparing, I think we reached a consensus. We didn't particularly want to talk about uh, regulation because um, the topic skip comes ahead up to time, time, time and again. Um, but uh, you asked where we could see a kind of, um, should we say, a surge of activity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we definitely have seen um, people getting a little bit frustrated with the uncertainty that exists within the US. And a, a lot of people are doing good work to, to resolve that. But there's, it seems obviously, can, to still be very, fairly politicized. Um, and um, whereas in Europe, there are some regulations that have got, given sufficient clarity um, in general, you know, Mika being one, but, and then jurisdictions that can s comfortably support, you know, kind of neutral entities like foundations, in particular, uh, you know, Switzerland, that I think has encouraged people to, to build there, which has been um, great. And I think there's a lot of clarity in Dubai that's already been mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've been drawn into a whole series of conversations uh, in Dubai uh, and uh, other places in the, in the region. Um, so I, I think, and then we've seen obviously, it's famously, A16Z Crypto has both opened an office in London, in London. and started a crypto startup school in London. We welcome them just as they've been welcomed by um, uh, the, the UK government. Um, it's an unexpected result of Brexit in some senses. <laughs> um, um, and, that's, and that's good, and that, that's a reflection, I think, of everything I just said about the, the frustration. Um, but I think, um, and we were also talking about this a little bit earlier, it's going to become, if we were to get a point to how it should work, is that we should have uh, builders get together, work out how regulation can be addressed from the bottom up and on an emergent basis through innovations you know, around uh, individuals and how they attest to their, their status. Um, and that's gonna be increasingly necessary in this sort of multi-layered cake of, of you know, abstraction that is being built um, uh, where you know, you, you know, one particular DAP may sort of hop between mul multiple different chains uh, and that may, of course, even be dynamic. And how are you going to? How's that going to be regulated from the top down? It's an impossible task. So I think it's a, a, a call to, to builders to try and get regulation or kind of uh, find ways of making sure that we're comfortable with the way that criminality can be managed from the bottom up. So just on that, I, I mean, so we're talking now a little bit more around regulation and how that could work. I mean, we've had so many conversations over the past week in terms of new technological developments that have been happening. We've talked about account abstraction, chain abstraction, modularity. Um, if builders were to participate in a ground up, you know, um, how things should be set up regulatory, in, in, in regulation, how would they even begin? Could they even think about it? How would they even think about it? Well, hopefully they won't have to think about it. I mean, 
ho hopefully this is something that it, it can be in, for, in the spirit of this sort of open, permissionless, you know, immutable code is law, you know, movement. It's something that, you know, if you're using the systems, uh, you will be able to prove that to anybody who cares in the network that you are who you are, you say you are, um, that um, there's, n there's not something that your kind of counterparty needs to know about you before you transact. Um, it's not know your customer or business, it's know your transaction. Um, right. And that, and that um, you know, even stuff like source of funds and, and so forth can be, you can be you can get comfortable with it, which you can ha happen at a, effectively at a protocol level. And so we need the builders to innovate to build that um, and maybe the regulators to understand this as a new paradigm. Right. Um, any thoughts on how, I mean, the two could come together because, you know, so this year is, is quite an important year for crypto in terms of elections. We're seeing general elections happen in major capitals around the world. So in the US, obviously, in the European Union, Indonesia, Pakistan, India, UK, um, potentially. How do we have these two different parts, the, the whole emergence of all these new technologies happening rapidly and then governments trying to figure out what's going on in the space and then trying to provide a layer of guidance, guidelines for things to actually for flourish, for things to actually move forward. Um, so that we were talking earlier about how um, entrepreneurs can only um, take risks when there is clarity. Yeah. Yeah. And so without clarity, it's almost like how do we move forward? And I had lots of these conversations in Europe before Micah yeah. came about and it was almost like a standstill. So any thoughts on yeah. maybe even from a Japanese perspective, what the government is doing? Yeah, um, I, I would like to share the Japanese perspective. I think the first things, first most important things is the regulators are not our enemy. And the worst case is the regulator define crypto law without knowing crypto. This is the worst case. So we have to speak with them. And regulator has a lot of the task to define, right? So we have to get their mind share. And from the Japanese perspective, we lo completely lost in Web2. We don't have a global Web2 company, but Japan used it to be number one in terms of the growth of the economy. And then we have a global company such as Toyota, Sony, and so on. And if we miss Web3, we may lose another 20 years. This is a narrative we are using right now. And then the government understands Web3 is coming, and they also understand they have to invest in Web3 because they missed Web2, and our mm -hmm. economy is not growing. Uh, this is the kind of narrative everybody agree on. So that's why it's easier for us to speak with them. And the Japanese government made Web3 as a national strategy uh, two years ago, and they already changed two or three crypto tax on unrealized gain and uh, uh, tax on companies, so which is also a good move. Um, and I think if, and the good thing is because Japanese government clearly define what's okay and not, and made Web3 a national strategy, big company enter to the market. So for, for, for example, in our case, we got the seed investment from Sony, so we capitally aligned, and we created a joint venture together with Sony, and we are going to deploy public blockchain together with Sony uh, in coming months. We are kind of stealth mode right now, but once we launch the chain, I think this is gonna be one of the biggest projects in the world, I believe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that maybe it's it's lesser known right now what the Japanese government is doing, yep. but I know the prime minister is very, very involved in yep. what's happening in Web3, so maybe it's one that you know everyone could pay a little bit more attention to. Yep. I think we can move on to some interesting topics, thinking about the future and trends. So I think one thing that investors and you know, public relations have in common is that we often get a glimpse of what we're going to see in the news headlines, but six months earlier. You guys are in rooms with entrepreneurs who are developing very new technologies. So take us into these, you know, smoke-filled rooms. What kind of new trends do you think we're going to see in the headlines in six months? And are they emerging from any particular capitals? Um, I think on that front, especially as it relates to adoption, 
Um, we're personally really very excited about like the advent of stablecoin payments. I think we now recognize that stablecoin is a preferred mode of transaction between people and it's super useful as a transport mechanism, also a sec settlement mechanism for admittances and cross-border payments. Um, certainly I think like, you know, not just in um, areas like, you know, LATAM or Southeast Asia, but also in Africa, we're starting to see a, a lot of adoption there. And a lot of amazing builders there also building startups that are sort of next generation payments, a continuation from the fintech kind of, you know, micropayments, lending, neobanks that we saw. Um, and I think that's really going to take center stage and highlight how stable coins can actually permeate people's lives on an everyday basis and provide real utility. I will start off by echoing that, Tilly. We, we did a little a panel with folks from you know, PayPal and uh, Circle and, Sol and, and Solana and Ledger on stable coins, and we have uh, folks like um, uh, Dew and, and uh, you know, Nilos and um, uh, about a dozen different payments-related uh, companies in our portfolio, and we've seen um, really great success from Cosmos, uh, which is a, uh, you know, a very well adopted, arguably one of the most well adopted dApps running in the near ecosystem, which has uh, got a bunch of interesting things converging within it actually to sort of get on to, um, to, to your question. Um, it's got a, elements of sort of social co commerce and, and loyalty and so forth baked, baked into it, uh, which we see, have seen as being particularly strong uh, coming out of um, Asia. Um, and there our thesis is a little bit about um, uh, people call it different things, you know, people as the platform, headless or leaders, leaderless sort of um, uh, marketplaces or networks um, where you get this intersection of, of, you know, DeFi and Web3 social to kind of, you know, people can aggregate around, you know, something they believe in and then tra and transact around. Um, so it's that combined with, uh, to kind of, to make it into a strap line the ability to outstrip Stripe uh, in terms of embedded low cost, you know, kind of uh, uh, payments, on, you know, using stable coins. And then um, also combining actually something that um, we think builds on some of the strength across uh, Europe. And we've seen, you know, Mistral obviously in France, and as I mentioned, the AI strength uh, in, in the UK. Uh, and that is the um, the extremely popular topic of AI X crypto, uh, the mm -hmm. popular at least. Um, Certainly here in uh, the conversations, not, I don't think, the smoke-filled rooms uh, here in <laughs> East Denver. That's not really been the vibe. T coffee, I would say more. More um, coffee. Um, and I was pleased to, pleased to read, by the way, of a, there's a nutritional uh, outfit that uses AI called Zoe in the UK. And, I, and the, the founder posted today that uh, he, he used to not drink coffee. And now he's drinking coffee because the research is telling him that it's actually good for you in a number of ways. I was overjoyed. To, to you read that this morning, over actually. Into that. <laughs> yeah, um, but but I think the, that we're beginning to see in those kind of DAPs um, the movement, a really fundamental movement, which is going to be um, a convergence of the capability, the AI capabilities. So should we think of it as an LLM operating system with a kind of blockchain operating system? Uh, some folks calling it a sort of sovereign operating system. Uh, which ultimately will deliver, you know, contextual application experiences to you that don't require apps and therefore don't require app stores in the same way. Um, so that's, you know, it doesn't take um, a genius to work out that if you're uh, taking out the 30% rake that, that exists or take that exists in the app store and circumventing um, Apple in different ways, that that's a, it's a fundamental shift. So how would users industry. access them? Uh, well. It's open permissionless systems that 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 your um, you have multiple devices that understand uh, both your personal context because you've shared you know they know your identity they know some of the history of what you've purchased your loyalty all of the different tribes and DAOs that you belong to uh, what used to be known in the sort of Facebook sense as your kind of interest graph uh, but now maybe you've, it's easy to share it and it's going to be um, token attested uh, through your, you know, your travels. Um, and then also understanding your precise, you know, I'm, I'm here in Denver, I'm, you know, up here in, on, you know, in the radio center, um, and it will work out what it is that you need. What do you want to hear about? 
I didn't work out maybe even if, if it's allowed to know that, um, who you're talking to. Um, and so the point is that the concept of an app um, doesn't really exist outdated. anymore. Yeah, it's just a continually personalized experience, almost, almost in a sense of a stream to you. And so, but that's a, it's a fundamental shift, but I don't think it's very far away. There's the rabbit badge you probably might have seen la launched that I, you know, I, I know nothing about other than what one has seen through the launch um, that is starting to kind of deliver on some of that. Uh, but I think it will, you know, lots of different devices around your person will collaborate in order to, to deliver what you need. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, for me, I would like to see uh, mass adoption. So our mission is Web3 for billion. Right. And uh, I would like to make the wall where people are using Web3 in a daily life, just like internet of today. And to do so, I think leveraging the existing business is easier than collecting, getting the user from scratch. So I personally would like to see more enterprise adoption to leveraging existing business. I mean, integrating Web3 protocol, decentralized technology into existing business. How do you think those conversations are going? I mean, they're also, I guess, trying to wrap their heads around how all of this works. We are yeah. trying to wrap our heads around how, how all of this works. Um, have you seen any of these conversations happen yeah. and how the movements are going? Yeah, I'm a big Web3 believer. So I think protocol have to be decentralized, but in terms of the interface, in terms of the user or maybe corporate strategy, it can be centralized. The community and the protocol are different. And we have been working with Sony, so, you know, uh, in, it is, they think it is not possible to compete with, let's say, Google or maybe Facebook by making centralized platform. So it is better for the Japanese company to create more demo demographic de you know, the platform, which can be Web3. So they are still looking for the you know, possibilities, but I hope we can convince them to make it happen. Yeah. I, I, I totally support that. Um, we have some experience in um, the enthusiasm around sort of there's a, an event called Cell GP that Nira has sponsored to try and create a new relationship between the athletes and the fans in there. Um, I think, and, and we also see it around uh, uh, the ICC, International Cricket Council, um, and then a whole, a whole series of um, other support sports um, that one could tap into. And obviously sports has become an increasingly well commercialized and very lucrative um, you know, business. Uh, it's attracted the attention of private equities, a different kind of part of the kind of ecosystem <clears throat> and buying them up and backing them. But I think, you know, exactly as just described, um, there's an opportunity to get away from today's platforms. Like if you want to create a relationship between the athletes and the fans, you don't have to do that on Instagram or do that on Twitter or do that. Sure. You, can, you can create your own community through web, you know, through technologies and one that is much more potent, um, you know, both in terms of the long tail, but also in terms of how you can serve the the, the classic thousand true fans, if you've read that post. Um, so I think that's another really exciting kind of frontier. Well, we've just got a couple of minutes left. I thought, you know, since we've not talked about the US that much, yeah. we're sitting <laughs> talking about the rest of the world here. Um, in terms of the conversations you guys are having with your portfolio companies and so that like your own plans and other builders that you work with, where do you see US placed on the short and midterm plans? So I think from our perspective and disclosure, you know, more, more than half of our portfolio is US based. I think we talk a lot about adoption happening in the East and that might be true in terms of numbers, like, you know, in terms of like DAUs and MAUs. But the spend is definitely the highest in the, U in the U.S. still. It's probably 10x higher um, than what you see in Asia, for example. So it continues to be a really important uh, market. And I think, you know, we've encouraged our portfolio companies to continue engaging U.S. users. Um, you know, I think for certainly, like, depending on the type of protocol or mm -hmm. business that you're building, um, we've seen, say, some founders who are building more trading or, like, centralized exchange type projects, like, move out to Asia, move out to Dubai, where they have a little bit more clarity and they have the ability to get licensed and operate in a regulated way. Um, or if you're building a protocol, maybe moving to Europe because, you know, they feel um, like there's a little bit more 
protection if they're like, you know, with the sort of foundation model there as well. Um, but certainly I think the U.S. is front and center one of the key markets in crypto and we also see it in New York that's uh, become such like a hotbed for great talent and great founders who build good teams and they get together mm -hmm. very often so lots of great osmosis there. Yeah, I think we don't have much time so to make a long story short, I think money and talent the U.S. is going to lead but the adoption Asia is going to lead. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um we invest globally, so we see projects around the world, but about two-thirds in, uh, in Europe. Um, I think it'll continue to be very distributed and, and, and borderless. Um, I think if I was to um, try and prompt people in Europe to um, further propel that ecosystem, the main challenge over there is actually um, LPs to back venture firms. Um, and so, you know, I, we can't argue with the strength of the funding profile within the, the U.S., sure. Um, so, <clears throat> LPs assemble. LPs assemble. Great. Um, well, that's the end of our conversation for this morning. Um, if you want to reach any of the panelists, um, feel free to find them on Sosota on Twitter. You can find him at W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E, Sota, Watanabe, I think, Soba, uh, so Sota, and then Richard, um, uh, his full name as well, on on. On, the, uh, sorry, on Twitter, that's Richard Muir, Muirhead. Yes. And, and Min on, on Twitter as well, underscore Min Tio. And I'm on Twitter as well, Deborah Nita28. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello. Hello, and thank you guys for that. That was really great. Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, while we're doing a little bit of rearranging, I present to you one Sam Kessler. He's going to be moderating a panel on DAO governance, and we were talking right beforehand. And we knew we were going to have to riff for a moment, and he asked if there were going to be any DAO jokes. And he said they don't exist. And I said, ha, ChatGPT is on it. So, first up, uh, why is a DAO like an onion? You tell me. Uh, layers of complexity, and it might make you cry. Anybody, anybody. Okay, okay. Right, Why no, is good. a DAO like a mullet? I don't know. Uh, business in the front, chaos in the back? We'll get into that. <laughs> um, anything else? Oh, Let's see. Gotcha. Uh, so Why don't DAOs get lonely? Oh, because they have too many smart contracts for, <laughs> for company. company. What are these doing? <laughs> uh, DAOs are the potlucks of the crypto world. Every <laughs> Where's that one? Everyone brings something to the table, but you might not want to eat it. You might not. Mm -hmm. A DAO's voting system is like choosing a movie with friends. It takes forever, and no one's happy with the results. <laughs> <laughs> Why do DAOs love blockchain? I don't know. Because they can't resist a chain of command that's actually a chain of confusion. That's pretty good. You, you guys are going to fix all this, right? Like, you, you have all the answers? Like, every oh, last it's one? it's not me. They might. They might. Oh, right. Um, well, fantastic. Wait, there's, we got time for one more, oh, I think. Do we, do we? Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so... Uh, DAOs, decentralizing the art of making decisions no one can agree on. That's, it, uh, that's the funniest one, I think. So All right. I, I mean, it's funny because it's true, but also, like, is it fixable? We want to know, and I we'll can't see. wait to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, take it away, Sam and crew. All right. Hello, hello, hello. Um, please, anybody who can hear me, join us. Uh, this is sparsely attended, but there will be more people, I'm sure. So I'm Sam Kessler. I am a reporter and editor at Coindesk, focused on tech and protocols. I'm joined by Tekken Salimi of Dow5, Ben DeFrancesco of Scopelift, Jessica Smith of Aragon, and Noma Kanu of Stable Lab. Not in order. I tried to get it in order. Um, please excuse me for having my phone out. Um, I tried writing down questions, then the pages. It just got very disorganized. So first off, um, I, I think we're going to start um, with a very simple question that I have for all of you, um, and then we can get into more of a conversation, I hope. But in addition to telling me maybe briefly um, what you do, what your organization does, um, we're going to start down the line with Ben. Maybe you can tell me your definition, as brief as you can make it, of what a DAO actually is, a decentralized autonomous organization. What is that? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Ben DeFrancesco. I uh, work at Scopelift. We're a dev agency that's primarily focused on 
uh, governance engineering, so you know, building the software and tools that enable DAO governance to function. Um, I think really fundamentally what a DAO is, is a, uh, it's, for lack of a better word, a competitor to like traditional company formation. Um, so it's a way to have digitally native, internet native um, firms and organizations um, that are basically where the jurisdiction is on chain, so to speak. And I think that enables a whole bunch of new kinds of stuff and we're just the very early stages of scratching the surface of what that looks like and you know, that's why I'm personally excited about DAOs. Awesome, Jessica? So riffing off this, what is sure. a DAO? Um, so we have, I think the definition we're working with, which is maybe simplistic, is that a DAO is an organization, so a group of agents that are coordinating to achieve um, some kind of goal uh, that is facilitated by smart contracts on a public blockchain. And so essentially, I think, if you want to make it a little bit more pragmatic, it's you need to have some kind of asset that you're governing on chain, whether that's a protocol, smart contracts, tokens, et cetera. Um, and you need to have membership on chain. So either you're holding a token, you're a token holder, or you're whitelisting addresses, and then your membership um, makes proposals to do certain actions with those assets. And that's kind of a breakdown. And you hopefully want to do that in a way where you're preserving or protecting the, the values of the public blockchain that you're building on. So that's where the decentralization comes in, the trustlessness comes in, the transparency, um, the verifiability of, of transactions, et cetera. Um, you know, we're building these organizations on a blockchain like Ethereum um, for a reason. So I think DAOs are a way to extend those properties and extend the, the value of the chain you're building on. Thank you so much. I'm Noma. I'm from Stable Lab. We are a governance firm. We do everything from service provisioning, um, framework design. We also run a couple nodes across different networks, which allows us to have good stake in the governance that we participate in. Um, my definition of what a DAO is, um, they're internet communities with very large treasuries and lots of drama. I'm just kidding. But um, they are actually blockchain enabled tools for social coordination um, is I think the most simple definition I can give and it's extremely layered of course as we can see and of course as my fellow panelists um, expanded upon. Hey guys, I'm Tekken Salimi. I'm the founder of a fund called DAO5. Uh, we've been around for about two years. We're a little bit unique in that we're actually just a traditional venture fund right now. There's nothing that's DAO-like about us. But in the future, we plan to convert the general partner entity, the actual investment manager of the funds, into a DAO. What that means, I don't exactly know yet, but um, the main principle is that governance and, and financial stakes will be given to all the portfolio founders of our fund. In terms of the question, what is a DAO? Um, it's an interesting question because you ask five people, you can get like six different answers. But to me, I, I subscribe to a broader idea of what a DAO can be. And that's mostly any set of stakeholders that are unified by a token, which has governance as a main feature of the token. So a DAO could do one thing very specifically today, but the, the governance should be robust enough that stakeholders can vote and, and change the mandate of what the DAO does, change the mandate of what the token is and like the economics of it. Um, we're still in the early days of this, so it's gonna be a fun problem to ideate on in the future. Awesome, maybe to, to kind of switch gears a little bit, Noah, we were talking backstage about DAO tooling. Um, you um, work a lot with DAO tooling as a contributor to a lot of protocols. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the state of those tools and maybe if you can you know, try to help our audience understand what these tools are that I'm talking about. Of course, um, I could speak from a delegate perspective. So I contribute to a couple Ethereum DAOs, um, Lido DAO, Liquid Staking. Um, I also contribute to Safe DAO and StarkNet. Um, and I think the state of DAO tooling is very robust, um, but unfortunately there isn't quite enough connectivity across these tools. Um, we have Snapshot, of course, which is like core infrastructure of the network, allows token holders to participate in decision making in each of these DAOs. Um, I like to think about Snapshot as like a small tool that's like an add-on to what is already happening in different DAOs. And then we have on-chain um, governance modules like Aragon, for example, which I participate with um, on Lido DAO. Um, and then we have Tally, which probably is my favorite like on-chain turnkey solution for managing DAOs where you can do everything from setting up the DAO to distributing tokens, getting delegates in there, um, managing the treasury as well. 
Um, and yeah, I think the state of DAO tooling, it currently serves what governance is right now, but I like to think a lot about the future, future proof like governance and thinking about governance experiments. Um, and I tend to think that what we currently have still has quite a bit of a way to go um, in the way that it serves different forms of contributors, um, people with various sort of like um, tolerance for governance, um, different altitudes of decision making within the DAOs. Um, of course, DAOs are not monolithic, and I think that the tools that we use should be able to reflect like the sort of like vastness in, in, in what we could really do with DAOs. And that's just like a simple snapshot, but there's, there's so much more happening in, in the realm of DAO tooling that I think we can all speak to. And Benetesca, you work with build tools. I wonder, feel free to chime in throughout this whole thing. I wonder if either of you have thoughts on kind of where things can go um, and where things are. Yeah, we were just chatting about this, actually walking up um, on stage. Uh, from Aragon's perspective, uh, Aragon was deployed the first DAO framework in 2017. Um, and DAOs have a lot, evolved a lot since then. I think we've learned a lot as an industry, industry since. Um, and I feel in terms of the current state of DAO tooling, um, one of the challenges that we have or the kind of corner we need to turn um, is bringing more customization and granularity to what a DAO can do, um, particularly on chain. So making it easier um, for DAOs, for different kinds of DAOs, managing different kinds of assets like protocols, smart contracts, different types of treasuries, to be able to have governance models that meet their, their unique needs a lot better. Um, so we re-architected our tech stack and actually launched a new tech stack last year, this time at East Denver. Um, our protocol, the new version of our protocol is called Aragon OSX. And what that enables um, DAOs to do is to uh, build custom plugins. So basically you have a vault that holds whatever asset you're governing, and then the governance logic of your DAO lives in a plugin. So this makes it easier for DAOs to customize their governance models, but not only that, where the power truly is in that, what we hope to see next is that um, protocols and projects come up with these custom or unique governance models, things like dual governance, multi-body governance, cross-chain um, governance, and create these new models that then other DAOs can easily replicate. So they'll be e easily able to grab that open source plugin, plug it into their DAO, and even change their governance model over time. So you can stay in your DAO, you can use your current governance model and upgrade to a new one. So you're seeing, oh, this project's doing something interesting. I want to use that plugin and just making that process easier um, where you know, growing these, these network effects in this ecosystem, we can all benefit from what we're learning. But Ben can talk, uh, I'm sure, a lot more on like the customization work that, that this entails, and um, it is a heavy lift. Yeah, so I totally agree that, uh, like, I think a modular or extensible pl plugin-based architecture is definitely the direction that we want to be moving in. I think when you think of, I think one of the challenges that we've seen with DAOs is there was this kind of initial wave of incite excitement about them, and a lot of DAOs launched. And um, the clock speed of innovation has been a little slower than I would like to see because I think what happens is the DAOs get a little conservative once they're live and on chain, right? Once these contracts are managing, you know, um, in some cases, billions of dollars worth of assets, um, managing the protocol, which can have billions of dollars worth of assets locked in it, they're hesitant to change these core contracts because if they make a mistake, then there could be loss of funds or worse that you know, comes along with that, right? So, um, but what that does is it slows down the pace of innovation. So now we only get new experiments when new DAOs launch or when a DAO is sort of uh, you know, brave enough, so to speak, to go through the process of a big upgrade of their governance contracts. And so I think having a more extensible plug-in modular-based uh, approach is gonna allow the, the clock speed to move a lot faster. And so, we're working more in the governor ecosystem, but trying to extend and expand um, the surface area of the governor contracts to enable that same sort of, of model. I think another aspect beyond just like the plug-in kind of uh, aspect or the module-based system is also the permissionless aspect of it is really important, right? So wherever a DAO can give its members, give like the you know broad public the ability to create things that plug into the DAO in some way, um, without you know, compromising the core security of the DAO itself, that is really powerful in and of itself. Because now that experimentation, like people can just try things out and that allows 
um, you know, things to move a lot faster. So that's the architecture that we're trying to push the ecosystem toward as well, not because we think we have an exact idea of where DAOs should go, but because we want to enable the, the experimentation that will allow us to figure that out over time. So um, for the remainder of the panel, we've got like 18 minutes left. I think we've had a good overview of what a DAO is, kind of what the state of tooling is, um, if that's a, a correct um, grammatical um, whatever um, construction. Tekken, um, I, I want to talk about what you're thinking about with regards to what powers should token holders have in this sort of a system that you're ideating. You said that a DAO is just token holders, you know, having control over a system. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I will say, I'll caveat everything I'm about to say with the fact that we're very early in figuring out what our token model is going to look like, what type of DAO, DAO5 will ultimately be. But I think um, some of our inspirations were largely, for instance, Nouns DAO, where the governance tokens themselves were NFTs. There's this like automated auction every 24 hours. There isn't a sense that you're just pouring money into this black pit or this uh, team against you that uh, is raising money by selling these, but rather every dollar that's contributed to this system forms a treasury that goes into investing and theoretically the value of that just attributes back to the NFT holders. That's a big inspiration. And uh, the other common thread that I'm trying to establish before converting into a DAO is just kind of a shared culture. I think culture is one of the important underlying elements or like the foundational pieces that keep people engaged and feel like everyone's on the same team ultimately by owning tokens. We've seen a lot of instances in the early DAO experiments where you kind of have this dynamic of retail versus whales and there's this like negative sentiment by individual holders against the big VCs that own a lot of the governance tokens or the founding team. There, there's this like sentiment that their voice and governance doesn't matter. But I think theoretically if you can just align people with a common set of goals and a common values, uh, you solve a lot of those problems over time. Bit of a uh, vague answer, but those are some of the things we're thinking about. I mean, so, so again, to get a little more specific too, Noma, I know you've all done some work. I, I at least know with like, I feel like with Uniswap, you had done some things around, I don't know if you, it was you personally, but you kind of um, spearheaded a proposal to make it so that smaller delegates had more power within the voting system. Um, can you talk about what motivated that and how, you know, did it work and how can you move that to other DAOs, that kind of a model? Right, absolutely. I think one issue across like all DAOs and all governance systems, not just like DAOs in general, is participation. Um, and that is like something that has emerged as one of the pain points in decentralized autonomous organizations. And I think delegation came up as one of the more viable solutions. So delegation is like a form of liquid democracy where token holders are able to delegate voting power to people who might be better equipped, have more time to participate in governance. Um, and we're always looking for ways to make delegation more effective, less sticky, um, and just like welcome new perspectives and new contributors into governance. Um, with the Uniswap um, proposal specifically, which is still sort of like in the temp, well, it's past the temp check phase and it's good to see that the community is supportive of that motion. Um, we really wanted to make sure that there, were, there was enough voting power for underrepresented delegates who um, have expressed the will to participate in Uniswap governance to have that power to like influence decisions. Um, more specifically, I um, work in the Lido DAO. Um, Lido is like core infrastructure on the Ethereum network. And um, we see that a lot of on-chain motions fail in Lido because they just don't hit quorum. And that's like a symptom, of course, of low participation. And so this idea came that um, why don't we like, you know, move the Lido governance module to a whole other platform my personal favorite, sorry for the bias, Tally. Um, and it turned out that token holders just did not have appetite for that type of migration. And so we had to work with the current um, Lido like governance module, which is situated on a very old version of Aragon. And unfortunately, the Lido token does not have governance interfaces. So we're currently in the space where we are exploring a few different workarounds with the compound Governor Bravo contract, um, and the token manager to see how we can enable um, on-chain delegation um, just to inspire more participation and make sure that like we're able to, like um, Ben said, innovate more rapidly, take on more governance experiments. Like Lido is thinking about dual governance, which essentially would allow stakeholders um, veto on-chain motions. Um, and I would really love to see like 
examples like that taken and applied across different DAOs to just help them innovate a bit faster, move forward a bit faster, and like, of course, like meet the needs of the community in a, in a more sustainable way. If I can jump in here quick, I guess Lido is governed um, with Aragon smart contracts, um, an earlier version of, of Aragon OS. And what you're speaking to is precisely um, the problem that we've been working on solving in this re-architecture. And like what Ben was mentioning, when you're governing that amount of assets, you kind of, you can end up getting locked into um, your governance models and things change fast and things move fast. So we saw this problem um, with these DAOs that have been deployed on Aragon and on this um, infrastructure that might need to evolve their governance over time. And um, you know, we, we were quite close with the team at, at Lido as well, and Lido's pushing some ideas um, in, in terms of you know, optimistic dual governance, for instance, which inspired us building this plugin um, to, to bring these new governance models to life because it is important for these DAOs and even the DAOs that have like, very high security needs um, to be able to evolve their governance over time um, so that is, you know, the problem statement, basically, and the challenge um, that we've focused on on solving with this new architecture of our of our tech stack. Maybe, uh, oh, Ben, go ahead. Well, well I was just going to jump in and say, like, adding on to what Nomo was discussing in terms of, you know, delegation um, of, you know, token voting weight is aimed at solving this problem of, you know, should every single token holder be kind of voting on and, you know, do they have the expertise and the knowledge and the time to be intimately involved with every detailed decision that the DAO needs to make. And so delegation helps address that problem. Um, I think professionalizing delegation in the way that, that you guys are, Noma, also helps to do that. But then I think there's a further question of like, do the delegate, do, do delegates need to be voting on every intricate detailed decision as well? And so I think one of the things we're starting to see emerge is this idea of kind of uh, roles and permissions within the DAO enforced on chain with smart contracts where you can delegate different, um, not just voting weight, but delegate responsibilities to different entities. And those entities can kind of serve as the principal agent, you know, aimed at, you know, solving a specific problem, managing a specific um, resource on chain, but uh, ultimately their, uh, their privileges roll back up to the delegates and the token holders. And so the delegates mm -hmm. can serve more as almost like a board of directors style role where their responsibility is sort of making sure that the various entities that have been given the privileges within the system are doing their job and evaluating if it's being executed on well, and if it's not, then those um, responsibilities can be revoked and transferred onto another entity. And so that's like a very basic you know, kind of thing within like companies, say, for example, like having hierarchical responsibilities and roles. Um, but it's something that we're just starting to figure out in the kind of DAO on-chain context. And so that's where I think like we're in the early innings, the, the iteration needs to occur, but the, the tooling is getting better really fast for solving problems like this. So um, Jessica, I know Aragon um, you know, has its own DAO and you've had your own experiments um, you know, with token-based governance. And there was like this controversy last year where you know, token holders voted to make it, to enable redemption so that you had this over $100 million worth of you know, um, cryptocurrency in a treasury. Token holders voted to, you know, make redemptions possible so they could get a share of that treasury. And then the Aragon, you know, um, association, the, the, the team itself, eventually, after 12 months of not allowing redemptions, made the central decision to allow a part of the treasury to be redeemed, but not the remainder of the treasury. And there remains a bunch of controversy around the unredeemed token. So there's still tokens sitting here that people have not redeem themselves over $50 million worth at you know, my last checking. And people are concerned that Aragon might take those tokens for themselves, for the team. And I'm curious, first off, like, what are you going to do about those tokens? And then we can talk about what this means from a governance standpoint. Yeah, um, I'm just going to have to lay the facts, a little sure. bit of the facts set to, to give folks more context. Um, but Aragon had an ICO in 2017. Um, and raised uh, $20 million in ETH at the time in order to advance this mission, in order to build DAO tooling. And over time, there were a lot of changes in the Aragon project, um, turnover in the team, changes in the technology, advancing different products, et cetera. And um, Aragon building DAO, DAO tooling was always committed um, to moving you know, into a DAO. So there were a lot of different experiments that happened over time. Um, for instance, Aragon 
launched the first grant program after Ethereum, then there were different kind of ways to decentralize the teams, decentralize the contributions, had a community DAO that was kind of optimistic based, and then token holders voted to move in the full treasury and the full project into a delegate based mm -hmm. voting DAO. Um, and what happened at that time is that the incentives of token holders that, you know, for a token that was launched five, more than five years prior hadn't really followed the ecosystem due to all the changes that happened over time. Changes in product, changes in the, the teams, changes in the culture. So those, in, those interests and those incentives are very hard to, uh, to align. And essentially different groups that had the token had different agendas and incentives. So when the treasury started getting moved on chain, there's a certain group of token holders who bought up the Aragon token um, that were advocating for certain financial measures to be sure. taken sure. Um, in order to um, make sure. They were like money. activist investors, risk-free yeah, exactly. value, like, the RFV raiders. Exactly. And what happens when you know, you're in a DAO and you have a legal wrapper, for instance, and that you're in a jurisdiction, that's you know pros and cons. That's a whole other panel in and of itself, or multiple ones. Um, but your hands are a little tied in terms of what you can. So you're saying do. it would have been impossible for you to open up redemption. So basically, the token holders voted to you know open up redemptions for this full treasury, and it was regulatory reasons that you had to reserve some of that treasury for yourselves? No, no, sorry. So token holders um, voted to move into a delegate DAO, then token holders bought up tokens to advocate for different measures. There's a range of measures, like buybacks, um, liquidating the entire treasury, this kind of thing. So there was, um, token holders were just kind of advocating in the forum, et cetera. Um, it's the Aragon Association that decided in order to resolve this kind of underlying tension and conflict that had been in the project, it's the, Aragon, it's the association that um, decided to do the redemption initiative. So the redemption initiative was, was a proactive initiative to return the majority of the treasury to token holders for a redemption period of one year. Um, and that was done in a way that also enables the mission of the project to continue. So who makes that decision is the real question. Like in a DAO, sorry to single you out, but I think this yeah. is really interesting. Like it, you, you mentioned the association did decide to keep some of that currency and there's more than $50 million still outstanding that people haven't redeemed that right now is still kind of sitting there that might, you know, I, I don't know what's gonna happen and I'm asking you, no. but who makes the decision on what to do with those things if not the token holders that voted to open up redemptions entirely? Yeah, so the stakeholders of the association that were in the association made the decision um, to move to move this treasury into the and redemption And who are the contract? stakeholders of the association? Like the board of the association. And so I guess the question becomes, what is a DAO? Like is a DAO the association? Is a DAO token holders? Because we were talking about, not to, again, like this is, seems aggressive, but it is like, this is yeah. at the core of many DAOs. It's, um, you know, it's a hard question because, you know, people, you know, do you, do you want a legal wrapper? You know, is, is a question that's often um, used, like in DAOs, you know, do you have a legal wrapper? And having a legal wrapper of a nonprofit association that's based in a country, which is, which is Switzerland, you do have certain obligations. So an association has a mission and has a purpose, and the board of that association is bound to that mission or bound to that purpose. So you can't do, you know, whatever you want. And it's a really great tension and um, that, that you raise, you know, this tension that, that um, comes up with the interests of stakeholders or token holders and the legal obligations you might have, you know, having these kinds of legal entities. That's the solution that this association came to was to send the majority of the treasury um, as much as could be sent to the redemption contract at the end of the one year period to clarify this association has dissolved all of the legacy stakeholders have removed themselves from the project sent the treasury well, some of them have kept their money in because they want to wait and see how the rest of this is resolved how the rest of the treasury is dealt with um, and there are some folks who you know we don't know what's going on with their tokens but they've just kept them there because they're from you know they might be lost they might be you know have used like a legacy version yes. of the yeah Absolutely. So um, we're doing everything that we can, and the project is doing everything that we can for token holders to be aware that this redemption period is over. Um, but essentially, it's a new board of stakeholders that will be industry stakeholders that, that need this technology to work, that are, that are building on Aragon, have built on Aragon, that's the, sure. the stakeholders you know, projects like Lido that should have a voice about how the, the direction of this in, the infrastructure and where it should go. So it's going to be a new board of stakeholders that are external to the project um, that's going to be set up, and that board will decide how to advance the mission um, with the funds that, that will potentially remain so at the end of the you redemption. 
can't tell us what's going to happen. And I'm sorry, we're going to move past this, but you can't tell us what's going to happen with those, you know, more than $50 million in that treasury. No, I can't tell you. And none of the Aragon core teams, like none of my team, one, either had significant um, voting power or token power in this, and none of us were either part of the association. We were just heads down building, and we were committed to shipping this tech stack and, you know, building Aragon OSX and moving it forward. Um, and we also will not be, you know, we're the redemption contract or what is left is not coming to this team. This team is building this tech stack. It will be a new board of external stakeholder that will decide how the mission continues. And if it's with this tech stack, the mission is to advance DAO technology and DAO tooling. And Aragon has done this since 2017. And yes, it's had ups and downs. And yes, it's had tur a full turnover in the team. It's had a full turnover in the te tech stack and a full turnover in the structure. Um, but this is hard. I, you know, sure. <laughs> figuring out like DAO governance and the Great. governance of projects is hard. And we're just going to take the next best step in terms of making the project as resilient as we can and continuing to build this infrastructure. Ben, you were about to. Chime yeah, well, in. I mean, zooming out from the specifics of the Aragon situation, if I could, I mean, I think what you're bringing up is like uh, one of the big open questions um, around DAOs and maybe even crypto more broadly, which is like. You know, as I alluded to earlier, one of the reasons to prefer or like a DAO is that your, your jurisdiction, in a sense, kind of moves on chain. But of course, people that participate in these DAOs still live in various different legal jurisdictions, have their own, have the laws of those jurisdictions that they have to follow. If you have uh, other legal entities that are, you know, related to or involved in the DAO, members of those, of those, uh, entities have fiduciary responsibilities and other things that they have to follow. And so what does the interface look like between, you know, the rules that are encoded in smart contracts on chain and, you know, these various legal uh, and social rules that we have in the real world? Um, and that's a huge unresolved tension um, in DAOs and really the whole crypto space. Uh, again, a whole different panel that we could have a, a very long conversation on, but I think it's, um, it's really interesting and one of the things that very much has to be figured out over time. So who ultimately should decide, um, this is for maybe Noma or Tekken, um, you know, should decide how much stakeholders in a DAO are compensated? That's a big question. I mean, some of our sponsors here are dealing with that question. Is it a team? Is it the DAO itself? Should they vote on these payroll decisions, which is a hard thing to, you know, do day to day? How do you make those decisions? Um, I will say incentives and like balancing incentives is, an existential problem in DAOs. Um, to an extent, I think with early DAOs and sort of the, the notion of progressive decentralization, it's easy to sort of impose these incentive structures um, without much community input. But I think as a DAO grows and scales and there are more um, participants and contributors with context, we can actually decentralize the decision making around like how much contributors should be paid, how they should be incentivized, whether it should be monetary rewards or reputational rewards and things like that. And I'm happy that that is actually something that we are progressing um, through in like DAO governance. Of course, we have like shining examples with like MakerDAO and their delegation like system and delegate incentives um, and less like shining examples. But I think in, in, in all in all, I think the ideal version of this would be for the DAO itself, the community, um, and everyone would stake to be able to decide like how much people get incentivized and what that actually looks like. We got 24 seconds. <laughs> Any okay. thoughts on this? You've said most of it, but I'll just um, add, I agree that I think token holders should ultimately vote on economic decisions of those tokens. We saw this a lot in DeFi 1.0, the launch of Compound. Uh, for a long time, there were no economics attributing to those tokens, but you eventually, when you feel comfortable with how decentralized the network is, that there's some, uh, like, that governance decisions actually accurately represent the wants and needs of token holders, you vote to turn on economics. We also saw this recently with Uniswap. I believe in that model most uh, fundamentally. All right, thank you, Tekken. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I think we had a fun, spicy panel. I hope you all enjoyed and are glad you stuck around. And yeah, thanks, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, you guys. That was really great. You know, it uh, gave some insight into what we might be able to do. It's uh, really good stuff. How many of you guys are uh, coming to the closing party tonight at RealWorks from 9 to 2? It's the place to be. You guys knew it a few hands? Just one or two, and everyone else is going home. We're out of here. Uh, I'm curious just to uh, get to know the, uh, the lay of the crowd, too. Uh, how many of you are... Builders, 
software engineers, product managers, designers. How many are on the business side? Sales, marketing, go to market. Decent mix. Makes sense. Well, um, we are uh, beyond excited at uh, what is about to happen. So we've got uh, Jennifer Sanasi from Coindesk. She's going to be in conversation with Brittany Peterson. She's a local representative uh, here in Colorado, Colorado 7, for US Congress. She's on the Financial Services Committee. So uh, she's, uh, they're going to be talking about the crypto conversation in Washington. It's time for, uh, you know, the, the government needs to be able to meet the moment. And uh, like we were hearing in the panel just now, a moment ago, like, uh, you know, when, when we're talking in the crypto, crypto capitals of the world, that uh, it's, people are gonna start looking elsewhere and all this amazing innovation that we're doing here in the US, like may not be as possible and the regulations like aren't as clear and people don't know what's going on. So it's just uh, really awesome to see people that are not from this background, learning and doing the work and making sure that uh, the conversation needs to happen. Welcome very much, Jennifer and Brittany. Hello, everyone. We got our liquid deaths. We're ready to talk about regulation. It's going to be real <laughs> <laughs> exciting. OK, we are taking the conversation from DAO governance to IRL government. And we're talking about the crypto conversation in DC. I know you just welcomed us, but just please join me in welcoming again Congresswoman Brittany Pedersen. I'm really excited you, to be everybody. speaking with her today. All right, no, no booze here, guys. We're just here to have a good time. All right, uh, Brittany, here we are sitting at ETH Denver. Uh, just for folks who don't know you, I'd love a brief introduction. Talk to us about your journey and how you ended up to where you are now. Thank you. Well, great to be with you all today. Thanks for sticking around to have this important conversation. As you already know, my name is Brittany Patterson, and I represent the seventh congressional district, which is just to the west of where you all are here in Denver. Uh, I grew up in the district. I represented the area for 10 years in the legislature, and I am highly unlikely to be in Congress. In fact, I was very unlikely to graduate high school, um, but I was given a chance to build a better life, and that's what inspired me to get involved working for Democratic candidates that were going to invest in those critical public services and in investments that actually give people like me, regular people, a chance to succeed. Um, so I went down a path working for Democratic candidates uh, and issues, and I stepped up to run when a seat opened up in 2012. Um, so while I've been serving in the state legislature, I focused on uh, public education and public health issues mostly. I was also the chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, and when I went to Congress and I was asked what, I was just elected in the, in the last election, and when I was asked what committee I wanted to be on, I asked to be on financial services because of the housing crisis. It's one of the subcommittees to work on housing policy. Uh, and on my journey, I have um, spent a lot of time trying to better understand the challenges that uh, the crypto industry faces, um, making sure that I understood that on the campaign trail, um, but more importantly, making sure that I'm doing my job as a representative on the financial services committee in, in trying to solve the urgent needs of, of what you all are facing and the urgent needs of our country. Brittany, I want to pick up on those challenges. From your perspective, what are the biggest challenges facing this industry and how is Washington uh, working to address those? Or does Washington even care? Well, as, as you all know, I, we need to bring clarity. We need to bring regulation here in the United States. I think that what we're seeing is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, digital asset companies wanting to move and invest elsewhere because of the lack of clarity and regulation. 
Uh, and that's a big concern for me. I am committed to making sure that the United States is a leader in crypto finance. I also want to thank the, all of you for being leaders in, in open source and how uh, inspiring it is to think about what we're going to be able to solve together uh, with these new platforms that are available to everybody. Uh, what excites me about crypto is that you don't have the normal gatekeepers that you traditionally have had in the centralization of, of power. And, and it doesn't matter where you come from, what school you went to, the color of your skin, where you live, you have the opportunity to be involved. Uh, and that's very exciting. We also need to make sure that businesses continue to thrive here in the United States. Uh, Singapore would be happy to be the new finance hub of the world instead of New York City. Uh, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. We need to have those investments, that economic success and innovation here in the United States. Brittany, you bring up gatekeepers. When we look at government, I think, the gov I think a lot of people in this room might say that the government wants to keep that control, and that's where the tension has uh, come for the industry, right? It, everything we hear that comes, a lot of the things that we hear that comes out of Congress kind of alludes to keeping that control, not wanting that open source, being able to control what's happening in the industry. How would you respond to that? I understand your frustration. Uh, my time in public service over 12 years, I feel like most of the things that I work on, I'm fighting against the defenders of the status quo. And so you all are bringing such a new and innovative way of doing and thinking about things. Um, and this is really, it, it is going to be part of our future and the, the United States needs to embrace that. So I understand why you, I understand why you feel that way. In, okay. All right. So, what I want you all to know is that there's people like me, even issues that he's talking about, um, people that are dedicated to actually rolling up their sleeves and understanding how complicated these issues are. Uh, these are very much in the gray area. This is not a black or white issue, whether you're talking about crypto or, or what's happening in the Middle East. It's incredibly complicated. Um, but I understand your frustration with the regulatory framework. I just want you to know that so many people care about better understanding um, your space and making sure that we're actually meeting the moment and um, addressing the challenges that you all, you all are facing and regulating it here in the United States. All right, we're gonna keep the conversation going here and stick to talking about legislation in the United States. It seemed like some momentum was being made in, in 2023 when it came to progressing some crypto legislation. We had the stablecoin bill, we had FIT21. It seems like that momentum has kind of slowed now as we enter an election year. Um, can you tell us what's going on behind the scenes? Do you think we're gonna see any legislation in 2024? Well, we did have a lot of momentum, especially after the collapse of FTX. Um, and what we saw was a big push to try to regulate crypto. Um, as you know, Chairman McHenry has been a leader on this. He is dedicated to making sure that this happens. Uh, unfortunately, instead of us dealing with every issue from uh, our national and international security risks, our economic needs as we recover from a global pandemic and the fallout from that, uh, and, and the needs that you all are facing in your industry, instead of dealing with those, we unfortunately are stuck funding the government week by week, month by month, uh, in partisan bickering. And so it has been incredibly frustrating. I came into Congress with hope of actually working together and getting things done. Um, unfortunately, it has been uh, beyond disappointing with the uh, Republican leadership and our inability to do the very basic things of our job. What's going on with the stablecoin bill? Why has there seemingly been not a lot of progress. I, I've, I've heard through the grapevine that that's the one that we might see some movement on, but what's been going on there? Well, when it comes to uh, the stable coin legislation and the market structure bill, 
Um, there has been um, movement and negotiations with the ranking member and uh, the chairman and making sure that it's in a good place before it comes to the House floor. Um, and ultimately making sure that it's in as strong of a position with bipartisan support when it goes to the Senate. So uh, I am hopeful that we can still get some of these things done before Chairman McHenry leaves, uh, but it is still facing a long haul because like I said, uh, we unfortunately are stuck in, in partisan bickering. We vote on uh, whether or not we should reduce salaries to a dollar uh, on an ongoing basis and fund our government you know, week by week. So. It, is, it has been incredibly frustrating. Let's talk about Chairman McHenry. He really has become a friend of the space in trying to progress this legislation with this being his last year in Congress. Do you anticipate that momentum slowing or how, how are you thinking about keeping that momentum going? Well, I, I understand people's concern around Chairman McHenry retiring and it's uh, disappointing that good members like him are leaving, uh, you know, for various reasons, but a lot of pragmatic members are sick and tired of the way that Congress is being run and how extreme things have gotten in the Republican Party. Uh, what I will say is that because he's retiring, I think that he will be that much more dedicated in making sure that we actually get this through, uh, and I will be a part of trying to help do that. Is that possible ahead of the next election? I think that, uh, like I said, if, if we can actually stop fighting over whether or not we should fund our government and fund critical services, and we can keep things moving along and not throw our economy into a tailspin by our own uh, unfortunate inaction, I think that we can get back to trying to legislate. It felt, you know, the beginning of my job when I came into Congress, we were actually working to get things done. We actually had a productive committee. And so I, I hope that we get back to business. Let's talk about the SEC now. How, what, how do you think the SEC has been handling the regulation of the industry? Uh, the, I understand why um, people have been frustrated. I don't think that, uh, I, I I don't think that this should be a, you know, figuring out how to fly how to fly the plane while we're in the air. This needs to really be bringing clarity and regulation. And oftentimes we hear from the SEC that they already have the power to regulate. Um, but we know that what we're hearing from industry is actually um, we need to bring clarity or else we're, we're going to leave the, uh, the United States. And we definitely don't want that to happen. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we listen to their concerns around making sure that illicit financing isn't, uh, that bad actors are not utilizing the system. Um, but I want to point out that while I know digital assets get a really bad name for that, the preferred method from bad actors is still cash. Um, we know that open source uh, platforms create the opportunity to see every single transaction, and that's a a powerful thing with holding people accountable. You know, the SEC has really been uh, regulating by enforcement. And I'm curious to hear, you know, what the SEC is asking of you, because I think when all of us sitting here, you know, legislation needs to be made in Congress. And once that legislation is made, then the SEC probably wouldn't go out and enforce, uh, regulate by enforcement. And so I'm curious how the conversation is going between the agency and Congress and, um, what you think needs to happen to get that clear legislation? Well, I, I don't think that they're necessarily asking anything of us, but when, when they come, when, I, w when we hear testimony in committee, the, their public testimony is that they feel like they have the authority to deal with this. Uh, and that we don't need additional regulation. And of course, if we pass legislation and tell the agency, uh, if we pass a law that clarifies the regulatory framework, then that will be the law of the land and that's what the agency will actually have to utilize to go out and, uh, and regulate it. And so I think that it is obvious that we, we have to bring forth legislation to bring that clarity. If you hear from every single 
uh, business if in digital assets, they are begging for uh, a regulatory framework that uh, countries across the world have provided. You brought this up a little bit earlier on in our conversation, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into your thoughts about American uh, crypto companies, crypto startups setting up in regions with more regulatory clarity. How do you think about that? And do you think that's something that should be stopped? Well, the way that um, that I think about this is um, kind of my concern in general with right now what we're seeing in the United States with investments going elsewhere. It's not just around digital, uh, di digital assets and y your industry. It's also uh, the dysfunction that we're seeing people across the world are looking to the United States and, and questioning whether or not this is a country that they should invest in and if they should be going elsewhere. Because uh, right now it's in question whether or not we will even do our job in paying our bills as the United States of America, if you can even believe that that is how bad it's gotten at the federal level. Uh, and so with our inability to govern, with our inability to regulate and change with changing times as quickly as technology is innovating and our economy is innovating, that is a huge problem for our long-term success as a country. So um, I think that my concern is around what you all are facing, but a broader concern around governing and making sure that we get a functional federal government. So why should people remain optimistic about crypto regulation here in the States? Well, for the same reason that I remain optimistic about the United States and that we're going to move through these challenges, uh, I think that you all being involved and actually supporting candidates who are thoughtful, who are going to, you know, who I think younger candidates as well, we have a different way of thinking about things just because our life experiences are different. We grew up with uh, you know, some of my colleagues didn't even grow up with the internet. Um, and, and so it's just a fundamental different perspective uh, of the world in our, in our ability to think about things a little bit differently um, and, and identify the need to uh, change with changing times. And so uh, I think that you can be optimistic because what I tell myself every day is the shenanigans that I see on TV and for all of you, who choose not to watch, I definitely understand. Um, but there are so many more of us in Congress who are actually trying to do our job and be the professionals that we are elected to be. We just don't make the news. And when I bring that up to journalists, they say, well, we don't cover planes landing. Um, and it unfortunately creates a, a bad incentive for people to say the craziest things that they can and do the craziest things um, to make it on TV. So I want you all to know that there are so many of us who are actually working together to solve problems. Um, and that's what gives me hope every day to continue to do this job and fight for the future of, of the, our country and our economy. You're a young Congresswoman. It sounds like you're saying that we need more younger folks in Congress who actually understand what we're talking about. We need maybe younger folks at the SEC who understand what's going on in the industry. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think that it benefits me uh, in a lot of different areas to be a younger member of Congress, whether you're talking about the unique challenges that families are facing around childcare access, uh, you know, just being somebody who is experiencing currently what so many people are facing, um, but also, you know, grew up in a world where we had internet, uh, understanding the importance of uh, the opportunities of Web3 and decentralization and uh, and access to information and innovation and, and what we need to do to, to leverage that as a country uh, for our benefit and making sure that it's not going elsewhere. All right, there's a lot of, I know we're at an ETH conference, but there's been a lot of excitement in the industry about the approval of the spot Bitcoin ETF in January. Now there's a lot of talk about the potential for a spot Ether ETF in May, I believe it is. That's when the application deadline is. Do you think we're going to see that approval for a spot ETF this year? And what do you think that means for the industry? 
Well, I think, thanks for bringing that up. I think that that is uh, hopefully what gives you all hope right now that we are slowly moving in the right direction, but we need to move quicker. Uh, and that comes with different leadership and, and um, d different members of Congress who are focused on actually solving problems. And uh, so I, I think it is exciting. I don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming year, but I just want you to know that I, please reach out with questions that you have. Our team, it's really important that we hear from all of you and so that we can be the best uh, federal representative. All right, and I asked a version of this earlier on in the conversation, but just to bring us home, are we going to see crypto legislation that actually moves the needle in the U.S. this year? I wish that I could tell you what was going to happen next week uh, in Congress. Uh, so while I can't tell you whether or not we're going to actually see legislation pass, you all are an important piece of making sure that we're in the strongest position in the House. We get as many uh, people on both sides of the aisle supporting the bills moving forward so that we have the chance to pass it in the Senate. Uh, it is difficult to get anything done, but I want you to know that uh, Chairman McHenry is going to be working hard and people in financial services uh, will be doing the same. All right, Brittany, thank you for sitting down with me and unpacking the crypto conversation in DC. And thank you to all of you for your attention um, and for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, that was absolutely great. Thanks so much for being here and for sharing that with us. All right, next up is a short break. Uh, we are going to be back at exactly 11.35, so it's going to be uh, just about 10 minutes. See you then.
Welcome back, everyone. So uh, next up is an uh, absolutely wonderful topic. We have uh, Joe Lupin, uh, my old boss, I'm still a super fan, uh, moderating a conversation on regenerative economies as opposed to extractive economies with uh, Michelle, Joe, uh, Rob, and Mark. Can't wait. told we can adjust these things so people can hear us, so FYI. Uh, hey everybody, uh, thanks for being here. Um, uh, this may sound like something a little bit different, regenerative ag, but uh, uh, there's a pretty profound uh, decentralization component to this and a decentralized protocol component to this. Um, so before we get started, um, uh, disclosure, uh, I know these people. Um, these people know these people, um, and uh, uh, my brother uh, had some issues with his land, and uh, and he um, um, sought out ways to heal his land, essentially. So he was connected with Rob, and uh, um, the rest of the story unfolded in the creation of a company called Fifth World. Um, Mark Ziad, uh, Ziadi. Um, was uh, a stellar contributor at Consensus and has done a bunch of things in his career um, and uh, and talked to him about this and he, he was excited to join. So we know each other. Um, uh, so the people around here um, live in perfect harmony with nature. Everybody at, at, at Denver um, <laughs> is a transformative individual. Um, we've all been living for centuries in harmony with the buffacorn and the spork whale up, up in the mountains uh, in Colorado. Um, but imagine what would happen um, if something threatened the spork whale or, or the buffacorn, um, intrinsic to the Coloradan economy. Um, could, could you imagine a scenario like that? That, that would be horrible. <laughs> it would be absolutely the worst thing in the world. Can, can you adjust a, a little bit better? Oh, yeah, how's that? So that what, what could happen uh, to an economy if, if something uh, cataclysmic like that uh, that would cause the, the economy to, to come out of balance? Well, I mean, the, the economy actually fundamentally runs on... Uh, ecology essentially but most people don't even think about it uh, when you think about what civilization is it's civilization right now as we know it is based on uh, agriculture plus uh, money essentially and so an agriculture fundamentally is uh, allowing us to transform ecosystems in order to create uh, the supply chains that humans require in order to run civilization so if the buffacorn and the spork whales disappeared, we might not be able to run agriculture anymore. Have we experienced anything like this before in, in human history, maybe in outside of Colorado? Well, yeah, actually, uh, so when we think about uh, the arc of human history, um, you know, we were actually forced into agriculture as a result of the Younger Dryas. And so when we have massive perturbations in ecology, it forces us to uh, adapt in really unique ways. Um, and I think the risk that's in front of us right now from a regen ag perspective, um, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but in Scientific American, they're saying there's about 60 crop cycles left on planet Earth. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of alarm bells that are going off on what, what does it actually mean for us to continue to have uh, a supply chain, specifically food and water, um, in light of some of these liabilities that are, are right in front of us right now. Thank you. So, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, one of the, the greatest minds, thinkers, philosophers uh, on the planet, uh, sense maker uh, in a sense, or, or uh, this doesn't make sense pointer outer. Um, uh, he's, he's pointed out uh, uh, that essentially we're, we're operating um, with a, an exponentially growing financial economy, uh, which drives um, 
our economy, uh, our real economy, uh, far too hard and, and far too hot. And, and essentially, um, this exponential economy um, is driving uh, what could be a, a more linear, more balanced, more circular uh, economy even, um, to produce waste, uh, essentially, at, at exponential rates. Um, Mark, you want to run with that? Yeah, so, you know, D Daniel talks about the third attractor, right? And the fact that we're kind of um, right now stuck between two options, which is either increased centralization or uh, anarchism, right? And I think the answer really is uh, progressive decentralization. So it's the continuation of this mission of progressive decentralization across all levels. Um, I think in the crypto space, we've been focused so far uh, heavily on self-custody of bits, so digital assets and, uh, and data. And uh, we are now starting to move more into self-custody of atoms, which really means physical infrastructure. And uh, the good news is that there are so many solutions out there uh, that allows us to go in that direction. So you think about regenerative agriculture, and I think Rob can, can talk more about this, distributed energy systems, uh, water systems. These are all solutions that can enable communities and individuals uh, to have ownership over and, and self-custody over their food, energy, and water. And um, it's, it's interesting because um, I sometimes wish we have uh, some technology incentive layer that can enable coordination at scale. Do you know something about that? Um, I, I've been doing some reading recently, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I heard the term Web3 and crypto maybe, or something like that. So. Um, if we can start build those networks, right, of autonomous communities that have self-custody over food, water, energy, data assets, so both bits and atoms, we can really usher from the paradigm of linear extractive economies uh, where basically, you know, users have an adverse relationship with businesses to an economy that is more regenerative, uh, circular, resilient, even anti-fragile and basically uh, allow us to generate positive externalities and solve a lot of those negative externalities that, that we're dealing with today. And so at Fifth World, we call this basically regenerative living or regenerative network states. If, if you want to go a little deeper on, on some of that, uh, I, I do recommend listening to Kevin Owaki's podcast, Green Pill. Um, he had a three-parter three with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Uh, Look up Schmachtenberger, it's exactly how it sounds, spelled exactly how it sounds. Um, but uh, it was uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely essential um, synthesis um, of thinking about our own decentralized protocol ecosystem and, uh, and what, what Daniel speaks about all the time. Um, so fortunately, I, I feel like we're, um, we're in a transition, and the transition transition is accelerating. The, the paradigm shift is decidedly on. Uh, transitions are hard. Hopefully this one uh, won't be so difficult. Uh, this super cycle's ending. Um, how do we get to the next super cycle? What, is, what, what does transition look like, Michelle? So you're asking how, what it's going to look like to transition to this regenerative I economy? Would love, I would love to yeah. hear what, what you're seeing in yeah. terms of the business or yeah, well, uh, di different systems with respect to <laughs> land, yeah. uh, energy, yeah, water. Yeah, I'd say yeah. You, can, you can certainly attest that any time you want to go against entrenched interests and existing structures, it's difficult, right? And um, we can think about you know this space, this Web3 space and the crypto space in the last 10 years, and I, you know, there's this top-down model where you've got authority, monopolies, or gatekeepers, and in this space, you guys have been working really hard and building tools to, to have bottom-up solutions and bottom-up models. And we essentially need to, um, well, those top-down centralized systems repeat, whether we're talking about energy systems, like how do we, how do we you know, power this building, or how do we supply water, or how do we get food? It's all top-down centralized control, and there's very little bottom-up thinking and bottom-up solutions. So the, ch the challenge is big, because you've seen, you know, it's taken 10 years, and I think if we went back 10 years ago and asked people in this room, how, how easy is it going to be to transform the financial system, um, there would be many people saying, oh my gosh, it's going to be really difficult, it's going to be really hard. 
and I don't want to downplay how Guess difficult what? it's been, <laughs> yeah. but 10 years later, I think maybe the mood is different, and, I, and, I, and I'm excited about we're now facing the same challenge in these other systems, and so that, that gives me tons of optimism in terms of how, um, how we can do the same thing, and we can also leverage all these tools, systems, processes, learnings from the Web3 community, and I feel like that'll help us accelerate this transition to regenerative economies. So, yeah. That's, yeah. so early on, we used to say decentralize all the things, tokenize all the things. Um, maybe we should take a step back and figure out how we uh, regenerate all the things, or decentralize and regener regenerate all the things. What, what is regenerative ag? What, what have you and Michelle been doing uh, for, for the last uh, many years uh, in, in your practice? Do you want to take that? Yeah, for the last 15 years, we uh, actually, I'm going to go back a little bit further. So I'm actually a petroleum engineer. So I started off in the oil and gas industry in the belly of the giant, Calgary, Alberta. Um, I was the guy that was bringing natural gas and fossil fuel to your cars and natural gas to your homes to heat it and felt really conflicted about uh, how could I criticize the very industry that I was supporting as a consumer. And so I called my wife up one day after watching a three-minute video of this guy who was regenerating a, a piece of desert uh, in the lowest place on Earth, Dead Sea Valley, uh, with very few resources. And, uh, and I was about ready to cut down a massive swath of forest in order to bring a new natural gas pipeline in. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? So being an engineer and a complete nerd, I took my calculator out of my pocket. I calculated out how many hours of life energy I have on this Earth, and I said, it's about 600,000 and I've burned through a third of them. How do I want to spend the next two thirds of my life? So I quit my job. I encouraged Michelle to quit her job too. And we traveled around the world looking for positive solutions. And uh, we've been teaching that for the last 15 years through a system called permaculture. And we've transformed thousands of people's lives around the planet. Um, and what's super exciting about it is actually the issues that we're talking about today are not technical issues. It's a social issue. We have all the tools, we have all the resources, we have all the knowledge to regenerate planet Earth rapidly, but we're lacking a coordination layer, and I'm not sure where we should find that. Yeah, I'm still wondering. I know we've been doing some readings about uh, Web3, but um, yeah, just, Mark, just to add to that uh, a little bit, like the way I, ga I got into regenerative agriculture was uh, through chatting with Joe, and I remember Joe um, shared with me a very cool documentary to watch. I think it's called The Biggest Little Farm. And, I, and you know, my background was in crypto economics and I've done a lot of like uh, token designs and like interesting systems designed around how to use tokens and incentives. And then I watched this documentary and this was basically the exact same type of thinking but in real life. Like I, I was watching those people actually just creating life by thinking through how they can build a symbiotic ecosystem. And then it just clicked, like, what if we can use all those experiments, all those currency, currency experiments, monetary experiments that we're doing in crypto, incentives experiments, and connect them somehow to regeneration, to agriculture, to food, energy, and water, we'll be able to usher into a whole new paradigm and a whole new economy. And one thing, one, one comparison I really like to, to, to talk about a lot is the same way nature needs biodiversity, I think our society today needs monetary diversity. We need uh, to create money that is linked to specific purposes that allow us to become resilient to financial crisis and uh, resilient to linear and extractive systems. Awesome. So uh, Michelle and or Rob, um, can you describe what a recirculating agricultural sort of living ecosystem might be? So as opposed to some sort of factory farm thing, uh, which is, um, essentially robbing the land uh, of nutrients um, and destroying the land. Um, what, does, uh, what does a recirculating farm um, that is essentially uh, in harmony with itself and in harmony with um, people like yourselves, what does that look like? So the, the best example that we have of this, one of the best examples, is what was actually occurring on the eastern seaboard of the United States before uh, Europeans came here. There was close to 30 million indigenous people uh, living on that seaboard, and there were no signs of what we call agriculture today. In, fa in fact, we now know that they were actually uh, using a form of agriculture, but it's more of a syntropic agroforestry system. 
where they were basically living off of the byproducts of perennial plants, plants that you plant once and they continue to grow. And so we know that the, the short answer to your question, Joe, is nature. Nature provides all it's of... It's called nature. It's called it's nature. Already, right? And a, a, agriculture, in a way, for the last 10,000 years, has essentially been at war with nature. So we've been uh, following the same pattern of deforesting, plowing, and desertifying. And the problem is, is that uh, we, we had very short human lives, and so we were unable to understand the feedback that, uh, of the damage that we were creating, essentially. And so um, I believe now that we can merge with technology in a way that allows us to uh, take all the democratized sensors that are showing up on the market, and we can essentially create a whoop for planet Earth. Uh, Whoop, this little device right here that I wear, has been transforming the way that I interact with my environment. When I go to sleep, what I eat, I can get instantaneous feedback on um, what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis so that I can course correct and become a healthier human being. We have all the technology now to do that, and so Fifth World is starting to integrate those pieces together into a unified MRV system that will allow humans to have a better understanding of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so our thesis is that humans are not inherently destructive, we just lack feedback. And I believe that we will, the, the system that will allow us to essentially create these new supply chains that are work in harmony with nature can be worked out and sorted out once we have the right data and the right dashboards at our fingertips that allow us to make better decisions. I have another example, um, like taking this bottom-up solutions. What does that actually mean in the, in the realm of water? Because that's one of my areas of expertise. So traditionally, um, communities or municipalities, when they're trying to provide water to their community, they think we need a top-down centralized solution, right? We need to build a massive water treatment plant. We need to pull water from a river and then build build one network of pipes to deliver that water to all these houses and these communities, and we just turn the tap on, right? And yet, um, better, better tools like big data and systems analysis has actually shown us that it's a much more uh, resilient system to have more local supply. So have individual houses with rainwater, for example, or have those homes uh, manage their own stormwater instead of send that stormwater straight to sink. And so we need more of that bottom-up local solutions in the same way that, you know, again, Web3 allows peer-to-peer -peer transactions. We need more local, local energy. We need more local water. We need more local food systems. We need more bottom-up and not only relying on top-down centralized control. Yeah. So a lot of the time people ask me if I think things are going well in our ecosystem. Um, is this what I expected? Uh, and Generally, that's a big yes. Um, it, I'm amazed at, uh, at how little resistance, despite all the resistance that, that we've encountered, I, I'm amazed at how little resistance really uh, we've encountered, um, given the vested interests uh, on the planet. Um, they've woken up quite significantly, um, and the attacks will continue. Maybe they will intensify, uh, maybe not. Um, but the bottom line is that we've built um, these amazing systems, decentralized protocols, uh, interacting um, modular components, uh, a, a whole new vision uh, for a system of the world, a new system of the world uh, that's profoundly decentralized, but it's all sitting up here on somebody else's clouds. Uh, it's, all, it's all running on fundamental infrastructure um, that we could get bumped off of. Um, so, and I'm talking about compute infrastructure, and yes, there is some real de decentralized compute infrastructure, uh, there's solo stakers, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm talking about land, uh, I'm talking about food, I'm talking about water, I'm talking about energy in its various different forms, I'm talking about legal systems, and recently I've been talking to uh, various builders and, um, yes, investors and, and other people about uh, um, what we can do about it. It's a coordination problem, uh, we need to form, I think, giant pools of capital uh, and go out and figure out how to, how to uh, ground all this that we're building in, in fundamental substructure. Uh, and so um, that's, that's a big 
um, project, and, and this is, uh, I, I think, a, a really interesting part of, of that big project. Um, it might need a manifesto. This project might need a manifesto. Uh, Mark, if, if this project had a manifesto, what, what would some of the elements <laughs> of, of that project be? Yeah, only if it had a manifesto. Um, so you used the word builder in there, and, and I like this term because I think uh, for a long time we've been using this word to mean developers, but in, in, in our company and you know, in, in our network, we use this term to actually mean creators, contributors, makers, right? People who are actually building physical infrastructure. And I think we need to keep promoting that and keep building those builder communities. And so if we look at the, at the current paradigm that we're under, it's a paradigm of you know, growth above everything else. And we love growth, we love evolution, and we want to grow. But at the same time, we are dealing with a lot of negative externalities coming from only thinking about growth. And so what we also focus on is how do we grow in an anti-fragile way, in a way that instead of generating negative externalities can generate positive externalities. And, and for us, we really think you know, we are at a stage right now in our human evolution where we're kind of ushering into the next stage. I think, Joe, you call it the super cycle. And, you know, it's, it's exciting, right? But it's also a challenge. And I think, in, in my opinion at least, the biggest challenge is how do we do that in a way that allows us to build a regenerative, harmonious relationship between technology, humanity, and nature. And then if we're able to figure that out, this will usher us into basically decentralized acceleration instead of just effective acceleration. I love effective acceleration. I think technology is a key part of human evolution and a key part of humanity. But at the same time, if we can grow and accelerate in a decentralized way, we'll be basically growing in, more, in a more resilient and anti-fragile way and in a more positive way. So we know that the, coming back to your Schmuckenberger piece, that the first and the second attractor are not places that we want to go. And I loved how Schmuckenberger said, uh, the third attractor is some place we want to be, but we don't necessarily know how to build it completely. But the brains in this room, I, I can almost guarantee, can figure that out. And this is where uh, the VDAO is going to play a really important role to bring all those pieces together. Yeah. So, Michelle, what, what does Fifth World do? Uh, does it have products? Does it have services? What roles do the members uh, of Fifth World, how many people are in Fifth World? How many, what roles do they perform? Fifth World is about uh, regenerative living, like tools for regenerative living, right? So we do a lot, and that's why it's a little bit difficult to put in one little nugget. But let's say if it touches um, sustainability and regenerative living, we have a play there. We teach courses. We um, are, we have we just launched can you, a DAO. Can you talk about, uh, right? so there's a, a mm -hmm. Verge permaculture yeah. group? Uh, yeah, we teach courses, courses in sustainability, yeah. rainwater design, passive solar greenhouses, permaculture design, gardening, all of that stuff. All those just like hands, touch grass, hands in the dirt, skills that your grandmother didn't teach you. Yeah. Um, so that's the education side. I could probably pass it on to Mark. Mark's yeah. got the <coughs> crypto side. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Fifth Road basically builds, designs and builds actually, uh, anti-fragile and regenerative food, water, and energy systems. We've been doing that for individuals. We've been doing that for communities. Uh, we have an education arm that educates people on how to do it themselves, and there's a, a lot of people interested in that. And recently, we launched this DAO to really figure out how can we use Web3 to coordinate and also innovate. And so part of BDAO is really bringing in the crypto community with the region, ag, and permaculture community into one place, uh, enabling discussions, interactions, and even ideating solutions in the physical and digital world that can usher us into this decentralized regenerative uh, paradigm. So if you want to know more, uh, we do have a happy hour later today, and I really encourage you all to, to go and uh, talk to us. So, so you all have products like greenhouses, designs for, <laughs> for things like eco-villages, consultants that go out and, and work very hands-on or, or just uh, in indicatively, instructively uh, with people. Um, what other, if, if there were to be a DAO, uh, a, a VDAO, uh, indeed, but uh, how, like, what sorts of roles uh, could people take on um, in Fifth World DAO? Yeah, <clears throat> so there, there's a bunch of roles. Uh, we basically have three goals uh, behind launching the DAO. One goal is enabling community interaction and community discussion in virtual 
in the virtual space, but also in the, in the real world, having real world meetups, uh, having uh, supper clubs. Uh, there's a cool uh, uh, slow food movement that Rob was telling me about uh, that we want to also bring into the crypto ecosystem. Another big goal of ours is really uh, creating high tech, high nature, high touch pop-up experiences. So uh, we've been following Zuzalu and we've been following the work that has been going on there and really want to bring in the agriculture and food and energy piece into it. And the last piece is we're going to be running some idea towns around IT eating solutions, some very cool competitions, uh, you know, not to convey a lot of details, but meme related. So follow us and uh, you'll get to know more. Cool. So to wrap us up, uh, five words each on what's most exciting to you about what's going on in your work or, or in Fifth World. Mark? Five words, maybe more. Community? <laughs> Turned our mics off. Oh, no, they didn't. <laughs> uh, being here and connecting with um, this, this community yeah, is really exciting awesome. to me. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really stoked about our MRV project. So if Ethereum is the world computer, uh, the work we're doing in MRV is, is essentially creating the whoop for planet Earth. Whoop for planet Earth. Five words. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That's great. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. This is a, a world that needs to exist, a world that I want to live in, and we need to. Next up, we have Greg from Akash, the only place that you can get on-demand A100s because the spice must flow. So um, actually, Greg, while we're setting up, just I know your talk's coming up in a second, but tell us more about just why this is cool. Uh, because uh, I'm going to talk about why uh, crypto is saving AI and why AI needs crypto and not the other way down. So hopefully by the end of the talk, I can make my case because, you know, spice must flow. Yeah, so, so this is the case where like AI and crypto meet and yeah, there's been so much like noise, but everyone's sprinkling a little bit of AI and everything, but crypto really has the answer to a real problem in the AI community. How long have you been working on this? <laughs> I wrote the first line of code about 10 years ago. Oh, dang. So. And we wrote the paper, published the paper uh, in 2017, talking about machine learning and GPU shortage. And uh, it took about six or seven years to realize that. Oh, man. So it's like way before the hype cycle that this all went down. Yeah, I started working on Ethereum Frontier in 2016. If you remember that. Yeah. But no, that's, uh, that's necessary. Yeah, it was just uh, showing me like, uh, uh, so uh, I teach uh, AI and ML at Columbia and we've been using Colab and it's slow and he's gonna make it fast. Welcome, Greg, awesome. I do have some internet issues. Uh, any, any way I can get priority? Okay, let's do this. Great. <laughs> Hope uh, Denver's been great, great for you folks. Uh, I certainly got a bug now, so going to take it back home to Texas. My name is Greg Osiri. I'm the founder. Uh, CEO for Overclock Labs, uh, a core contributor to Akash Network. And today I'm going to talk about why crypto is saving AI and why AI needs crypto and, and not the other way around. Uh, there was a recent story in Semaphore, which is a very prominent uh, publication, that talked about the chip shortage. So it turns out AI requires these accelerated computing chips called GPUs, and a lot of people uh, that are needing these GPUs that created an artificial shortage. And this story is about a Columbia student that's trying to do machine learning and trying to get some chips to do machine learning. And he could go to Amazon, and he couldn't get any chips. And he could go to Lambda Labs or any of the traditional places that you normally go to get chips, and he couldn't. And then, magically, he finds this, uh, this decentralized weird network and gets A100s for dollar ten cents an hour. Uh, so this is a story about how a, a traditional machine learning developer couldn't get chips um, in the traditional way, but could get come to a Web3 network and actually get the chips to do a machine learning training. Why? Because 
GPUs are very hard to get on demand. Why? Because big cloud providers control GPU leasing. So for example, on Amazon, the only way to get advanced GPUs is to know somebody that knows somebody and spend millions of dollars to even get access to the chips. So if you're an AI startup, there's no way in hell you'll be able to get started without having millions of dollars of funding or whatnot, right? Why? Because big tech companies are competing for these chips, as you know, Elon Musk is famously uh, known for saying these words that GPUs are significantly harder to get than, than, than drugs, even though that is a low bar in San Francisco. But you saw Mark Zuckerberg purchase about 350,000 uh, H100s. So these large companies that are doing AI are eating up chips left and right, and they are creating, creating this massive shortage for anyone uh, of normal folk to get, get access to the chips, right? And the options really are very limited to get the chips. If you go to NVIDIA directly, it takes about two years, I guess now it's three years, to get H100s um, uh, directly from them. So your typical option is to go to a provider that can offer you uh, these uh, chips on lease. But guess what? In order to get chips from someone uh, like a Lambda Labs or a Corby, which ha happen to be a tier two cloud providers, because tier ones, uh, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft do not have the chips, only tier twos have. And if you go to tier twos, you need to get into a minimum three to six month contract. I, can, I think now it's like a minimum 12 month contract, and you gotta pay like 25% or 50% upfront. Uh, in some cases, even 100% upfront if you wanna get in front of the line. Wait for three to, three to six months and get, get the chips that you, you need, right? So. That is extremely frustrating for someone that wanted to do an experiment or of a new model that just popped up, right? And what are the challenges? What are the implications of this, uh, this way of getting chips? Well, number one, high costs. So it's impossible for a normal uh, person to get the chips without having to spend uh, you know, millions of dollars um, uh, up front, right? So basically, you're literally giving people money and, and, and waiting forever to get the chips. And that you know, deters uh, new, new folks from entering the space. And you know, and most of the time when you order the chips, you're ordering something that, you know, a requirement that, that lasted uh, six months, right? So the rate at which the models are developing is so rapid that your requirements change, especially in a startup because you're highly iterative. So what you get after six months may not be the exact chips that you want anymore, right? So you have this like massive underutilization of the, the wrong type of chips because uh, AI has moved really fast. And, and on the other hand, if you look at it, there are free GPUs everywhere, right? What I mean by that is there are a lot of crypto miners that bought a ton of GPUs during the last, uh, last uh, you know, cycle that are sitting idle. We saw a consensus here earlier, uh, you know, sitting on a massive uh, set of GPUs. A company called Foundry Digital, which is owned by DCG, uh, is, is sitting on massive amounts of A100s and, uh, and, and A6000s, right? So there are a lot of these companies that were previously mining, doing proof of work mining, and after Ethereum merge, are no longer uh, you know, having any use for these GPUs and are sitting idle in these data centers. And then you have companies that normally, with, with companies that are maybe three or four years older in, in machine learning, that's, a, that's, that's considered to be very old, having older fleet of chips. Say, so for example, a company called Stability that bought A100s, uh, 5,000 A100s about four years ago, now upgraded their fleet to something called an H100s, which is the latest chip, have a fleet of A100s available that have no use, uh, that they have any, uh, that they don't have any use for. So there, there's this enormous amounts of chips available, and also, a lot of machine learning companies, when they do, uh, when they do foundational model training, when they transition uh, or when they upgrade their models, they have some downtime uh, between training runs because the intensity that you require in terms of usability for the chips is significantly higher during training compared to inference, which is uh, a way you, you serve the model. So there are a lot of underutilization uh, uh, scenarios where chips are owned by companies that they that those companies don't want to let them go, but still want to be able to get some sort of like a liquidity on this uh, supposedly uh, owned assets, right? I mean, there are also companies that are raising money with with GPUs as collateral. So GPUs are the new spice, right? Um, 
And what is Akash is essentially a marketplace to trade GPU cycles. Akash is, a, first and foremost, a super cloud. A super cloud is a cloud that sits on top of private, public, hybrid, doesn't matter, any cloud-capable computer, and gives you a familiar user interface that is similar to a Docker Compose uh, interface. It's easy to use and gives you the exceptional tools for, for orchestration of fault tolerance, uh, whereas the compute comes from all over the place, uh, uh, using a marketplace uh, mechanism where users can request compute, uh, and uh, if a provider can provide the compute, can bid on the order, and vice versa. The way it works is very simple. The user essentially uh, creates something called an SDL file, places on the marketplace, uh, and specifies how much they're willing to pay for the, uh, pay for the workload, and providers uh, bid on that, on that job, and the tenant eventually chooses the winning provider and then uh, gets to use the computer, right? And uh, this is real. This has been around for, for about three years, uh, and the first and foremost is permissionless, so there's no permission required either from the user or the provider to, uh, to provide supply. It makes it extremely uh, incredible for composability, and it's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So there is no middleman. Uh, what you get is what you see. And uh, you, when, once the lease is established, the tenant and the provider gets into a peer-to-peer -peer relation, and that makes it extremely uh, uh, reliable in terms of, uh, you know, uh, in terms of how, uh, you know, when, when you don't have pessimistic way of uh, uh, acquiring resources. And it's open source. Uh, it about 480 contributors contribu com contribute to this uh, project. Uh, 20 people work uh, full-time with Overclock Labs. About 90% of the community, our contributors come from outside the community. They meet regularly uh, in uh, something called special interest groups. Anyone can make a proposal. There's an on-chain fund that funds, this, uh, funds the development of the chain and whatnot. And it's, it's been growing. So daily active leases, uh, these are, a lease is an application. Uh, has been has quadrupled uh, from from last quarter, and uh, that aligns very well with our GPU launch, and uh, the lifetime GPU utilization. That means the uh, the amount of chips that are available to the amount of chips that are being used. Uh, lifetime utilization is about 41 percent, which we know it's extremely high, either for a centralized or a decentralized network. So, um, and I'm here to do a demo because I love live demos, and hopefully the internet guards are going to be my friends today. Um, so the way it really works, I mean, I go to Akash.network, and there is a link called uh, Deploy Now, which takes you to this console. Uh, console is a fully non-custodial uh, uh, you know, UI interface. I have a wallet here called Capital Wallet. I have some money in there. I click Deploy, and I upload an SDL file, like I uh, mentioned earlier. I'm here deploying something called a Mixtral, uh, 7 billion parameter model, and I'm going to show how to do inference in real time on Akash. Uh, here, that configuration essentially speaks about the container I'm going to use, the ports, how much I'm willing to pay, and the commands I need to uh, run, right? And create deployment. Um, this goes on chain. It's asking me to make some deposit and sign the transaction here, um, creating an creating order on chain. Uh, in about six seconds, you'll see this uh, bits coming back uh, for uh, that will accept my workload. Uh, you can also see the transaction online uh, while the while the uh, the bids are coming back. You can see what's what gets posted here. It's very anonymized information, nothing about your application, but just the resources you require. You see, I got a bunch of bids. Remember the company I was talking about, Foundry Staking, which is a DCG company. Uh, they're they're competing to uh, you know win my workload right here. Uh, I can choose Foundry because I know they're good. I can choose any of these clouds. I mean, different price points, different GPUs I get offered. NVIDIA V100 is a fairly you know, decent GPU. I confirm that I want that provider. Now a lease gets created on the blockchain. Uh, all this is uh, verifiable. You can, you can see underneath the, uh, in, 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 the, in the transaction history. And in a second here, uh, the provider should come online. Uh, like I said, this is how a lease looks like on, on, the, on the chain. Uh, the owner is the wallet address, and the provider is the provider that bid on the workload. And I essentially say, I want, uh, I want to work with you. Uh, and here, if, you're, if you can see this, it's really a bunch of events happening on the back end. Uh, it's pulling the container called Olama. Uh, and it's starting the container here, and I can see 
uh, the logs uh, to make sure that I am seeing some activity. Uh, yes, it is pulling the checkpoint files. Checkpoint files are essentially the file that's going to serve the model. It says I'm 23% here. Hopefully, I have enough time uh, left to finish this demo. If not, we can. Uh, I already have something running, but let's see. I really want to see a live demo because there's nothing better than a live presentation. So, um, and you know, while this is coming up, I can you know log into the shell. I can you know run your typical shell commands you normally learn. I will just show you Nvidia SMI, uh, which is a command to see what GPUs I have. Uh, you know, you can see here I requested for a V100. I do have a Tesla V100 GPU that's attached to it. Let me check the logs here. We're almost there. It's almost there. So this is real. <laughs> Got one minute and 50 seconds. I. You know, while this is coming up, I'll show you another uh, deployment I did. Uh, so I have another server I did earlier to, OK, wait, hang real quick. I'm going to put this down. Just need to get this URL. So I just replaced the um, the URL with the URL I just got from here, and I'm going to run this curl command. Curl is a way to invoke a web API. Uh, it's going to take a second here because it's warming up. OK, there you go. I asked Mistral, what a, why is the sky blue? The color of the sky appears blue due to uh, you know whatever, whatever. But you, you get the point. I was able to deploy a, a, an LLM from scratch in about 31 minutes, I guess, like, yeah, about two minutes, fully non-custodially, fully permissionlessly, fully with no sign-ups, no credit cards, nothing, right in front of a live audience. All right, 30 more seconds, and I can take questions. How did you pick Kubernetes versus GPU? It was a very long process, <laughs> because GPUs are inherently anti-design uh, pattern to Kubernetes because GPUs are very, very driver-specific. Uh, there's a lot of technical lingo in there, but it, it took a long time. How many GPUs are on uh, Right now, I, let's see. I don't know. Stats, are about 150 GPUs, maybe? Yeah, 150 GPUs, but these are high-end GPUs, A100s, high-density GPUs, and we have about about 600 GPUs coming on m online every month, uh, for starting this month on. So keep an eye out. And most of them are H100s, A100s, and A6000s. And uh, Akash will be the only place to get H100s for $2 an hour, which anyone that uses H100s know what that number means. And A100s for 79 cents an hour, starting, uh, starting uh, H1 A1 more than A100s end of the March, but H100s starting next week. Uh, no comment. All right, time is up. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ava, and I'll be with you for the next two hours to announce our next panelists and moderators. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well, and that is Denver um, is as remarkable as it is for me. For our next talk, uh, we will be continuing speaking about AI and um, uncovering more things about control and power. Is the crypto going to be the native currency of AI? And what will happen to the world if that happens? So let's welcome on stage Michael Casey, that I don't need to introduce anymore, who will be um, chatting with his wonderful panelists. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. All right. 
Is that good? All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm Michael Casey. I, uh, I'm just leaving it at that at the moment. <laughs> Some of you may know that I, until recently, was the chief content officer at Coindesk, but uh, had a few, few changes. So I'm just Michael Casey now, which is actually quite pleasant. So I'm here representing myself and, uh, and happy to see so many of my former Coindesk colleagues involved in, in this uh, great event. Uh, we've got a, I think, fascinating panel. This is, I hear there's been a bunch of AI conversations going on here, but for good reason, because it's an exciting, almost scary, uh, certainly intriguing moment. Um, uh, Jake and I, by the way, uh, did a podcast uh, this week that you should all check out, Money Reimagined. It's the podcast that I do every week with Sheila Warren, and Jake laid out a, a lot, lot of great different perspectives on the intersection between AI and, and crypto. On that note, though, why don't we just go down the line, you guys introduce yourselves, and, um, and then we'll just pick it up from there. Jake. Thank you, Michael, and uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Jake Bruckman. I'm the founder and CEO of CoinFund. We are a blockchain focused investment firm, uh, about 30 people based in New York, Miami, and Boston. Um, for the last couple of years, uh, we've really been paying attention to this intersection of AI and Web3 and made uh, investments in that intersection as far back as uh, 2021. And now, of course, this has become a really prescient narrative that I'm sure uh, you've heard about. So I'm excited to speak more about that today. Thank you. Okay. Neeraj? Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Niraj, and I'm a co-founder at Ritual. And the goal of Ritual is to make it very easy for smart contract developers to integrate AI into their applications. Before Ritual, I was a GP at Polychain for six years, where I led a number of investments in various uh, crypto infra things, and um, started looking at crypto AI very closely. And after a certain point, it started sucking up all of my time, and I just realized I had to you know, leave venture and, and, and go start a venture in the space. And, and that's what I'm building today. And Stacy. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Stacy Ann Pearson. I've been working full time in Crypto Web 3 for about five years now. I started in research at, uh, in China with Oxford's uh, Blockchain Research Institute. Then I moved into digital identity. Uh, I then worked at a metaverse startup, which the funnest thing we worked on was building the Pudgyverse for the Pudgy Penguins, so working with Luca Nets and his team. And I'm currently the head of Web3 for Asia Pacific and Japan for AWS. Uh, from our perspective, obviously we're very uh, heavily invested in five big bet areas, and Web3 and crypto is one of those areas, so super excited to talk about the intersection of Web3 and AI today. So as you can see, it's quite an eclectic panel, uh, you know, traversing different perspectives from a very large company to a startup to, to, to you know, CoinFund, which is probably the biggest investor in, in crypto and AI mm -hmm. around. So on that note, I thought maybe we'd just start off, given that like, when you start unpacking the AI crypto connection, there's so many different directions you can go with it. There are just multiple use cases, there's pluses, negatives, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation. So maybe, just to start off, if each of you could give us what you see is your sort of most exciting, most interesting use case, and then we can sort of take it from there. So what, what are you most interested in at this stage, Jake? Thanks, Michael. Uh, at CoinFund, we, I think we take a little bit of uh, an infrastructural view. So as we said on the podcast the other day, like you can kind of bring AI to Web3, and that maybe looks like you know, reinforcement learning for security or um, having an LLM. Uh, explain something that's going on on chain. And you can also bring Web3 to AI. I happen to think that this um, latter uh, uh, approach is, is a lot more interesting because when you bring Web3 to AI, what you're doing is you're taking the pipeline that produces um, AI models and products, which is kind of people, data, compute, um, and productization, and you start to democratize it. You start to support open source. You start to support more open computation. Um, you start to support like novel monetization strategies for these products. You open up the data. You have new business models for data provenance and, and copyright and things like that. Um, and in doing so, you go from a world where you, know, you could only work on AI uh, you know, seriously if you work at Google to a world where um, scientists who have brilliant ideas about AI can uh, try those ideas by 
crowdfunding compute and getting access to like an open computation network and then actually making money from a product and not having to work in, in big tech. So that's the world we sort of want to see and our investments so far, uh, which include WorldCoin, um, Jensen, Giza, uh, Sindri and Bagel Network and others, they really speak to that um, infrastructural view uh, of opening up that pipeline. Great. Niraj? So a lot of the things that, that we believe are important about crypto AI is really, you know, to, to what Jake said, it's, it's kind of combining the best of both worlds. AI is this technology that's, that's advantaged by being highly centralized. Big companies that create big models and have a lot of compute. Um, and, and crypto really is like a tool for self-sovereignty. It allows you to own your data, own your identity, and being able to combine those properties, I think, is a really important new innovation that we have. A couple of the properties, you know, the salient properties that I think you get from crypto AI, you know, one is privacy. If you can build privacy on the inputs, the outputs, and the models, that's really, really important and something we don't really have today. Computational integrity and verifiability of all of these pieces, censorship resistance, and ultimately, now that you're building all of these, these things in a verifiable way, you can attach programmable incentives to all of the different parts of the ML stack, whether it's a, at the data labeling level or at the compute level or at the model level. Uh, there's a lot of really, really interesting uh, things that you can build with, with this new tooling. And so um, applications we're excited about, and you know, the panel's about AI agents. I think AI agents is a super exciting new use case of you know, varying degrees of things you can do with them, DeFi, NFTs. I, I really believe that um, AI will help bring and usher in the next you know, millions of users into crypto. And um, there's a lot of exciting angles in all of the different subspaces within, uh, within crypto. So Stacey, millions of users, but I mean, how, how are we going to compensate them? And what, what, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly the direction I was going. What I'm most excited about with the, this intersection is the value redistribution back to the individual users. So building off what Niraj was saying, right? So right now, a lot of the benefit of our data is being aggregated, right, by the largest companies that are able to produce the models and the use cases and applications that are built on top of these foundation models. However, not a lot of value is coming back to the originators of the data, the content that's being used to train a lot of these models. So something I'm very excited about is, you know, what will Web3 bring to AI in terms of being able to distribute some of those benefits back to the individual uh, or the company or the entity. Uh, so for example, if you, know, you created or you drew something or you took a picture of something and that you posted it on the internet and that happened to be swallowed within the training data of a large foundation model, it shouldn't be that you get absolutely no compensation for that and you have to go into a legal battle with you know, a, a foundation model creator in order to get your due benefit uh, from you being able to create that. And I think that's something that's fascinating where AI agents uh, attached to your crypto wallet uh, can usher in a new er era where you are getting value for what you are creating and putting on the internet, where AI is using your content, your data to build out, you know, well, some are open source, some are for profit, even though they shouldn't be for profit, but you know <laughs> what I mean. So that's the aspect I'm very excited about. You heard it, folks. from. AWS, not, not for profit. Way to go forward here. <laughs> um, um, so Jake, that, 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 that Stacey's framing there, I think, you know, falls very much in within your Web3 for AI benefit stack. But I want to flip it a bit here because you were talk, when we were talking earlier, you were mentioning security issues. Um, and that, I think that's a, it's an appropriate one to think about from the question mark at the end of the title of our panel, right? This is a good thing, right? Well. Depends how you look at it. Talk, tell us what you see coming down the pike in terms of you know, AI and security for smart contracts. Sure. Um, we've seen a number of um, startups in the market, actually both in kind of crypto and outside of crypto as well, start to apply um, kind of more modern you know, machine learning to the problem of security. So in, in crypto, for example, that has looked like um, 
reinforcement learning that uh, learns how to find vulnerabilities in smart contracts. And what's a little bit scary about that is um, we can really imagine that we're not far off from a world where these larger reinforcement learning models are much better at finding vulnerabilities than humans. And so, you know, really this is uh, poised to, at least a little bit, disrupt kind of the auditing industry that we have. And what's really interesting about these models um, is that when they do find vulnerabilities, it could go, uh, well, they might find them in the smart contracts, but they might also find vulnerabilities in the kind of like Ethereum virtual machine itself. And that's really something that um, auditing doesn't cover. And so you have this wider um, sort of reach of finding vul vulnerabilities, and you get the sense that like, if this technology starts to be deployed you know, more openly, more widely across the smart contract world, it becomes kind of table stakes to have your smart contract reviewed by an AI or, you know, you might just get hacked. So um, that's the kind of world that we're heading to, I think, in, in So basically contracts. the message is buckle up, everybody. Uh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. you> know, <laughs> get ready for these uh, potentially helpful but also potentially, you know, invasive uh, agents to come after your, your smart contracts. Um, Niraj, uh, so, so AI requires a lot of compute. And uh, blockchains are, as we know, not very efficient at dealing with a lot of compute. So how do we deal with that problem? If we're going to find ways to integrate this tech into the writing of smart contracts, the integration of different, different transactions, blockchains, and so forth, um, how are we going to deal with that? Yeah, so there's a, a couple different ways, I think, to take a cut on this question. Um, so the, I guess the current meta kind of backdrop of you know, why you can't do AI on, on most existing systems today is that the compute is, is just too intensive. You know, it, it would run up the gas limit on Ethereum. And you, know, you need to kind of basically take it off chain to make it efficient for, for most use cases. Um, there are a number of different techniques that you can use to actually, you know, because you obviously still want verifiability in that case. And we've seen a variety of new approaches start to, start to come out. There's um, obviously a number of ZKML companies that are trying to encapsulate a lot of this, this model work into, you know, into ZK circuits. There's now newer kind of optimistic solutions that you know, maybe give a little bit on, uh, from a security standpoint, but um, perhaps have a little bit less overhead uh, on, on the proof side. So very much, I think, leaning into the you know, runoff chain, prove on chain paradigm that seems to be kind of the, the, the new wave, I think, is the way to go with a lot of this. And I also think largely, you know, crazy to think about, but you know, most of the industry now outside of Bitcoin is, is proof of stake based. And so we've, we've really kind of gone away from the GPU times of, of um, you know, before. Um, and so I, I'm starting to see you know, a number of networks start to, you know, start and, and build incentives around, you know, basically compute marketplaces and bringing a bunch of GPUs onto their network. And you, again, you can be very kind of heterogeneous with the types of GPUs you bring onto a network. You know, some AI models, you really only need a CPU and you can kind of run in still of a, sort of a parallelized way, all the way to consumer grade GPUs and then all the way up to the, you know, the A100s, H100s. So it's, um, I, I think like what we're focused on is, is generating new interesting ways of uh, gathering demand. We want to see, like, our MO is to see a ton of new AI-enabled Web3 protocols. And I think if we can get there, I think, you know, we can kind of bring a bunch of demand to all of these, these new GPU networks that are, that are kind, of, kind of coming online. So, I mean, picture's starting to emerge here, Stacey, um, of a very decentralized approach to how compute is done. Um, Maybe talk through what Amazon's or AWS's perspective is, because clearly, you know, Amazon, one of the big five uh, platforms, um, a long history of AI. I mean, you, you're you're an algo-driven company. Um, what are you betting on? And I mean, is is this something that you expect large company like, companies like yours to sort of do in-house, or or are you sort of opening this up? And do you expect AI to become ultimately a decentralized undertaking? Sure, so I'll talk about it first from the AWS side and then talk about it secondly from a future trend perspective from my role as head of Web3. So from the AWS side, we do take five big bets. So it's FinTech, 
uh, Web3 and crypto, AIML, uh, health tech, um, and then climate tech. So for the AI ML side, you know, as um, Michael mentioned, like we have been using algorithms and AI for a very long time for our logistics aspects and supply chain management. So where we are today, of course, post ChatGPT, uh, is the explosion of interest and use cases that are built around generative AI. Uh, from AWS's perspective, we don't take a bet or a view on who is going to be the leading model provider or which chatbot is going to be the winner. Instead, we take a community-driven approach or uh, I want to say open source approach. So one of our biggest uh, solutions that we have from an infrastructure pr perspective is called Amazon Bedrock. And from Bedrock, you have access to as many foundation models as we can convince to list within uh, Amazon Bedrock. So for example, we have Claude that's available. We have Meta's or Facebook's Llama model that's available. Um, so Claude is by Anthropic. We also have Hugging Face, Stability AI, I21 Labs. And these are all available within one uh, area. If you think about some of the other big fives, they're pushing their own uh, foundation models as part of their uh, approach. So from the AWS side, we don't take a bet on who's going to win. We're just providing the access to as many uh, foundation models as you can uh, utilize. We have another one that allows you to build. So that's SageMaker. So if you want to build your own FM, then you can also do that with us. So that's on the core side. From the Web3 side, when I think about AI agents, some things that we like to think about, right? I don't know if you remember when IoT was the biggest thing uh, in the market. Everyone was talking about, well, devices are going to be able to interact with each other without the individual, right? So if your car is parking itself and there's a, a meter that it needs to pay, then the car will just talk to the meter. So that's something that we're getting really excited about in terms of AI agents and what if they could connect to your crypto wallet, right? So if you as an individual, if you had an agent that is helping you, let's say the most common use case right around trading, helping you try to find uh, you know, tokens or projects that you're very interested in, you lay out a set of uh, guidelines, right, if it has you know, a, a strong team, or if it has this XY market cap, then, you know, purchase or buy uh, into it. Those are the kinds of future use cases that will be very exciting in terms of from a consumer standpoint, how Web3 is going to uh, integrate with uh, AI. So Jake, um, this past week or so, you know, we got NVIDIA's earnings and just once again, just explosive uh, in terms of the numbers, clearly the demand for GPUs at the moment in relation to the AI uh, infrastructure build is just astounding. Um, but I thought one of the things that was really interesting that came up in our podcast conversation was whether or not, um, in fact, the way in which Web3 could win this is not just that it is a value proposition for security, for protecting data, for all of the advantages that we've been talking about, but that actually it may actually become a more efficient way to, to run that com compute. Can you talk through how that might happen? Um, absolutely. Well, I mean, if you look at like, if you look at our portfolio companies, Jensen and Bagel, like these might be good examples because both, on some level, both of these companies, what, are, what they're trying to do is they're trying to automate automate the respective functions um, that is their subject matter, right? So in, in Jensen's case, we're talking about decentralized training and um, the way that Ben, actually Ben spoke here just a few days ago and what he was saying was that, um, you know, what we're really building here is a platform that is not only usable by humans but also by models themselves. So if you like want a world where models are building models, then you really need sort of like an efficient process by which model training is kind of um, capitalized and is, and is performed um, and is scaled, you know, in a, in a decentralized manner. And similarly, when you look at what, what Bagel is doing, they're operating more, you know, in the data space. And, you know, one way that you can think about Bagel in the future is really like, the platform for data for AGI. So it's not just like, um, it's not just humans that are curating and selling and buying data. Um, it's also AIs that are producing data and agents potentially transacting on chain 
uh, to purchase or sell data, right? So like both of these startups really represent a measure of automation and efficiency um, that kind of gets us to the next level of productivity where agents can do things and, and models can train models. Um, so that's like one, one way of yeah, answering I'm, that question. Okay, and then I want to flip it back to this question about who do you trust in AI? And when, you know, again, the Web3, I think, value prop here on that is it, it's kind of exemplified by the rather amusing uh, experiences of, of Google Gemini this past couple of weeks, right? right? I mean, the, 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 the model that I think, you know, a, a lot of the sort of big tech uh, position has been taking, when, certainly in testimony before Congress and the like, is like, hey, we've got to regulate this stuff, trust us, we are going to the, we, you know, if you regulate us, we'll make sure that we will trustfully build models that, you know, really serve humanity in a way. And if you push this out into the open and open source at all, you're going to get all these bad actors and so forth. Um, and it does look as if Google, in trying to be a trusted entity in solving things like DEI, just ended up with a model that, that produced something you know, quite ridiculous, right? Founding fathers represented as, as African Americans. Um, and so I, I'd like you guys, just to all of you, just think how, and how do we deal with this, right? So because clearly the problem of bias is, is, is ingrained in the data that the internet itself has built over, with algorithms that have sort of manipulated us over the years. And so we've, we've got a pre-existing problem with this data. Um, can Web3 give us something that is going to serve humanity better, I think is where I'd like to close this conversation out. And Stacey, I'd like to throw to you if I can. Yeah, for sure. Um, from, I'll speak not from my AWS standpoint, but from a, you know, core Web3 believer standpoint. So like you mentioned, right, trust shouldn't be owned by any singular entity. It should be a community-driven uh, effort. So for example, when you speak about, hey, what about these uh, data sets that are being produced, or sorry, content that's being produced that we know to be non-factual, right, or biased? Uh, what if then you had sort of a community-driven approach where you are having the community directly review, tag, give feedback on, you know, what we agree as a society to be factual, uh, to be accurate, historically accurate, and reward the most active participants within that review cycle? Now, of course, that opens up new issues. Us as a society agreeing on one view of what is factual, that's a whole different story. But the idea is that instead of one entity like Google, Amazon, Meta, OpenAI being able to control what are the parameters you put around uh, the models that they're building and the use cases and the consumer-facing apps that they're building on top of it, what if you then disperse that responsibility to the community and have reward systems uh, dedicated to that? Uh, we're already seeing that happening on just very quickly the grass, right? I think that's one of the, the first uh, use cases where we're seeing they're trying to give uh, ownership back to the community where they'll pay you for your excess use to sell to AI companies who are scraping the internet. So that's like a first step. What we need to do is take more steps towards making it a community-driven model where we're rewarding community participants to make the data and make the content uh, more aligned with reality. Yeah, this is, we've just opened up a can of worms. We've just got less I than know, a minute I left. And so <laughs> unfortunately, we're going to have to talk, run it really quick. So Niraj, quick thought on this, if you don't mind. Sure. So. Yeah, I, I think uh, that was very well said. I, I think there's no one source of truth, and I think part of the problem is that these companies are trying to be the source of truth, mm -hmm. and I think their attempts to make us safe are, are keeping us more unsafe. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think the power of Web3, again, is taking that tool for self-sovereignty, owning your data, owning your identity, right. and being able to have models like be how you want it to be. Maybe the Gemini thing you do like and you want that, but you should have that choice. And the problem is you don't have that choice, and that's mm. the big problem with centralized AI today. Mm. Ten seconds. I agree with every. <clears throat> excuse me. I agree with everything that's been said, and I'll just leave you guys with the thought that it's becoming increasingly clear that these large monolithic models aren't going to be the way to go. And the two reasons are basically privacy and the performance of these models across different sort of cultural contexts and uh, and, and and venues. Right? Privacy. You don't want to give all of your email data and personal data to OpenAI. Nobody wants that, but OpenAI is poised to suck in 
you know, more data than Google and, and Facebook combined. Um, and on the other hand, you know, if you just have one chat GPT, <clears throat> you know, people in a, a different cultural context might not uh, identify with it kind of culturally, politically, and it's very, very clear that these models are gonna break up into many smaller models that are much more localized and much more private. Okay, as I said, a, a can of worms there. I'm gonna use this as a segue to, sh to give you guys a shameless plug since I am here representing myself as Michael Casey, no, no longer Michael Casey of Coindesk, uh, because my big project at the moment is actually a book. It's called Our Biggest Fight, and it's coming. There's nothing worse than a, an author on stage who is shilling their book. Oh, I, know, I know this is tough. March 12th, co-written a book with Frank McCourt. It's called Our Biggest Fight, and where this is relevant is it's all about how we need to desperately fix a broken internet that has become dominated by five big world garden companies, one of which is obviously taking a broad-minded view on how to move this thing forward. Um, and it's called Our Biggest Fight, um, Reclaiming uh, Liberty, Dig Humanity and Dignity in the Digital Age, co-written with Frank McCourt. Take a look at it. But, um, very relevant to this idea that we've got to move fast and sort of reclaim uh, a, a decentralized internet, which is ultimately, you know, what, what the thing was built for in the first place. And as we move into the AI age, it's critical. So thank you for you guys for talking us through how we might get to that utopian world. Uh, a big round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Great. I think we all enjoyed uh, hearing about different perspectives when it comes to crypto and AI. And for our next talk, uh, we'll discuss the Solana blockchain ecosystem. And obviously, we all know that there's been more and more attention on Solana lately. A lot of projects like to build on Solana for very obvious reasons, like transaction speed, transaction fees, and uh, the scalability potential that the network offers. For our next talk, we'll have Danny um, inviting a guest that are projects merging Solana with Ethereum. So let's welcome Danny and his panelists. Testing, testing. All right, perfect. So, uh, everyone, welcome. We are going to be talking today about the intersection, <clears throat> about the intersection of Solana and Ethereum. We have some projects here that are thinking very closely and deeply about how to take what they believe works with Ethereum and maybe what they believe doesn't, and also take what they believe works and with a, what and leave out what doesn't with Solana and bring them together into new kinds of blockchains, new platforms that where, where developers can take what works from both. So, uh, well, I'd just like to start out today by going down the panel. Uh, everyone, if you could just introduce yourselves and talk just for a couple seconds about your perspective uh, on this intersection between Solana and Ethereum. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so I'm Neil, I'm with Eclipse, and what we're doing is focusing on building the most performant layer two. And the way that we're approaching that is we forked the Solana layer one, which is a highly performant layer one blockchain, and we're turning it into an Ethereum layer two by adding in fraud proofs, ZK proving, and other types of verifiability. So our take is that we want to take the best parts from different ecosystems. Ethereum is the king as far as settlement and censorship resistance, whereas Solana has been optimizing on performance. So we want to get the best of both worlds. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Sukanya. I'm senior integration engineer from Neon EVM. Uh, so Neon EVM is uh, a fully compatible Ethereum uh, solution built on Solana. It's basically uh, an EVM uh, which, is, which resides inside Solana's virtual machine and leverages all the Solana's capabilities. Basically, we are making Ethereum dev developers' lives easier who, who wants to migrate or expand their uh, like dApps to another ecosystem like Solana and leverage all their capabilities. 
Hi, my name is Ajit Tripathi, and uh, I work for Polygon on founder programs. Uh, I have always been interested in this intersection, so, you know, personally, I, when I was at Aave, I uh, invested in uh, Neon. I'm also, you know, an investor in Monad, so there are lots of cool things going on. Uh, from a Polygon perspective, we are a ZK powerhouse, right? We are very, very interested in aggregating the internet of value, so we think that there will be lots of different you know, layer ones and layer twos, which uh, bring different app types of applications to the users. And, you know, I think Solana has done a great job of a few things. So first of all, they have brought a product first culture, right? So as in, if you, if you use, uh, okay, I'm gonna get shouted at in the Ethereum crowd, but I'm gonna say this anyway, uh, you know, uh, that Solana has this, Ethereum has a very strong research culture. So, you know, if you read the Ethereum protocol specs, Right, it, it, everything is look like mathematically robust. The economics of Ethereum is incredibly robust. Uh, the protocol specs are incredibly robust. I used to work with Vlad Zamfir on CBC Casper. It's brilliant. Solana has an engineering and product culture. I think these two things need to come together. Uh, right, so where there is this mobile first experience that Solana is delivering. So, uh, but beyond that, I think, you know, we, what we are seeing across L2s and L1s is a fragmentation of users and liquidity. So, from uh, what Polygon is working on is the aggregation layer. Ethereum has, we think that Ethereum is the global settlement layer. And uh, Ethereum will be, you know, has, is the highest economic security chain. Uh, so, all of the zero-knowledge technology that's being invented by Polygon and, and our peers will be used to bring unified liquidity uh, through the through the proof aggregation technology that we are building. Hi, my name is Keoni Han, the co-founder of Monad. Monad is building the parallel EVM and bringing parallelization as well as other optimizations to the Ethereum virtual machine, um, basically delivering a new layer one that is the best of both worlds between Ethereum and Solana. Monad is as if Ethereum and Solana had a baby. And so just to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we see, uh, we can see that the Ethereum virtual machine is really the standard for smart contract developers. Um, about 96% of all TVL in DeFi is in EVM applications. Um, and there's a very robust research community in addition to all of the developer community and tooling and libraries, there's a really robust research community around the EVM as well. Um, and with Monad, we have gone really deep in terms of rebuilding the execution and consensus stack from the ground up and looking forward to launching Monad at the end of this year. Now, uh, CUNY, I don't know if I quite like the image of a child between a Vitalik and, and, and a Toli, but uh, we have at least two projects here that are thinking just about that specifically uh, with Eclipse, well, maybe not that specifically, but Eclipse and Neon really stand out to me as interesting because you, you two, as we talked a little bit off stage, are almost the inverse of each other. One project thinking, all right, well, we wanna use the SVM in the Ethereum, um, in the Ethereum ecosystem, the other sort of the opposite. So I'd love just for the two of you to talk a little bit more about why uh, Eclipse and Neon, respectively, have made those decisions. And Neil, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I think what these projects demonstrate is that Ethereum is many things. It's a cluster of security properties, including censorship resistance. It is the EVM. And then there's also ETH, programmable money, which is the original narrative. And we're essentially picking different parts of that, where Eclipse taps into ETH, it taps into Ethereum as a settlement layer, but it does not retain the EVM. Whereas Neon is the inverse in that it keeps the EVM, but it's on an entirely different L1, which is Solana. And actually, uh, this is a bit of an alpha leak, but we intend on having some Neon deployment on Eclipse uh, in the coming months. So I think that the Neon take is essentially that, especially when it was first developed, it's bringing, it is actually a parallel EVM. It's the original parallel EVM in that it, the memory model leverages the parallelism of the Solana virtual machine. And, uh, and they essentially want to bring the developers from Ethereum over to Solana. Whereas Ethereum, Eclipse is trying to continue to tap into Ethereum, keep the developers on Ethereum itself, and, uh, and in fact, we want to move them away from the EVM because we just don't think that the EVM is necessarily the most performant VM from a grounds up, from a first principles perspective. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Neil. 
so we are basically, we want uh, the Ethereum developers uh, to come into the Solana's ecosystem. And since Solana has uh, the most uh, unique feature of uh, the parallelism, uh, so executing transactions in parallel is uh, very important in the blockchain space. Uh, like regarding the gas fee hikes, which we see uh, on Ethereum, uh, like layer ones. So uh, to reduce that thing, like uh, parallel execution is uh, very important in the, like on any blockchain. So that is the reason like we wanted uh, like Ethereum community, which is very large. So we wanted something uh, to build for the Ethereum community so that like they uh, like easily can deploy uh, their apps, existing the apps on Solana and get the Solana's benefits of like high transaction speed, low gas fees, and of course like parallel execution. Yeah, so you know, I go back to 2015 in Ethereum, used to work for Consensus. So very proud of all the dev tools work we did. And you know, so when we look at the EVM, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a whole ecosystem. It's not just the EVM, but it's also the libraries, right? It's the open Zeppelin libraries, it's tools like Hard Hat. So all of those things are part of the EVM ecosystem, right? So I, I, including the uh, including the dev, the training materials, the ability of developers to learn from each other and become very productive very, very quickly. So, uh, but you know, Ethereum also has given rise to all the other blockchains. I mean, ICO has produced so many blockchains. A lot of good engineers have come out of Ethereum and gone on to work on Solana and other blockchains. Uh, so uh, at Polygon, we, you know, used uh, block STM. Uh, the library that Aptos guys had used to do some parallelization work on the POS chain. It had certain benefits, but I think you know, there is a lot more that needs to be done uh, to really get the maximum juice out of e EVM on a layer one. Uh, and you know, that's, uh, I think there is a lot of amazing work that Keone and team have done. When I looked at it uh, a year ago, I was like, nah, this is not gonna work. But I'm quite amazed by what you guys have pulled off. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about community, right? So the, the community of developers, I think, on Ethereum and Solana, in terms of the two uh, blockchain ecosystems that have the most robust developers that are most dedicated to them, I think that, the, that these two are the ones to beat. Uh, now, Keone, when it comes to building on uh, from, from Oned, how are you thinking about the differences, maybe philosophically or in the focus on what types of things people want to build between Ethereum and Solana? Monad is focused on supporting developers with big ambitions to build applications that can cross the chasm and reach mainstream adoption. If we think about what it takes for an app to become number one on the iOS app store, um, it means having hundreds of thousands or millions of daily active users. So if you imagine an app that has one million daily active users with, let's say, 50 transactions per user per day, um, that's 50 million transactions or uh, 500 TPS. So it's very clear that we need much more performance in order to support any app that gets to mass user adoption. And Monad is enabling that level of adoption, that level of performance by introducing optimistic parallel execution directly into the EVM, as well as introducing other optimizations like parallel state access with a custom database that our team has built from scratch um, in C++, storing Merkle tree data natively so that, that we actually get performant parallel execution. Um, so I think in terms of the kinds of developers that we're excited about, um, we're, we're here to support. Um, it's tough building a startup. It's, it's tough being an early stage entrepreneur, bringing your vision to the world. And so we're here for app developers that are building ambitious apps that cross the chasm to mainstream. Now, Sukanya, I remember hearing about Neon for a long time in the Solana ecosystem. I remember uh, at Breakpoint, maybe two or three years ago, there were some uh, demos of what this would one day look like. It's been a long time, uh, a, long, a long effort in bringing Neon to the fore. I'm wondering, what are some of the tech challenges that come with bringing the Ethereum virtual machine to Solana? The tech challenges are like um, definitely like Solana's architecture is uh, very different uh, than Ethereum's. Uh, and uh, the Solana's virtual machine has a capability of embedding other virtual machines inside of it. And Neon EVM is an mm -hmm. example of that. 
So uh, the technical challenges are like for giving the full compatibility to the Ethereum developers. It's not, uh, we do not uh, like, we can't have anything like only one smart contract cannot do like all this stuff. So we have to have like a complete uh, full architecture. Like we have our own proxy server, which uh, like wraps the Ethereum like transactions, unwraps the Ethereum like transaction coming in from the user side and then uh, like wrapping it into a Solana like transaction. So there are a lot of modules in between uh, like to give a full compatibility to the Ethereum dev developers. So definitely that was a challenge. And uh, yeah, not only that, uh, like we have like own, like our own tracer API in endpoint, like to give the full uh, compatibility uh, like the Etherscan module, which we have on our block explorers like uh, Block Scout and Neon Scan. So there are a lot of things to be built, not only the smart contract inside uh, Solana's virtual machine, but to give the full compatibility, we need a lot of stuff. So. I can add a little bit of context too, because I've worked pretty closely with Neon, just given that we're planning on the deployment, and then also I was building an EVM on Cosmos a long time ago. And just for context for the audience, in case folks aren't familiar with the Neon architecture, it's essentially a smart contract on Solana, and that smart contract is an EVM bytecode interpreter. Mm -hmm. So you can consider it as, as like one order of magnitude, maybe like 10 times overhead over just executing straight opcodes. And some of the differences in Solana's execution model compared to Ethereum is that you have to specify what accounts are being read from or written to. So in order to gather that information, the Neon team built out this proxy where you submit the transactions there first. It simulates the transaction. It identifies which accounts are invoked. And then it adds that metadata to the transaction before it is signed and sent to the Solana VM. So that's a high level on how the Neon architecture works. Now, Ajit, I think you've been around um, longer than many people here in crypto. That's a compliment. That's a good thing. It's a compliment. <laughs> okay. It means you get to invest in all these wonderful people. But uh, you've got a great uh, perspective into the development of the two ecosystems and the communities around them. I mean, uh, Ethereum had its, a lot of trouble in the early days with the DAO hack and stuff like that. So Solana had its uh, time through the ringer uh, in the months and just over a year after FTX uh, imploded. Uh, but both communities obviously are still very strong and I think growing. So if you could just walk us through how you've seen that come about. Yeah, so my former boss, Mr. Lubin, was here uh, some time back, right? And the work he has done uh, to get Ethereum to this level is incredible. Absolutely phenomenal. So, uh, so communities, right? I, I think there are two things. One is uh, we are we are going through a, a paradigm shift in blockchains. I think that's uh, the idea of modularity. So, Ethereum uh, was layer one was perfect for the time it was built. It was a step change on top of all the colored coins we had, and you know it created a whole new way of building applica decentralized applications, and it was it was a breakthrough. Now. People have been working on improving Ethereum in multiple ways, right? I think Polkadot did a great job with shared security. Uh, and, you know, that was also a co-founder of Ethereum, uh, Gavin. Uh, but what Consensus was able to do is create this, you know, this culture, uh, fund a lot of moonshots, most of whom didn't work, right? If you look, look back at our investment portfolio as Consensus, most things didn't work. Uh, but then other people came along later on and created incredible DeFi protocols, created moonshots, created DEXs, created games, created things that we hadn't really, you know, we, were, we dreamed of, uh, but we were too early, right? So I think now when better technology becomes available, when, you know, Monad or Solana or Neon or, you know, Eclipse or other platforms create new programming models, and, and it's not just this, right? It's also FuelVM, it's Move, it's Cartesi, it's Risk Zero. There is this Cambrian explosion of new programming models. There is Maiden VM. Lots of people are creating these you know, new ways of building applications, and, and with the availability of new computers, right? When your computers are more capable, then you create applications that you hadn't formally thought about. You give developers a tool to play with, and they invent things that you hadn't thought about. And that's what happened with Ethereum. The first uh, few applications were funny, right? It was Locket, which is a DAO for opening a lock remotely. Uh, and I looked at it, and I was like, <laughs> you know, what the hell is this? And CryptoPunks guys would come around to Ethereal conferences and whatnot, and it was like, you know, what the hell is this? I came from enterprise, and, you know, and now look at CryptoPunks, right? Now look at NFTs. So, so I think... 
what I'm really excited about is that developers using all of these new, you know, what's possible with Monad or what's possible with Neon uh, or Eclipse will uh, start inventing things that we haven't thought about, right? They will create uh, central limit order books that are much faster that than that's possible on Ethereum. So, so I think uh, once all of these things are get, get created in a sort of this, you know, monolithic and modular architectures, then we need to bring these things together into some sort of unified liquidity, right? And that's Polygon's vision. So we want to create an internet of value which uh, enables, and we're just continuing on with, you know, what Vitalik, Joe, and, uh, and, and, and everyone else in this space uh, has been envisioning. Uh, we're just standing on the shoulders of giant. We want to create an infrastructure to, for all of these things to come together and you know, work in a trust minimized way where users can flexibly move across the different infrastructures and blockchains and then use this in a, in a seamless way, right? So just like we do on the internet, we don't care about whose routers we are using. We don't care about whose LAN is behind this, right? Or what servers we are. So I think we want to go to that level and Ilya is working on chain abstraction. Avail guys are doing something very cool. So, so we are all in this together and you know, uh, but, but this stage is where I think a lot of that invention is happening right now. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that there's just there's a lot of complexity in the in the stack at this point. And with Monad, our vision is to make it really simple for developers so that they can use the common standard with the EVM, Solidity or Viper or other languages that compile down to EVM. They can use all the tooling, they can use Foundry, they can use Hard Hat, exactly. um, they can use the wallets that they're familiar with, and just you know, this one system that has implemented optimistic parallel execution and solved some of the lower level problems to help each node be very performant and each node get the most out of the performance of the hardware um, that yeah. solves a lot of problems for developers who not, don't have to worry about all this complexity. Yeah, I have a, I have a tweet that says, if, if once Monad works, we should replace the get clients with Monad clients. I don't know if that's, that's going to happen, but you know. Uh, yeah, there's always possibility of collaboration. Monad intends to um, contribute to the Ethereum research community and propose EIPs. That'd Absolutely. be amazing. Yep. Now, uh, Neil and Sakanya, one of the uh, biggest criticisms that people levy against Solana is that uh, sometimes it doesn't work, right? It was only a couple weeks ago after a, a year of working pretty much flawlessly that the chain, unfortunately for it, uh, didn't work for a little bit right there. Now, how do instances like that affect what you're building, if at all? The perspective that I think Eclipse takes and many other Ethereum layer twos is we're building on a several decade time frame and crypto is very early. So blockchains, Solana, and also layer two blockchains have outages. That's just reality, especially when you're pushing the frontier of what's possible to build on chain. So to me, that's not really a flaw in Solana's design. It's actually a growing pain that's somewhat inevitable. And we've seen it for Arbitrum, and we've seen it for even the Eclipse testnet. One time our testnet validator or testnet sequencer ran out of uh, Sepolia ETH. So things like that happen, and I think that's a part of uh, making something more battle-tested. And I, I think that from Eclipse's perspective, when we fork Solana, we're removing a lot of the most, like, uh, I guess the, the least formally verified properties, such as the consensus for Solana is not formally verified in the same way that Tenderman on, Sol on uh, Cosmos is and things like that. So I feel that like we're taking the parts that are relatively uncontroversial, which is the performance optimizations of the virtual machine and, uh, and some of the optimizations of the mempool, and then bringing those optimizations to Ethereum. Um, yep, uh, I agree. Uh, like. Um the flaws, I cannot say that it, th those are flaws. Like, of course, uh, like we are growing, like Solana's ecosystem is growing and uh, like every blockchain has some, uh, like sometimes like they have to go through uh, this situation, I guess. So um, I hope like Solana uh, will uh, like grow with time. Of course, like we should give time to the technology. Like it's evolving uh, like every day. So these kind of things happen. So um, yeah, I hope like Solana guys are like doing really good and they will uh, definitely like overcome this situation very soon. Yeah, I have a lot of spicy interactions with Toli and Mart on Twitter. So, you know, uh, yeah, I think they're great guys. They're doing a great job of what they're building and they built a phenomenal community. Obviously there is a lot of, I, I worry about, you know, Solana's research foundations, you know, is the, is there a consensus? Is the consensus BFT? 
is it mathematically and theoretically robust? I don't know the answer to that, right? Uh, so I, I don't really know decisively uh, as someone who's dabbled in research as to what the theoretical properties of Solana's you know, consensus, if there is one, are. So that sometimes worries me a bit, but I think on, they, will, they will figure it out. Uh, on totally the agree with that. Yeah, the Solana research community is just not as fleshed out as Ethereum. And it shows in fee markets too. There's a lot of things about their fee market that are just not incentive compatible in the way that you'd expect. And there are types of proposals that probably would have never been merged into Ethereum as an L1. Well, uh, thank you all. I, we, I wish we could talk a little bit more about fee markets and all that stuff, but we got we to gotta wrap up, move on. Thank you guys for listening. Um, th th make sure to try out both chains if you haven't already. Thank you. So now that we've talked about the different strengths and opportunities when it comes to merging um, different blockchain ecosystem, it'd be interesting to now talk about the challenges that we're facing um, when it comes to Ethereum. What's so unique about Ethereum is the number and the diversity of blockchains uh, built on top of Ethereum. And interoperability, interoperability is, has been one of the pillar um, to the success of Ethereum as an ecosystem. And so it's a legitimate question to ask that as we're growing and really scaling this number of blockchains and layers on top of Ethereum, what will that mean for interoperability and how will that impact both user experience and developers' capabilities? So to talk about this topic, let's, um, let's welcome Dimitri and his guests. Thank you. All right. I think we're good. Hello, hello. I'm Dimitri, partner at Archetype. We have a great group, uh, crew here. Let's start with 30 second intros to my right. Uh, what you're working on, who you are. All right, rapid fire. Hello, everybody. Austin King, co-founder of Omni Network. Omni is basically an interoperability solution purpose built for the Ethereum ecosystem. We use restaking to pull this crypto economic security budget out of Ethereum itself and use it to let rollups talk to each other. Um, you know, I know it's been a long conference. I'm going to intentionally make this a little more spicy, so looking forward to this. Hi, I'm Susanna. I'm the product lead for the IBC team at the Interchain Foundation. IBC stands for Inter, Inter Blockchain Communication Protocol. It's a generic interoperability protocol that can connect any blockchains, but it's used predominantly in Cosmos right now. Um, so yeah, looking forward to the panel. Hey guys, my name's Fig. I'm one of the co-founders of Squid. And Squid is a API and set of developer tools that let you take any token on one chain to any token on another in one transaction and do other more complicated things like buying NFTs in one click on any chain, staking on any chain. Uh, we're using IBC under the hood as well as Axelar, uh, which is an uh, underlying interoperability network. Hey guys, I'm Brandon uh, from Zeta Chain, and I, uh, we're working on a omni-chain blockchain. So what that means is we connect natively to pretty much any blockchain agnostically and serve a EVM programmable layer where you can orchestrate, transfer do anything you want with those assets. So the most exciting piece is Bitcoin right now. So trying to enable new use cases for using Bitcoin with the rest of DeFi and crypto. Cool. So I'll try to make it a little spicier, I suppose. Um, I think with Ethereum, as you compare it to Cosmos, one of the issues is that with the roll-up center roadmap, I think Interop is a second-class citizen. So with Cosmos, that's been outlined from the start. And I think now we're kind of backing into solutions. And I think there's pros and cons. But high level, what do you all make of that? Yeah, uh, I agree. I actually totally agree. So this is why we're building Omni. There is no like canonical path towards having interop in the Ethereum ecosystem. And so what we're seeing is the global network effects of Ethereum are just obviously degrading. And so this is a clear problem, especially as platforms like Solana just offer a way better user experience at this point. And so uh, what we're particularly focused on is just uniting all these different rollups that have created this fragmented ecosystem 
And particularly, we're focused on doing that in a way where we're promoting open standards. So, you know, I don't know if people here have heard of like Axlar ITSs, Layer Zero OFTs, more of these like proprietary token standards. Fundamentally, we think that's a bad idea. There's been a ton of hacks in the space. A lot of that money went to North Korea, pulls a ton of bad attention into it. And so, Instead, what we can do is design open standards like XCRC20, which is a token standard that gives asset issuers themselves sovereignty over where the asset goes. They can whitelist interop networks, they can blacklist them, get them off, they can put rate limits on it. It's fundamentally a better design. And we've been driving a ton of traction around this recently. There's like over seven bill in cumulative market cap that's committed to using these standards. And honestly, selling it to these teams is m not that hard because it's just a better product than what's out there in the market. So the way we see this going forward is there's the interop space here where it's like how do people use these tools? That should be open standards. And then there's the verification layer of how do these messages get passed around. That's really where I think most of us, uh, not IBC, uh, are like uh, involved in the space though. So that's how we see it. It has not been formally like first, like front and center in the Ethereum roadmap, uh, but that actually presents a lot of opportunities to teams out there. Yeah, I think like uh, Ethereum is like clearly like, you know, a pioneering blockchain and design philosophy of its time. And like when it launched, it actually had, you know, lots of core principles around interoperability. But that notion of interoperability was between applications built on Ethereum. And then I, I think Ethereum just grew so quickly and gained so much traction and delivered so much like value to the blockchain space that it actually kind of like outgrew itself in rollups. I believe it I mean it wasn't the first choice for the scaling solution, but it enabled more people to get involved in a more active way. But all of these people building their own rollup frameworks, bespoke rollup uh, ecosystems they're fundamentally not incentivized to cooperate. Um, and <laughs> this is like kind of a consequence as well of Ethereum not being like definitively opinionated about interoperability and leaving it up to kind of app layer primitives to decide how that should be. And that's like in contrast to Cosmos where you say interoperability should actually be a core kind of fundamental primitive of blockchains and applications can be built with that primitive rather than like leaving it up to applications to solve that. Well, that's an issue as well, right? Because I think what we're seeing is you have, you know, the OP super chain that's doing their own like flavor of interop. You have ZK Sync, Hyperchains, Starkware, Fractal Scaling, Arbitrum, Orbit, and uh, doing, you know, so I think that's also a fundamental tension where you seem to have these L2 ecosystems trying to bake in their own like native interop. At the same time, you're trying to solve for how do you do cross L2 and cross L3 interop. Yeah, it's like the XKCD meme. Like everybody's got their own solution. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I might take the I agree with everything these guys have said. I think the lack of standardization can be seen as a feature though, not a bug. Um, part of the beauty of Web3 is that you don't get the protocol given to you, you can innovate at the protocol layer. And despite the connections between all these rollups, it's actually the innovation that every new rollup brings. They're like doing a new type of ZK or a different gas model or how they incentivize builders. And from my perspective, our, our API aggregates a bunch of different chains and we use Cosmos and Ethereum. And the hardest part isn't actually aggregating the interop, it's aggregating all the different micro changes that each one of these L1s and L2s has put into their stack. So I think the things like uh, standardizing the interop layer is actually not the biggest issue. Like we're, um, we're dealing with getting just transactions included in a, in a blockchain can be really hard when you uh, are used to doing it on Ethereum. Um, and so, yeah, I think we should, we should move towards this idea of creativity and creep, keeping protocol innovation like possible and rather than locking into standards. You can think of like email, um, it's been outdated by messenger apps like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger for example. Like, It's much easier to communicate these ways. We use Telegram for communication in our own business and the protocolization of email did a great thing for making the internet uh, connect with itself but it also meant that we had to do this leapfrog into a new technology. Um, so yeah, I think we should keep this fluid motion until we find something where everything's working and then maybe we settle on a standard. Yeah. Uh, I have to echo what you said. Um, I think there is still kind of like, we're still in the state of dust settling of L2 
strategies coming up, interop solutions coming up. So um, I don't really follow exactly how the EF works, but I, my guess is there's not really a clear winner in what interop should look like. Uh, and if that should maybe expand beyond the Ethereum ecosystem in some way, kind of like IBC. Um, the way we look at it is kind of flat. So other L1s or L2s in the EVM ecosystem are uh, kind of ripe for inter or, uh, making interoperable. So um, rather than kind of just sticking to the EVM ecosystem, can we have something that is standardized across all, like expanding X or C20 or whatever those standards are to general fungibility across Cosmos chains or Bitcoin or what have you? Yep. And I guess from a project perspective, when I think about you know, the design trade-offs that an L2 takes and just the nature of it being an L2, how do you think about how that informs your own designs? Are there any key kind of like differences that you are afforded when you're working with L2s and, and how that informs your specific projects from either a cost, extensibility, security perspective? Like how, well, what's the main difference you think between facilitating interop between L2s and L3s rather than the uh, different L1s, I suppose? Yeah, so I think one of the most interesting things here is the amount of innovation that we can have at the L2 layer itself. Everybody's just building EVM equivalent rollups today. Like, cool, glad we have rollups, but there's a ton of room for innovation on the actual like VM that is running there. That's going to enable us to bring far more developers into the industry at large because people don't know Solidity. And frankly, Solidity is not that great of a language to work with. So if we can design VMs where people can program in Rust, that's fantastic. Other languages as well. So. Omni, specifically, we only work in the Ethereum ecosystem. We built this network very intentionally to be the best product for the biggest market. We don't work with other blockchains. Historically, all interop protocols have focused on bringing assets and like data to other blockchains. We don't do that. It's purpose-built for Ethereum. It pulls security from Ethereum itself. Uh, and intentionally, when we started designing this network, we did it in a way where there was a very minimal requirement for integration. Rollups don't actually have to do anything to get in integrated into the Omni network. The Omni network sits above and actually observes these state updates itself. So one thing that we saw when we started designing this about like a year and a half ago was that there would be a proliferation of VMs here. And we needed to empower uh, further innovation to happen at the L2 layer. Um, so uh, we don't care if it doesn't make a difference to the Omni network if there's different VMs there. And that's the way this stuff should be designed. If you look at the internet protocol stack, there are like very minimal requirements when you move from like one layer of it to another. I think in this space, we have had just like a very silly perspective. And like sometimes teams market themselves as like the TCP IP of crypto. That's nonsensical. Like TCP IP does not have a business model. All these networks, they might not be companies, but they, it costs money to secure them. They have a business model. They have to take revenue somewhere. The reason the world uses TCP IP is because it does not privilege any specific entity that's out there. It's just a minimal standard. And so that's how we looked at it. It's just like, what is the minimal amount of work or like the minimal data structure and like compliance that we need with these rollups? Our perspective on it is like, the world is going to be built on Ethereum. Like, uh, Right now, the user experience is terrible and it's super expensive, but by the end of the cycle, it's gonna look like Solana. Like, we are building these externalized networks that still have the security of Ethereum itself, and by the end of the cycle, like, we are going to have, like, sub-second finality from the user experience perspective. Um, so that's how we look at, like, what, how you should look at all these, like, different architectures that are out there, require the least amount possible from them so you can cover everything globally. Um, I think, maybe I just wanted to know, um, like IBC is a little bit different in that the protocol fundamentally doesn't extract any fees from people that use it. So To be clear, IBC is the closest thing to TCP IP we have because <laughs> it's not a network. It's actually a standard. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, then I, I guess, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was basically my point just to note that yeah. um, it is maybe slightly different from no. what we think of bridges or things like that today. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. So I want to talk about a couple of different flavors of interop that I think is emerging given L2s. One way to do it is through shared sequencing. Mm -hmm. So instead of having an externally verified bridge, you have a sequencer that does the transaction ordering for multiple rollups, 
And so in a way that gives you some flavor of at least inclusion guarantees, maybe not execution guarantees. Some projects have claimed you can do it. Um, why do we need external bridges at all if we could just have in or out via a shared sequencer network on an L2? Yeah, I think if, uh, shared, shared sequencer uh, interop is something that's really exciting, but we want to see in production and um, see someone actually build with it. And then what the developer experience looks like for sending a message between two, say, rollouts which share a sequencer. And my view is that we've already seen multiple different sequencer projects pop up, so there's going to need to be interop between those, let alone we still have Solana as a, you know, there's going to need, need to be interop with Solana and all these new tech stacks which get built. So I think interop still has a future. Um, but my view is definitely that we should, we should still use the most secure stack, like say the L2 or L3 native bridge for collateralization of assets wherever that's possible. But because often they're quite slow, like optimistic bridges take seven days, um, we still need an extra layer of, for making settlement and execution happen between these environments quickly. And then you maybe have an even third layer on top, which is with intents, which gives you instant finality, but much worse liveness guarantees, for example. So I think we'll always have a blend of all of these different architectures to give the user the best experience with the highest security. Yeah. I think with uh, shared sequences, um, as you already said, it's like if you use a shared sequencer network and you have multiple rollups plugging into that, you can guarantee inclusion. But if you actually want to start guaranteeing execution, you need to add additional proofs to that. And then you're already starting to start building something that's increasingly looking like the inter-blockchain communication protocol. Um, so to me, it's like with all of these design spaces, if we want to have something which is you know, has trust minimization, um, those kind of core principles that we want for interoperability, they're all going to kind of converge in this design space of some kind of like client proof based uh, interoperability. And uh, I think the shared sequencer interoperability is going to be, be no different, especially for people that are looking for atomic execution as well. I, I think one thing to think about here as well is Shared sequencers are awesome. Uh, this is going to be super cool. You know, for a long time, I think a lot of people viewed decentralization of the sequencer as like a regulatory arbitrage opportunity. Obviously, there's risk with just running a CPU that processes all these transactions. So uh, what we're seeing now is you can get pre-confirmations out of shared sequencers. And so this is going to be a fundamental thing for the Ethereum ecosystem. Like the leading shared sequencer team, in my opinion, is Espresso, for example. What we're going to be able to do in collaborating with Espresso is their shared sequencer networks are going to be able to issue pre-confirmation of inclusion of transactions. They'll have to work with builders in this, but still, you can get this down to like 100 millisecond level, and this is how we're going to achieve the Solana UX on Ethereum itself. And what we can do is we can relay those pre confirmation those pre-confirmed transactions across different roll-up environments, whether that's to a single roll-up or to another shared sequencer environment. But like at large, there's still going to be many different shared sequencers, fundamentally because we need more throughput on the network. Uh, none of these distributed consensus protocols can handle like the real vision of Ethereum of processing, you know, like hundreds of thousands, millions of transactions per second. So fundamentally, there's still like a throughput constraint, and that's what's blocking the vision of just like all roll-ups becoming a big shared sequencer. For us, like I was saying before, we're heavily focused on L1 connection and our hesitation to connecting to certain L2s is we don't have things like shared sequencers that make it kind of like a more sustainable thing to connect to because for us, if a chain in our sort of hub and spoke model is compromised or whatever, um, that can have ripple effects to other assets on other chains that we're connecting to. Um, so yeah, we're bullish on whether it's something more like IBC or L2 shared sequencers to come to the game to where we can start integrating L2 so we can do L2 to L1, L2 to L2, L3 to LX, what have you. Yeah. But there is this fundamental tension between security and cost slash speed slash extensibility where I believe pr uh, probably the most secure model is a two-way light climb bridge where you're actually doing a consensus proof. And I think the benefit of being an L2 is you do have 
cheaper execution fees. So you can either verify a validity proof of the light client, or you can actually just do the light client verification directly on the L2. Um, you can potentially have a light client bridge from an L1 to an L2, and that feels cheaper. So the ideal state in my mind is why don't we just have bi-directional light client bridges, ZK verified or not, and then just have that be the most secure model. Yeah, I think that's, we're going to make it spicy. I think that's a nice picture of the world, but it's very impractical. Like, if, I don't know how, like, versed the crowd is in ZK, but generating proofs for moving, well, one, you need finality on these things, so that's a huge problem in the Ethereum ecosystem. But uh, the cost to generate ZK proofs at this time uh, and the time to generate ZK proofs at this time make them a terrible solution for interoperability today. In like four years, are these probably going to be an incredible solution for this? Yeah, like next cycle where we're kicking things off, I imagine this will play a very important role in interoperability. But I actually disagree with the fundamental premise here that like there's t tr a trade off between all these things. And uh, I think that's solved with restaking. If you have a network that is crypto economically secured, that gives you extreme speed. Like our network reaches consensus in under a second. And so, we have an extreme level of security, literally like this will be billions of dollars, something that has never been able to have been achieved before with an external network that did not pull a security budget out of Ethereum itself. But I think that that like used to be the state of the world, but it's just not the case anymore. Like using restaking, you get the best of security and performance. Down the road, we'll play with ZK more. It's impractical today though, for interop at least. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think the future will converge on ZK based solutions. And I mean, it's clear on the Ethereum roadmap, right? They have single slot finality coming up. They have a lot of um, stuff around snarks and snark based proofs, um, having a proper light client that's not just based on the sync committee. Like it's clearly coming, um, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's about the timeliness of it. Um, so yeah, th there is always a trade off until we reach that kind of the technology is ready. Yeah, cool. Well, we're at time and unfortunately maybe one last question from my right, I suppose, how many L2s do you think there are going to be in five years? Millions. Millions. <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, for our next talk, we're very lucky to have the girls that co-founded Boys Club. And they're going to come here to discuss kind of like the culture and crypto in general and really tackle why crypto is um, cultivating for a lot of people, why people either love it like us or people hate it. So let's give a warm welcome to Diana and Natasha from Boys Club. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Lots of nice blue hats. Love to see it. Man, this is so <laughs> intense, you guys. Really intense. I who did see someone sleeping in the back, so I think, I think it's, it's going to be OK. Do you know? Um, who came out to the voice club party last night? Let's hear a round. We're still recovering, so. Bear with us. We're, nice. we're all in this together. <laughs> So you're on our team now. Um, OK. Thanks for being here. Uh, OK, welcome to our TED Talk, Why People Hate Crypto and What We Can Do About It. OK, um, so I'm Natasha Hoskins. This is Dina Burke. We are the co-founders of Boys Club. We started Boys Club in 2021 to bring new voices to the new internet. And how we do that is through podcasts and newsletters and parties. Um, being in person is, is very important to the work that we do. We also have thousands of people who hang out online in Discord. And we spend all day talking about, yes, crypto and emerging technology and things like that, but also our skincare routines and our favorite TV series and our social lives and our work lives. And we've cultivated a community where people feel like they can show up as their full selves, which might sound sort of trivial, but is actually central to what we're doing and should be central to a larger conversation we're having in crypto. Um, we started Boys Club because we saw this opportunity to be a part of building a brand new internet in ways that we were not able to participate in previous versions and iterations of the internet. And we thought it was very important that we brought a lot of people along for that ride and a lot of people to participate in the creation of this new internet. So surrounding ourselves with people who aren't purists about the technology has been incredible. It's kept us really, really honest about what's happening in crypto. Um, one thing that we think about a lot and that we keep coming back to is about this idea that major technological developments, um, like whether it's the invention of the internet or the launch of the iPhone or what's happening right now with AI and GPUs, they happen um, in ways that are intertwined and connected with people's interests and desires. Um, they're very much a part of culture. These things don't happen uh, in parallel or separate to culture. And we think and want to be looking at crypto with that same lens. OK, so a little bit more about Boys Club to give some context. Um, you might know us as those girls who throw parties. And we do do that. And I am <laughs> nursing an unbelievable hangover <laughs> today. Um, but we do a lot more than that. We have had 125 podcasts with very legitimate guests that range from Mr. Read Right Own himself, Chris Dixon, um, to Jesse Pollack, to Kashmir Hill, the senior reporter for tech at the New York Times. We've had mm -hmm. Evan McMullen in the audience here. Lots of people, <laughs> lots of great people here. Um, and we've hosted conversations um, rooted in curiosity on everything from EAC to Costco. Mm -hmm. We have had over, we've written over a hundred newsletters that have reliably shown up in tens of thousands of people's inboxes every Wednesday and every Sunday for two and a half years. I was a court reporter mm -hmm. during the SBF trial. <laughs> um, anyway, we've been here a long time. We've been building, we've been thinking about this intersection for a really long time. If you still don't get it, that's okay. There's only like 10 minutes left of this talk. Um, so hang in there. OK, so again, we have this really, really strong thesis that crypto doesn't exist in a bubble. Um, we think that crypto needs to be considered in the context of two things. One, it's an enabling technology that's happening at a time where there's a lot of other enabling technologies that are coming into maturity. And two, uh, we're spending more and more of our lives online. Culture is shifting beneath our feet. Um, we need to be understanding crypto in this context and also in the relationship of um, how we think about ownership, how that relates to the internet. We love this quote from Packy McCormick. This isn't about onboarding the next billion users to crypto. 
This is about using blockchain networks to do things that people, billions of people want to do better. This really sums it up. But I think in order to really deliver on this idea, you need to have a deep understanding of people, um, a deep understanding of their media diets, and what their stated and revealed preferences contain. OK, so let's start with the mainstream media diet and narrative that we see. It's bad. It's very bad. We know it. We see it every day. And it's really toxic. And we have a thesis on why this is happening. It's sort of a self-fulfilling cycle where traditional media looks for spectacular headlines with a lot of money on the line. And crypto has a lot of those. And we know them well. We don't need to get into it. Um, but that happens, and it creates bias. And then that bias makes the price go down. The price drops. The bias is then confirmed. Big brands are doing experiments very publicly and then unwilling to continue that experimentation when it doesn't quite work or it fails. That, again, confirms bias. The regulatory environment is uncertain. Again, bias is confirmed. And we go on and on and on and on in this cycle. OK, but it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all bad news. We ran a survey recently um, in the last uh, six weeks. We got 600 respondents. Uh, these are not Boys Club members. These are not our newsletter subscribers. These are not our Twitter followers. This is a totally random sampling of folks across the US, 16 and up, uh, split across incomes and ages. And the incredible news is we asked this question, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of blockchains and crypto? 67% said yes. So this is, was really, shock, honestly, shocking to us. Not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> and um, I think is uh, really interesting compared to the previous slides around this sort of narrative, means for media narrative around crypto. Um, but it's uh, not, you know, just some sobering uh, news to go along with that. When we, talk, when we asked about the top three positive quality, qualities associated with crypto, the top one was, uh, no surprise, investment return. I think when we're thinking about this, it's like, okay, that's obvious. All we've given them is the casino side of this industry. And that, again, comes as no surprise. But I think one thing that we're thinking a lot about is about how the values of a more creative, less corporate internet are actually shown in people's revealed preferences. Um, we just haven't given them language for that. So if you're a builder in the room, tune in. <laughs> These are some things you can be thinking about. Um, a very tried and true go-to-market truism is find a parade and get in front of it. So these are our parades. Oh, and basically what we're going to do is walk through five cultural movements that are happening today in the year of our Lord, 2024, and sort of how they dovetail into uh, larger themes and uh, values of Web3. Yeah, we think they're really opportunities for builders to tap into these larger movements um, to, again, find a parade and get in front. Before we do that, huge shout out to Xerox Designer. Ooh who uh, we collaborated with on these slides. Uh, if you don't know them, they do these incredible UI UX mockups that are really showing the values of Web3 and the ideas of Web3, bringing it to life. Uh, they did one every day last year. And yeah, hire them, pay them, sponsor them. Incredible work. Thank you for your collaboration thank you, thank you. on this. OK, so we're going to start with this idea of algorithmic flattening and monoculture. So the idea of algorithmic flattening is that we are all living on machine learning informed feeds that are designed to keep us within the platform. So what we see on our feeds are mostly content that won't, we won't turn away from, that we're maybe most likely to engage with. And the result of that is kind of boring, pretty unchallenging, not surprising, not shocking content on your feed. And content creators are locked into this loop where they are fighting against the algorithm to try to remain on your feed and end up producing pretty neutral, monotone content that is needed in order to survive if they're content creators. So how does Web3 fix this? Um, the enemy of monoculture is decentralization. When there isn't one algorithm or one platform that is deciding all of the ways that we think, um, there is an opportunity, and many platforms with many different algorithms that are allowing us to engage in different ways, to have ownership over how the network looks and feels, 
and what we see, a thousand flowers can, boom, can bloom. So when incentives are aligned, social media platforms, their incentives are aligned with the users. When switching costs are incredibly low and when value flows to the edges of the network instead, instead of the center, this is how we fight against these trends. Okay, next big trend, future of work. The discourse is discoursing here. We've all seen the headlines, Gen Z, millennials, disillusioned, especially post-pandemic. Uh, AI fears, uh, the AI and jobs conversation, I think is about to enter the culture wars in a very significant way. Uh, credentialed identities aren't gonna solve for all of this, but I do think it speaks to a more uh, streamlined and efficient work life where when all of your skills and experiences are on chain, they're transparent, um, you're able to, oh, thank you. Uh, we could see a world where opportunity finds you and opportunity that's really suited for your experiences and skill sets are finding you instead of going out and on the job hunt and applying for a zillion roles and doing all that applying bullshit. Um, another thing that we're really excited about um, with the future of work is this idea that um, you can enter into uh, relationships with employers or partners that are governed by smart contracts that have maybe revenue sharing that's built into them. And yeah, just generally, I think there's a lot of opportunity to create a much more higher agency future for workers uh, using Web3. Okay, fake news, bots, deep fakes. The fears are here <laughs> and they are mounting and they are very, very real. Um, this is an urgent, uh, conversation from DC all the way to Hollywood, and it is an opportunity to bring the blockchain there. Um, so how does that work? I mean, we all know that blockchains are incredibly well suited for verification, which allows for media to be able to be verified on chain, where attribution can be identified, where provenance can exist. This is a huge opportunity. Like it, love it, or hate it, it's there. Okay, next one. Big tech skepticism uh, related to this is consolidation of power by tech giants, mistrust of tech leaders, a huge conversation in modern culture. Surely we can find some common ground with these people. Uh, the why Web3 of it is really clear when you own your data, when you have the opportunity to be compensated for the ownership of that data, when you are owning the network, when you're um, participating in the governance of that network, when you're speaking into the decision-making processes around that network, you can't get an Elon Musk. And um, yeah, I, I feel very strongly that we need to make uh, a really concerted and strong effort to align with these people and not alienate the anti-big tech crowd. I feel like this is the battleground for crypto to win. Okay, media landscape slash hellscape. If you have been paying attention at all in the last few years, you have seen that traditional media is having a reckoning. From ID to Vox to NBC to Pitchfork, layoffs, closures, it's, it's pretty bleak. And the reason for this is that these Publications relied on traffic for their ad models, and they got very comfy in the 2010s where Facebook was feeding them a lot of traffic. And then the algorithm changed, and they got totally fucked. And now they're relying on Google search, which works if you can like elbow your way to the very top of, of the search results, but that has absolutely eroded the trust between publications and their readers. So new media is here. Um, it is beehives and substacks and podcasts. It's niche, commu niche communities with a thought leader at the helm. Um, and subscriptions work for these businesses, but I, we at Boys Club really have a belief that ad models are inevitable and that they will happen. So we think that the future of media is exciting and when data is interoperable, when consumers can opt in to the types of advertising that they want, curated through distribution channels that they trust, it's going to be a much, much brighter future and a much more interesting media landscape. Okay, so that's that. Web3 builders, these are the things you should be aligning with. Blockchain fixes it, just don't be cringe. Okay. Thank you bye. so much. Bye. <laughs>
I would love to welcome back to the stage Jennifer Sanasi. She is going to be um, she's going to be uh, hosting a panel on infra is so over onboarding in the consumer crypto era. So how many of you got, how long have you guys been in the space? How many of you have been in the space a year? At least a year? Two, two years, like leave your hands up. Three years, four, five, uh, just leave your hands up. Six, seven, some people there, eight, nine, ten. I remember, uh, so I got into the space in 2018, and I remember being part of the product circle at Consensus, and uh, looking at, uh, one day we just busted open DAP stats, and saw that there were, what, 200 transactions that had happened the prior week, and 160 of them were crypto kitties. Like, uh, and this was a fringe thing, like everybody was talking about it, but nothing was happening. And based on like everything that they were just saying in the last fireside conversation uh, that we are, you know, consumers are ready and consumers are frustrated and ready for something better and uh, just building things on top of things on top of things with apps that uh, aren't visible to these end consumers who are ready to pay with their attention and their eyeballs and their energy and their life force and everything is, uh, it's starting to happen, it's gonna happen more. And I'm really excited for this conversation uh, where we're going to be able to, uh, to talk about that. Are, how many of you guys are working in the consumer space? A few of you. Uh, so, what are you what, what are you working on? A sports collective. That's awesome. So, yeah, very much on topic for what, what the type of thing that we're going to be talking about. I want to welcome Jennifer and the panel to uh, talk about this important topic. everyone. I'm Jen Sanasi. I'm a reporter at Coindesk. Really excited for this panel today called Infra is so over onboarding in the consumer crypto era. I'm just going to welcome my panelists to the stage. We have Jess Holgrave from Wallet Connect, Hillary Scaffington from Robinhood Crypto, and Hannes Gray from Zeal. Now, I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds to just introduce yourselves, lay the foundation for us so everyone in our audience knows who we're speaking to, and then we'll dive into our discussion. Jess, let's start with you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jess Holgrave. I'm the CEO at Wallet Connect. Um, this conversation for me is super exciting. I hope that Infra isn't totally over, given that Wallet Connect is a core infrastructure play for the ecosystem. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of exciting things in terms of the consumer experience that's been enabled by the Infra work over the last few years. So excited to dive in. Thanks. Awesome. Hillary? Hi, my name is Hilary Scovington. I'm a product manager at Robinhood Crypto. Um, I cover on-chain transfers and our on-ramp, Robinhood Connect. I'm super excited to be talking about consumer products in the crypto industry. Um, I've been working in crypto since 2015 um, for Zappo Bank, which was a consumer uh, Bitcoin wallet for a period of time. So I'm definitely aware of all the problem points and how we can make crypto hopefully more, a little bit more mainstream. And Hannes? Hello, everyone. My name is Hannes Gray, um, and I'm one of the builders at Zeal Wallet, which is a smart wallet. We're a team of former Revolutors, which is a slightly more known brand than Zeal, uh, and we're moving into the smart wallet space because we think this is a key thing to enter the next billion people coming into the space. So, Zeal and Hannes. All right, now just before this panel, everyone in the audience was asked who's building a consumer application and not everyone put their hand up. And so my question for the panelists here on the stage today is, is that a problem? Shouldn't everyone be thinking about whatever they're building as having a consumer application? Hillary, I see you nodding. Yes, everybody should be building towards consumer products. No, um, I mean, I think there's a lot there. There's infrastructure, obviously, for developers, for institutions. There's a huge amount of um, value in building those types of products. I think if we really want to push this industry to a broader adoption, there has to be a consumer facing point there. Um, so I hope to see more hands next time. I think for me, it's less about should everybody be building a consumer product and more about should we all, whatever we're doing, be building with the end user in mind. And I think that this is really key to creating 
great end user experiences. Um, I often hear the term like, how do we onboard the next billion users into crypto? And I really hate it. I'd much rather that what we were doing was taking crypto to the next billion users rather than thinking that they're gonna come to us. And so I think that when we're building infrastructure, consumer products, whatever they are, what we need to be doing is thinking about who those consumers are and how we create amazing end user experiences for them. Um, so this isn't about everybody building a consumer product, but it has to be about everybody building with the consumer in mind. Um, and I think that, that is, that's really what's gonna drive future adoption. Hannes? Yeah, customer obsession. Customer obsession we need. And there is some customer obsession, but primarily the customers so far have been people in crypto. And we need to have customer obsession about people also outside of crypto. And now we have a lot of infra in place, so now we can start to obsess about their needs as well. Jess, I want to come back to what you were saying. How do you keep consumers top of mind? A lot of the things that folks are building in this room are very technical. There are a lot of challenges ahead. Uh, a lot of products are in a beta phase. At, through each stage of building, how are you keeping that end user in mind so that you know you're building along the right pathway? I mean, I think without just like going into normal product management kind of skills, one of the things that we think a lot about at Wallet Connect is standards, right? So we sit at this unique point in the industry where we work with uh, both wallets and dApps and as a result, we have to think about end user experiences both on the wallet side and the application side as well. One of the things that I often think about there is that competition is awesome in this space. The more competition and innovation we have, the better we're gonna end up with uh, end user experiences. But the downside of competition is that we can end up also with very, very fragmented ex experiences. And I think at the moment, especially, this is true, where we have many different types of login, many different types of ways of creating wallets, of storing wallets. And we're going to end up in a situation where we have assets all over the place, and we don't really know how to manage them. Um, so one of the key things that is where Wallet Connect started was in bringing these different groups to the table, facilitating conversations about how we have a shared set of standards so that these things become interoperable. Um, we run something called the Chain Agnostic Standard Association, we do a lot of work around chain agnostic improvement protocols, uh, proposals, a lot of work on EIP, of course, and things too. Um, and these things are all designed ultimately as a way of bridging that gap from like, how do we build great infrastructure, but also how do we make sure that the end user experience is great? And I think it's those conversations that are so important for the industry to be having. I just wanna make sure everyone on the stage knows that you can jump in. Don't wait for me to ask if you have something to add, but Hillary or Hannes, did you, uh, do you have a different perspective there? Go ahead. There, yeah, there's a fair bit of fragmentation of standards, um, but again, there are ways to work around all of those things as long as we put the customer first. And, and I think that that will drive some of the standard implementations as well so that we can reach out to customers the right way. Sometimes standards don't actually lead to the best customer experience because we haven't focused on the customer first. Definitely. I mean, with Robinhood, we're obviously a big consumer application. Um, when we launched Robinhood Crypto a few years ago, we saw a huge influx of customers. And then last year when we launched Robinhood Wallet, we really positioned that as the bridge to bring customers from RHC and other platforms into the self-custody world. Um, and there's just a lot around ease of use, intuitive UI, et cetera, that we're trying to build to really solve those problems. Um, as a product manager, you know, we talk to users all the time. I would have to say three, the three big problems are going to be speed, cost, reliability. Um, and recently, we actually launched a collaboration with Arbitrim for our Robinhood wallet where we're offering in-app swaps. Um, and it's just to you know, basically solve those problems, how we can, how we can make it more cost-effective, faster, and on a really trusted platform. So we're excited to see how that grows. Um, but that's definitely consumers and fixing those problems are definitely a top of mind for us. I want to come back to that consumer research in just a moment, but Hannes, I have to ask you, um, is infra actually so over? How should we be thinking about infra as we move forward? Well, <clears throat> infra is never really over, right? Uh, we don't have to s build infra for a billion people already. We're not quite there yet. And so it'll go in cycles, right? We're doing infra for the current couple of million people and then the 100 million people. And it scales with orders of magnitude. Uh, same thing in, in Web 2 and 1.0 as well. Um, infra is never really dead. It just goes in cycles. But we do need more customer. Speaking of cycles, Jess, uh, 
I guess my first question is, are we in the next bull market? And how do you prepare for all of these users who come along with bull cycles, who are reading the news headlines and deciding, hey, maybe I'm going to try out uh, one of these new novel products I'm hearing about? Um, I think uh, judging by the, how much fun everybody's had this week <laughs> and the activities I saw in a nightclub last night, it feels certainly like we're back in a, back in a bull market. Um, on a more serious note, the numbers that we've seen at Wallet Connect over the last few weeks, last few months, have really also demonstrated that in terms of the connections between apps and wallets uh, across a whole range of sectors within the space. So I think that that's really positive, and obviously we've had a lot of head uh, tailwinds in terms of the Bitcoin ETF and all this sort of stuff. So. Are we in a bull market? I think so. How do we prepare for that? Um, you know, firstly, I think it's about making sure that the technology is reliable and secure. This is really, really important. I think the other thing that we have to do as we enter these these exciting times, and I actually love the other times where we can focus. Um, but as we enter these exciting times, what we have to try to do is spot where there is real kind of substance and not just hype, and make sure that like that's where we really build. Um, I think the other thing that we have to be aware of is as we, as new new users come into this ecosystem, they're not as familiar with this technology as we are. Um, and whilst a lot of the infrastructure that we've built over the last few years is helpful to that in terms of onboarding them, um, it doesn't come at sort of no risk. And security, we know, is still a really big challenge for new users within the ecosystem. We did a survey that we just launched a big report on this week, and 28% of all crypto users that we asked say that at some point they've been rugged, been fished, been hacked. Um, and that's a huge, huge number. Um, and so if we are going to onboard another 100 million people, another billion people, um, that number has got to go down a significant amount. And so we have a huge responsibility as an industry through this next cycle to make sure that we're protecting end consumers um, and that we're educating them and giving them the tools that they need to, to act safely within, within this space. Um, so I think that's, that for me is, is kind of key. Yeah, to add to that too, um, going back to the user research, I mean, we hear trust all of the time. Um, and you know, one way you could look at Robinhood is we do have a mix of your more advanced customers as well as some of the more novice ones. And trust is a big one there. Um, and so we spend a lot of time on the education front and kind of abstracting that complexity in the UI so that customers are really aware at any point what they're doing. Um, earlier this year, late last year, we launched a pricing campaign to basically explain like what does it mean when you place a trade and what are all these different aspects and we were trying to pertain to both the advanced customer as well as a novice user. So explaining what like a bid price is but then also showing the advanced customers like a breakdown of our pricing versus other exchanges, um, which was, we got you know, really good feedback from that. Um, and we were able to kind of converge two user segments that are very different into one product feature, which went really well. I think whether this is a, a small bull market or the start of a larger cycle, we don't yet know. Uh, at the very least, the short-term cycle we're seeing right now is heavily centralized crypto-driven, right? ETF listing, a lot of demand coming in from that side. Um, but I think that's also a bit of a, to some way, a, a red herring. Yes, it's good number go up. People give us attention. But we actually have to build products that aren't dependent on the cycle, that aren't just dependent on the trading use cases. We need to build products that work in both bear and bull cycles. And most consumer products are like that, right? Um, so that's why we're excited at Zeal, is to build products that aren't just for trading, but allows you to use your crypto as money for real finance as well. Hillary, what do consumers want? Ooh, big, big question. Um, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, it's, it's like speed and cost. I, I really can't stop reiterating that. Um, and, and transparency in both of those things. Um, that's like at the core of a lot of our principles and what we're doing right now. Um, people want to know exactly what they're getting at any given point in time. They want to make sure that the service is reliable and that they're able to move and, and actually own their holdings as, 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 as much as they want. Um, and that's, you know, we're seeing that in the industry today already with so many L2s and roll-ups, like we're seeing um, a lot of those problems getting solved for. And it's cool that we're able to see that also within Robinhood Wallet with the Arbitrum collaboration that I mentioned before. Um, but yeah, honestly, it comes down to just like speed and cost and for Robinhood. 
What you're describing sounds to me like convenience, and I think Web2 yeah. has done a really good job at being convenient at the cost of some other things that people hold near and dear to their heart. Jess, I'm going to uh, pass this question off to you. How do you balance that convenience and that education piece when you think about onboarding the next 100 million or billion folks? So I think that um, I, I, I don't disagree that like speed and reliability and cost and things are important. But I think that unless we have real value behind that, it doesn't really matter. You can be really fast, really reliable, but if what you're actually engaging with is, but is your product is, doesn't really do it's not fun or it doesn't give you some value, then like that doesn't really matter. Um, and so I think that actually what consumers want is like more fun. They want their problems to be solved. They want things that they've never been able to do before. They want gaming loops that are only enabled because we, we build them in a decentralized way. They want to be able to send money from here to another country without having to go through the pain and the time. They want all of these things. And yes, we need to make those, those like interface pieces smooth and fast and stuff like this, but like unless we're delivering real value to end consumers, none of that really matters. Um, and I think that for me, part of why I'm excited about like this year is that some of those like friction points are going away. And what that does is it gets us just to the starting line, in my view. That I really think that we are just at the starting line. But it gets us to the starting line where builders can focus on their core competencies rather than having to worry about the, these friction points, right? So if you're a game developer now, you have the tooling to just focus on building really cool Web3 enabled games. If you're a marketplace, you've got the tooling to just focus on creating a really cool marketplace for whatever that is. Um, and I think that that's what's really unique about this cycle versus things that we've seen before, is that for the people who are building those end consumer experiences, they no longer have to spin so many cycles just thinking about the friction, the friction points. Like I remember back in like 2017 when I was building this NFT project, the amount of time that I just spent thinking about like the wallet experience and not focusing on what I was really trying to build was extraordinary. And so I love that in this cycle, hopefully builders don't have to do that. We think there are three overarching dimensions, which roughly maps to what you guys said. So I think we're all relatively in alignment, although not everything needs to be fun, but it's fun if it's fun. Um, for us, those three overarching truths and dimensions is one value that people get the most from their money, whether that is a higher yield return or lower costs, right? But a higher net return. Uh, the other one is safety. People want to feel safe and secure when they're doing something that has to do with money, right? Uh, and the third one is convenience, uh, something that just works for you, whether that's related to how the security is set up or how you make the transaction. So we need to build solutions. And in the case of DeFi, we're a DeFi product, something that's easier to use than cash, safer than a bank, and can be used for all your financial needs. Walking around the conference, seeing all of the projects that are here, do you think that what we're talking about right now on this stage is being done well? And if so, how? And if not, what do we as an industry need to think about and do better? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's very promising what we're seeing. Um, I think to Jess's point, there's a lot of different projects and different, that are solving different problems, gaming, tokenization, cross-border payments, et cetera. Um, so just like the optionality is, is all out there. Um, in terms of what can be better, I think, yeah, there's a big, there's a big focus on trust right now. Um, and I think the best way to do trust is just through education and just more transparency. Um, so making it more available and, and making some of those tools that are accessible even more user-friendly is what first comes to mind. Um, I guess when I think about are we doing it well, one of the things that I'm not so sure about, and this goes back to something that Hannah said, is like whether what we're doing is actually really decentralized at all. Um, and I think that that's maybe one area that we can continue to do better, including us at Wallet Connect, big focus for this year. Um, but I think that, that is, uh, that's certainly top of mind. The other thing that I think is really interesting um, as I observe like different uh, projects in this, in this space is um, 
how we think about understanding our end user um, and how we think about their like expressed versus revealed preferences. And I think that um, still in this ecosystem today, we're building a lot for expressed preference rather than revealed preference. Um, there's a really, again, as part of this report that we re that we uh, released this week, um, like 50% of end consumers within crypto say that they want more security features. 27% of the same group say that they don't use the security features that are available to them. And 6% self-identify that they don't use them because they're too lazy. So like already we are at this place right now where even some of the things that we're we are building and particularly even on the security side, which is often considered like really core to adoption, people just aren't using this. And I think that that's where, again, there's a little bit of maturing in the industry to go around like how we really understand our consumers, how we use data better, um, and how we build to what people actually want rather than just like what they say they want because those things aren't the same. People are ready to give it all up for convenience. Like at the airport, I'm ready to give you all of my data <laughs> to pass, bypass that line. I've seen that work uh, live in action. Hannes, so I'm going to throw it to you now. We're talking about decentralization and the need for decentralization in the space, but does the consumer really want that or even care? So decentralization is a charged word with many interpretations, and there are different like hybrid decentralization implementations as well. Um, I think what we have to always ask ourselves, what is the value proposition that users want? So we roll it back to these overarching truths. Can we use decentralization in ways to deliver more value back to people, to deliver ease of use back to people? Then yes, decentralization as a kind of abstract concept can mean many different things. Uh, and it's hard to implement these things, right? It's, uh, there, there are different approaches to it. Um, if you look at what, what's happening here at this, in, in this venue, I think some of the key problems that have been blocking us are actually solved now. I'll go out on limb and say, I think uh, security with the advent of pass keys and smart wallets is now a relatively solved problem. Not at scale with customers yet, but there are enough implementations in the wild now that this year is the year we'll solve the security of private keys. Transaction security in those things, also getting there. Um, the other one is scaling. I think we also have enough that's being done on that side. Um, one part we're still lagging behind, though, um, I think is on the ramping side. Uh, it's still a bit of a crypto casino money inside there. Can you move them out? Can you move them in? Don't know. Maybe you have to pay 5% to move them across the border. Um, there are several good companies building in this space, but I would love to see more builders solving for the easy move of more money between your on-chain assets and your real-world bank accounts. Um, we have in Europe uh, instant free bank transfers, but we need to have that kind of utility all over the world so that people can think of their crypto account as interchangeable with a real world bank account. Um, because right now there are too many barriers and then it kind of becomes this stuck isolated ecosystem. Yeah, I have to say on-ramping continues to be like one of the bigger themes for our customers as well, is how do they actually get their coins onto XYZ platform. Um, similarly, we also have our own on-ramp, uh, Robinhood Connect, and luckily customers can choose any existing fiat balance on Robinhood or crypto holdings and on-ramp through our service to whatever self-custody wallet that they want. Um, but it's still like a, a really big, it's a re still a really big transaction. Um, if you don't have a Robinhood account or don't have an account with another um, platform, you have to get KYC, you have to go through all these different steps and it, it is still like a lot to do. Um, it's cool to see that we have a lot of these other on-ramps in the space, on and off-ramps in the space, but there's still um, definitely some, some room to grow. I mean, neo banks uh, like Malma Mater Revolut and, and many others, they're basically offering zero on-ramping fees to get people started with their solution, right? That's how you get started with your new bank account. Yet most wallets, when you get started, you have to pay pretty high fees to, to get started. So we need to take some of those learnings of how things work in Web2 and apply them also here to help people get started without a, a bouncer that checks if you're wearing the right clothes or if you want to pay 5% entrance fee. Jess, I'm curious here, you know, we're talking so much about what consumers want, and I feel like the conversation has been kind of North America-centric. How does it change when we look at different regions, and we're looking at consumer needs? Like, how do you think about the needs of people in different areas? Because they're very different. Yeah, they're definitely, uh, they're definitely very different, and I think that that's one of the, for me, one of the most exciting things anyway. Um, I'm particularly excited about, like, 
areas of the world where there is less developed financial infrastructure, um, for example. And, and here, some of the problems that we're solving for consumers are like real, real problems, right? They're like, how do I take $100, and if I'm transferring that on a cross-border basis from like some US creator platform, then by the time it gets into my bank account, it's like $70, and I've just paid $30 into the system that is not working for me. Um, and I think that here, like crypto is a prime example of something that is solving like an amazing problem that we in, uh, in many like developed markets just don't have this issue, right? Like we're used to near free financial transactions. We're used to being able to move money around really, really easily. We're used to being able to access assets uh, in a more easy way. And so I think that actually there's huge, huge discrepancy all over the world depending on uh, the infrastructure that is there, the kind of use cases that are available uh, to, to those end consumers. Um, and so I think that this is, again, something as we think about like consumer adoption, um, I think that actually what we're probably going to see is like almost this leapfrogging effect where like if you have something that kind of works today, your incentives to like really rebuild it are much lower than if you've got something that's really tough today and you've almost got this like more white space to rebuild something. And so I actually think that in many, in many places we're gonna see this leapfrogging effect of like um, these more kind of uh, advanced financial systems into something that actually is way better because of this technology. It's gonna take time for sure. Um, but I think that that's where we'll see also this, this kind of difference as well. Yeah, to relate it back to something that you both were saying earlier about the utility, um, we definitely see that differently in emerging markets. Um, personally, I started working in this industry 2015. I was living in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and that's where I actually did really see that um, use case firsthand. Um, it, you know, crypto offered another way for customers to hold value, and that was very, you know, inspiring and also a great place to see it really come up. Um, and there, you know, it's a different problem set than what we might see in more developed markets. Um, and so it's going to be very interesting to see how that kind of envelops over time. Yeah, the use cases are very different by market, right? In, in some markets, just the dollar itself is a great use case, and crypto is a technology that enables access to the dollar. Uh, up until a week ago, we were also doing ramping in Nigeria, and we saw huge demand for people just wanted to move from the Naira into the dollar. Um, maybe not as big demand in the US because you're moving from a dollar to a dollar for that specific use case, but again, if you put the customer hat on, those needs vary a lot between geographies. Hillary, you brought up Buenos Aires, and this I'm going to take this opportunity to cross-promote because Buenos Aires is actually launching um, on-chain IDs, and I'm doing a fireside chat about that on the Coral stage at 4, so please come. It's very exciting news. I'm really excited to talk about that. Okay, but I wasn't going to let you guys off the stage without talking about regulation. Just we talk about regulation so much in this industry. Um, we've talked about it a bunch today. But do consumers really care or understand what's going on from a legislative perspective here in the US or care about it as much as we talk about it amongst ourselves? I mean, I think consumers care about regulation to the extent that they feel protected by it, right? Uh, that's why a lot of regulation exists, and you can argue about the efficacy of that, and I certainly would, would have strong arguments that it's not always really protecting the consumer. But ultimately, like, that's kind of the goal of regulation, and some of it's not very good, but, uh, but that's what it's there for. And so I think when you just take this as a primitive, the idea here is, like, how do we create that same sense of safety, the same kind of consumer protection, protections without relying on regulation. Um, and I think that that is something that actually I think this industry is doing pretty good job on now. Um, there's a lot of focus on how we create better user experiences, um, how we have more protection. Um, we still have a lot of bad actors in the ecosystem and like that breaks my heart because there's so many people here who are working to try and make a better world that the people who are taking advantage of that um, I think is incredibly sad. Um, but ultimately, if when I think about regulation, you know, and I've, I've done a lot of policy work, I've done a lot of work with like the Bank of England on some of this stuff, but actually I've kind of come to the conclusion that like 
we as an industry just need to build things in a better way and we need to um, we need to call out bad actors within the industry ourselves so that we can um, really create safe technology that can be adopted globally because the other thing with regulation is it's so fragmented that if we constantly try to pander to this as an industry we're just going to again spin a ton of cycles um, and also we're just going to end up building within this framework of something that fundamentally I believe is broken uh, like I'm doing this because I think that there are better ways of doing things and part of that also involves um, being more more responsible being more thoughtful and like moving to a world where maybe we have less regulation we need to stop giving money to North Korea um, and we are a lot of people that are putting in efforts on security um, but if we don't self-regulate then we will be overregulated potentially um, yeah if we don't do it ourselves, someone will invent practices that will stop that bleed, right? Um, and there are lots of efforts putting, being put into it. Uh, us wallets, we have our, our obligation to do as well, right? With safety checks and transaction safety checks, etc. cetera. Um, but it's an industry-wide effort we have to do. Not to mention also smart contract development practice, etc., which is an emerging field. So it, it's a complex territory. But we really have to do better or someone will make us stop doing it. What do you mean by that when you say, as an industry, we have to self-regulate? Uh, what I mean by that is we need to implement better practices for preventing hacks, whether it's at the development stage or at the execution stage for a customer. Uh, as, as a wallet builder, that means we are implementing safety checks when you're doing transactions, when you're connecting to sites, lots of big red warnings if you're trying to do something that you shouldn't. Um, in, in Web2, in neobanks, we have whole teams that spend time just helping people protect themselves from themselves doing mistakes. Um, in, in DeFi or Web3, quite often it almost feels like we're encouraged to make, make mistakes. But it's an emerging industry, and so we, we move forward. Hillary, you get the last word here. Uh, what kind of questions are Robinhood's customers asking when it comes to regulation? Are they really concerned? So I think when I, when I think of customers and, and regulation, I think of just trust and transparency. I wouldn't say that, hey, we get questions specifically about this, but in every single thing that we design, every feature that we release, it's, okay, on the infrastructure side, what are we building? Is it safe? What checks do we need? But then conversely on the front end, like how are we informing customers of what's going on and how can we be as transparent as possible with, possible with them? And to the self-regulation, it's like, okay, how can you make it very obvious that there are scams out there? Um, and including that in a UI way that people can actually, you know, um, trust themselves to be able to handle their, their own holdings. Jess, Hillary Hennis, thank you so much for joining me on stage. Thank you all for listening. We are all done. And I think Infra is so not over, right? <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs>Thanks for that. Um, this is awesome. Necessary stuff as a you know, fellow uh, product manager, uh, just making sure that you're making things that matter to people that are accessible, that they want them to use. It's like the you know, valuable, usable, and feasible somehow escaped us in the early days, and it's coming home to roost, and now I'm so glad that uh, we're paying attention to that. Uh, next up, I am very excited that we're going to be having uh, Ted, one of the OGs on Farcaster. Love the name. Huge fan of the Hyperion books where that might have come from. So uh, she's the ultimate power user and early adopter. Um, what Farcaster is doing is so important just because, you know, you own everything. I love that expression. Like, you own, it's your network, your audience, you know, your social graph. Just when you put yourself out there and you build a following on your lines, like this is your community, this is your life's work, and right now, these big companies can own it, they can shut you down, they can deplatform you, they can, they can, and it's just like not their problem. Like, uh, you know, my, my father had all this wonderful poetry he'd written on Stumbled Upon and just the next day shut down, all gone. We were fortunately able to get it back and just because we were lucky and happened to catch a fringe post. But now this is uh, really awesome that, you know, you can really own your own stuff. Welcome, Ted. Welcome, crew.
I love ETH Denver, but I don't love panels. And so <laughs> we're gonna mix it up a little bit. And the whole vibe here is that we're just like four friends at happy hour, chit-chatting over a beer. And that's kind of what Farcaster dev ecosystem and user ecosystem is like anyway. So it's a little bit on brand. Um, I got a good intro, but I would love for each of you to introduce yourself, be very you know, succinct, precise about what you do, and then we can take it from there. Hi, I'm Rish, uh, co-founder of Nainar. We provide infrastructure for Farcaster and no-code frame tools. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm David. I'm working on Frames.js and also Open Frames, and I've been building in, on Farcaster for a while as well. And I'm Johanna. I'm a full-stack developer at Liquality. I am originally a wallet developer doing all things wallets, and right now we're doing collective account-abstracted wallets for Frames and Farcaster dApps. Awesome. OK, so I actually know all of them for the past two years more. So we were all on Farcaster kind of, let's say, early 2021, or late 2021, early 2022, and beyond. But um, I'm really interested to know why did you choose to build on Farcaster, given the other options in terms of decentralized social? And at what moment were you like, oh, OK, this is the now. I'm committing to building on Farcaster versus anywhere else. Yeah. Um, so my co-founder and I, we were both at Coinbase for the last four years. Um, and part of our work at Coinbase was to uh, build and develop on social protocols. Um, like my team worked on the XMTP integration on Wallet, for example. And Mona and I spent a lot of time um, just learning about the protocols in the space, like all the way from PPIth to BitCloud, which later became DSO. BitCloud. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Lens from Aave, Farcaster. Um, and when Farcaster came around, it was the first time we felt like there was a plan for a protocol that could actually scale to mainstream audience. Um, and both of us were coming up on our four years and thinking about what to do next. And after going through some idea maze, we were just like, let's just build on Farcaster and see what happens. And you initially started building an app, correct? Yeah. Like a client on Farcaster, right? Yeah, yeah. We started building an app back when Hubs didn't exist. <laughs> I, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Stick to building infra. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, um, you're better at the infra. Um, so we, we started building an app that had like, you know, a few people beta testing it, um, Ted, uh, David. And uh, we had built our own infra in-house, running Hubs, indexers, and all of that. And one of the evenings, as a random experiment, we threw out a landing page that said, hey, if you pay us, we'll give you access to the infra. And people paid us immediately. So we were like, oh, OK, maybe we should build the infra. So uh, there's, yeah, you're like, there's demand here for infra. And I'd love to hear from David and Johanna as well, because I know both of you also tried to build early and did build early in David's case. Sure, so yeah. how, was, how um, was that experience? <laughs> yeah, so, so in, in 2022, early 2022, I decided that I wanted to get into decentralized social. I decided that this was like the most important mission for the open internet is to have a credible sort of decentralized social protocol. Um, and I looked at a bunch of the things that were happening and a lot of it felt like it was building for a crypto audience where the transaction costs and the gas costs were, were just magnitudes too high. Um, and then I came across Farcaster um, and I think two things really resonated for me. Um, one was that they were very much designing the architecture to reach a mass consumer audience. Um, and then the second thing was that they were being very thoughtful around uh, the effects of financialization and social and trying to avoid it and sort of cultivating an early sort of high quality community um, in their app. Um, and so those two things really drew me in um, where you know other things that had been sort of financialized social didn't. Um, and so I started building um, in late 2022, and um, I had to sort of reverse engineer the, the Warpcast sort of um, the, the APIs that they were using for their own app in order to get data, because this was like pre, pre sort of decentralized guys, protocol. Yeah. Just to make sure everyone understands what he had to do, there was no documentation, sure. and so he literally had to go and inspect the source code to figure out what Farcaster or how Farcaster was built, and then reverse engineer it back. I 
I like, A, that's gigabrain stuff, <laughs> but also that's not easy for the developer ecosystem, right? Like, how are you supposed to build apps efficiently and quickly and, you know, have fun with it when that, that, that's the uphill battle you're against? But Yeah, yeah I remember, like, uh, searchcaster.xyz yeah. was, like, the first API, that, yeah. and everyone was super excited, but, like, now looking back, it's super limited. You can't really get much data from it, right? I mean, so. still, it's the best search client out there for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, also, really quick, Coinbase Carl, welcome to our, we're doing a little happy hour chit chat here <laughs> instead of a panel. Uh, do you want to take two seconds to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, hello, sorry for being late. Um, I'm Carl, I'm with Base uh, Developer Relations. I actually was super honed in on doing like hackathon judging, <laughs> so super excited to see people building on frames. Um, and short and sweet, I'm here to help build the Base ecosystem. Incredible. Um, Okay, so again, reverse engineering, Searchcaster was the first API for Farcaster. Still one of the best. Shout out to Greg Skrilloff, who is another OG. Um, and then, kind of, Johanna, you want to talk more about what, what you were seeing as in terms of issues a years ago? Uh, sure. Like, uh, uh, the, uh, well, a few years ago, yeah, I think it was just like the, the biggest thing was the, like the lack of APIs because you basically had to build your own indexer and your own database and also your like uh, little dApp or client or whatever you were spinning up and you had to have all the infrastructure on it on your computer and on your machine. Like you had to spin up a local hub and then, or, or something like this or rely on hubs that then went down all of a sudden and you didn't know what was going on. So that was was ba basically the, the biggest uh, the thing, and that's why I'm also like uh, very happy for Nanar and the other APIs to exist now, which makes it so much easier and faster because you can kind of just uh, uh, give them that layer and focus on the client stuff. So. so then, fast forward. This is kind of let's say 2022, early 2022. Fast forward two years, and as of a month ago, me, non-technical person, baby engineer, am able to code or no code something, a product, and deploy it on Farcaster through a new feature called Farcaster Frames. Um, this is what Base and I think Coinbase, Coinbase, Corey, no, sorry. Just but, Base. Just Base. Focus just Base, base. Um, has also done. Nanar has a no code. Yeah. David ultimately really leaned into Frames too. And so maybe we can take a step back and talk about how Frames are perhaps what I believe to be one of the most exciting features uh, primitives for decentralized social and consumer social more generally. And then even if you think about social as kind of the infrastructure pathway to economics as well, go from there. So sure. anyone can take yeah. it. Yeah, I, I think I'm the right person to take this one. <laughs> um, the, the context on that is um, um, in mid last year, I pivoted to trying to um, build uh, mini apps on top of Farcaster. Um, and I, I think frames are really powerful because the, the thing we've seen is that users really want to use one app. And that's actually the best way to deliver an experience. And so Farcaster is really like a distribution layer for everything else. And so far, it's been links. So you distribute links, you get the user to follow the link and connect their wallet and do the things. But that's a lot of friction, and there's also a safety assumption there when you go to an unknown domain. And so frames really pull that experience into the client, um, and that also gives developers now a rich interface with which to sort of build new experiences so that the social apps aren't just, you know, text, image, link, but there's actually, like, rich experiences right there. Um, and I think there's some, like, nostalgia towards, like, the Facebook days yes. when when you sort of had, you know, Farmville in your feed and all sorts of poking. <laughs> yeah. And um, would, would love to see that sort of flourishing of, of experimentation and, and playfulness again. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's like a lot of such games built on frames already. Um, and I think everybody on, well, in Base's case, Jesse launched super based on Nanar. And everybody else on the stage already uses Nanar to build frames to some extent from developer to no code frames. And there's a rich, uh, developer ecosystem you can also provide for building frames. Um, and that, like, you built a frame that I didn't even know could be built using our frame studio. And that was like a crazy experience. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not to, I love Nanar Frame yeah. Studio. Uh, I'm pretty sure that within the first 48 hours of you launching it, you probably wanted to kill me because I had <laughs> feature request after feature request. But I would also love to hear from Base about. 
I think the base team galvanized around frames. As soon as it was launched on Friday, the entire weekend was yeah. just a frenzy of frame development. And the base team, out of any other um, network on there, really yeah. rose to the occasion and helped support the dev ecosystem. So I'd love for you to just share what it was like on the inside, because we all saw what it was like on the outside. Um, yeah, definitely. So literally Friday, we got the news the same time as everybody. And it was <laughs> uh, like probably 10 of us had a good three days of doing stuff that entire weekend. Um, so we made on-chain kit pretty quickly, which was like our kind of helper. Um, and that started to do really well. One of the other things that we had was like the Girl, Girl Scout cookies commerce integration. So, you know, be able to buy Girl Scout cookies from a frame. Um, that's still super fun. Yeah. I've never spent crypto that fast. So. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying I've never spent crypto that fast as like that Girl Scout cookie. Yeah, yeah. I, I even ordered them even though I don't live in the US. So I didn't get any cookies. <laughs> I, I, just, I just felt like I was missing out. Yeah, yeah. Um, it definitely helped just Bases distribution. We got to both help like um, people that we've known before and also net new developers. So I think that was our, my favorite part was that we did kind of empower and help give our base distribution to all the Farcaster far users that were experimenting, doing new things, and helping push kind of like what is possible forward. There were definitely, um, one of my good friends, Brandon, built one of the first generative uh, NFT frames. And I remember we went surfing right after. He like shipped it, we went surfing, and he was like, I'm really afraid, I think my gas, like all of my like gas, like I'm not gonna be able to cover gas costs for everyone. And by the time he came back, the base team had already completely filled the contract so that the mint could continue throughout it. So just huge shout out to the base team for being huge supporters of all of the dev activity. Um, Johanna, I would love to hear what you are thinking in terms of frames forecasting, what you're building as well. Uh, so we are right now actually using frames as like a go-to-market uh, and we've seen like huge su success because there's like a, a lot of noise on Farcaster and on every social media but you kind of have to ask yourself like how do we like disregard that noise and tap into a user's uh, attention span, right? And frames are great for that because they're still so limited and simple that it makes it very easy for users to interact with them because it's literally just usually like two button clicks, right? So uh, yeah, we've seen like the numbers uh, like uh, grow, uh, like much faster using a frame than like redirecting them to our uh, original DAP. So that's kind of how we are using Farcaster and frames right now. So e excited to see like how we can uh, add more wallet stuff into that. Because one thing I'm, I think is really interesting right now is uh, also like uh, Farcaster clients that have a wallet integrated mm -hmm. in them where you can enable more of like the economy aspect uh, with a wallet UI. I know a lot of people are building that right now, maybe Corbin at Patch Wallet is the uh, most famous one. So yeah, excited for that as well. Yeah, I will say too, uh, I don't know if this, I don't think it's, it's my point of view personally, is that uh, I think what David said at the beginning is that what we all appreciate about the Farcaster ecosystem was that it built intentionally with like long-term value and it was focused on what value does a social network offer us as users and as humans. And how is that different than like pure speculation or financialization of a personality or of content? And I think that long-term view enabled us all now to build products with that same kind of long-term view, value-focused um, approach. And I would even say like, as a, as a user or as users here, my question is like, okay, if you're a developer, that's, that's one thing. But for people here who aren't developers but care about their social network or care about their social profiles, what value or like how can they add value to what you are building? So for instance, I know I use no code, uh, Nainar, no code, Frame Studio all the time. Love it. Um, you can see all of my frames on my profile if you want. But otherwise, like what, what should users be doing? And then I also want on the other side to talk about how can brands leverage the data from frames uh, as we think about signal to noise. But let's first, anyone, who here in the audience, by the way, has a Warpcast profile or a Farcast profile? Hell yeah! yeah that's Look at a lot that. Of people. That's like the majority of the crowd. Granted, this is a Farcaster panel, so of course you <laughs> would be here. But, <laughs> um, anyways, um, who wants to take it? Yeah, I'll I'll start with the user side, and maybe somebody else can pick up the brand side. So I think on the user side, like it's it's pretty simple and standard, which is like um, come in, engage meaningfully, thoughtfully, uh, find other people who you have common interests with, come join a channel that you can contribute to or learn from, and the whole ecosystem and the user. Um, 
interactions are built on top of like meaningful engagement, uh, not over financialization or any kind of other things we have seen in the past in Web3 social protocols. And I think brands have recently started engaging with that meaningfully as well. I think Base is a great example that has a very strong presence on Forecaster. Um, and maybe yet uh, David or Carl, you guys can Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Forecaster channels are a great opportunity for brands to build a Forecaster native community that's an alternative to Telegram or Discord. Um, and I think it's a better alternative because it has native discoverability of their content into their home feeds, which Discord and Telegram don't have. And Telegram groups or Discord groups that become too big become very noisy and immediately users mute them. And then they have no hook to come back into your community. The difference with Farcaster channels is that if you keep posting, the user, if they follow your channel, will see those posts, if they're popular enough, in their home feeds. And so there's a great distribution hook. The other really great opportunity for, um, for brands with this is, um, is frames, of course, right? Like, it's a great way to distribute your product and onboard new users um, in a way that, you know, we're seeing across the board Brands do 10x volume on, on NFT mints, on signups, on subscriptions across the board. And everyone I've spoken to at ETH Denver is, is building a frame pretty much. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of blowing my mind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, as a brand, you think about, let's say, these 10,000, you're getting 10,000 mints, whereas before you would maybe get 10 on Forecast or you just didn't have the distribution. Now you're getting 10,000. 10,000 mints, but you have the on-chain and off-chain data to then look at who is minting and what they care about, what their kind of what content, what channels they're posting in, what their activity is on-chain, and you have a much better way to think through like the entire conversion funnel. How can you then pinpoint and figure out who do we care about minting this and how do we reach them? Whereas anywhere else, if you post it in Telegram, you, you can't really do that. Like you yeah. don't have the way to track it in the yeah. same way. Yeah. Um, I'm curious from the base side too, is you're enabling, I mean, you're basically an outsourced support team <laughs> for anyone building. And so I would love to hear like, okay, if I decided, hey, I want to build a frame and I want to incorporate and, and kind of have transactions on it, what's the best way for me to go about working with base on that? Um, yeah, definitely. So like we have our own base channel uh, for in Farcaster. That's kind of a great entry point. We have our support discord. Um, but I think a big part of it is that like the base team just goes out and find things as well. So sometimes like we come come into a situation without ever talking to that creator, just because we want to see that economy kind of grow. Um, I do think going back to that data question, I just want to add from the base point um, something that we think about a lot um, is as we move towards like an account abstraction world in four through three seven, that off chain data of your activity and what you're doing is very much going to be input to like should we be sponsoring gas for what projects and what people. Um, and I think that's going to create a really interesting future of bringing more people on chain because some of that complexity disappears and it's just a, a web two interaction. Yeah, go for it. I see like a world in the future where like the forecaster protocol has many clients like many and all of those clients have like different uh, tasks or problems that they solve right so we could have like a forecaster client that is a, a wallet where you pay stuff and then you have uh, the social feed and then you can it's kind of like uh, WeChat but Decentralized, <laughs> you know, like WeChat it takes care of payments, but it's also a social feed, also a messaging network. And we could have the same with a forecaster protocol with different clients doing different things. Or maybe one day, one client that does all the things, but ideally many clients so we don't rely too much on one, right? So. Yeah. Like in an ideal world, if Farcaster succeeds, that means it has 1 billion users of the protocol at least, and then hundreds of clients built on top of it with thousands of developers building those clients. Yeah, I, I think a really interesting point here that's sort of underappreciated is that right now Warpcast and all the Farcaster clients look very similar. And that's a result not of the technical constraints, but really of the content that's being shared and just the sort of earliness of the scene. You can build Twitter on Farcaster. You can build um, Reddit. Instagram. You can build Instagram. You can build YouTube. All of these social apps can be built on top of Farcaster as a technology. And so we're going to see a lot of that come yep. um, as Farcaster grows. And I think 
Uh, I don't know who else in here. I have Instagram, I have you know Twitter, I have all these other things. And the beauty for me is you hear a big, a big pain point. I think a lot of people who are on Twitter all the time is like, I can't believe I have to restart to build a Warpcast following. And I'm like, yes, but once you do that, you never have to hit that cold start problem again because the account and the profile you build on, Farcast, or on Warpcast right now, you can then use it for whatever Instagram equivalent, whatever Venmo equivalent, all of these other things. So your followers come with you and you don't have to start over ever again when you're building on a decentralized social network like that. Um, I don't know if you guys, like what opportunities do you see thinking, let's say five years in the future? I know we're talking about, I think there'll be like a billion users and et cetera. Like what, are, what, what excites you thinking about the future? I think there's a couple of like, uh, technical improvements that I, you know, just being more on the engineering side of things as an infrastructure company have been excited about, which is um, a forecaster kind of changes the web from just an open web to an open and signed web, where every action you do is signed with your, like, private key ED25519 signer, and you can now prove things about user actions that couldn't be proved before. And this is going to be increasingly important in the world of like AI generated content where you can like now put reputation behind a signature and then you know the signature is from a human that says, hey, I signed it. Um, and also increasingly important against like AI bots where now you know what is a bot versus not because which signer signed what. And that I think is going to take us into a different shape of the web and we'll be better prepared for the next set of changes that we are seeing generally in the tech world. Um, I'll go from the base perspective. Definitely Jesse's favorite tagline is uh, on chain is the next online <laughs> and very much so if we're signing everything with private key or even web two now is moving to fast keys, right? I think like Target and PlayStation and all of them have fast key sign ins now, which is much closer to the crypto world. Um, so I'm looking forward to having truly on chain interactions where we can pass value back and forth rather than trust all of these intermediaries and brokers that we deal with today. And I'm excited actually to just like build uh, on both on top the forecaster protocol, but also like getting more engagement of like the community builders like Ted and David uh, proposing FIPs and everything like that. I know David, you especially have been quite uh, active in that, right? You proposed the, the channels and uh, also most recently the mod protocol. If you if you don't mind, like I have a question for you. Uh, about that, like uh, uh, you said that uh, they uh, declined your mod protocol offer, FIP offer, <laughs> and then built frames instead. How did you feel and like how did the I love the stirring of the go? pot. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, okay. Um, how do I answer this? Um, so, Honestly. Yeah, so I was building a client until mid last year and um, I realized that one of the constraints was if you wanted to innovate on the content format, if you want to do video, if you want to do games, you want to do polls, you actually need these things to work in all the clients. And there was no good way to do that. And so I was experimenting individually, but I decided to pivot and start working on mod protocol. And so I was building mod protocol, building open source software for Firecaster, and had it integrated in a bunch of clients. And um, and it came time for like a big launch and we were like, okay, like we're gonna like pitch Warpcast, like hey, you guys gonna come on board with us for this? And, um, and then we also wrote a improvement proposal around how we envisioned extending open graph with, with rich metadata and how clients would use that. Um, I, did, I did get a bit of a, more of a notice on frames than everyone else, um, <laughs> but yeah, frames was, was similar and it solved the same problem it, it was better in some ways. Um, and we sort of realized that frames was an opportunity for us to sort of realize the vision we'd, we'd been trying to do. And so we just jumped on board and, and sort of Warpcast helped with distribution a lot more than, than we would be able to. So in many ways, it's, it's great for the ecosystem and great for us as well. Mm -hmm. And I will shout out David Diab. He is definitely pushing the boundaries and pushing for FIPs and proposals to think about how do we get make it better for users and for developers. And I think just as we wrap here, it's like a, a good testament to the community and to the ecosystem and to the protocol is that feedback and dissent 
and criticism is encouraged and actually sought out um, because at the end of the day, everybody's looking to make it better. And for us to realize this vision of having, you know, multi-billion users using the protocol, uh, you kind of need to listen to the people using it today as well. So anyways, just to wrap, I would say, um, yeah, just like give a closing word, one thing that you want everyone to know about Warpcast or what you're building, and then we'll sign off. Louder. <laughs> I think I think your mic cut out. Do you want to go here? <laughs> I was saying I think it's the consumer. Like, that was good. Like, we're going to a break. We could, like, listen to you for another half an hour for sure. This mic works. This mic works. So, All right, it works. So, hold on. Have your say. This is your moment. I was saying, I think Farcaster is slated to be the consumer crypto protocol. And we are here. We have been talking about consumer crypto. And I think there's something to be built on top of this protocol. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> uh, frames are going internet wide. And I'm trying to help make that happen through open frames. Um, so if you are another ecosystem excited by frames, uh, yeah, love to chat. Yep, go find him. Fantastic. Uh, so we're now going to go to a 30-minute break. Great panel again. Seriously, thank you. Um, so 30-minute break. We start again at 3.30 sharp. Enjoy. See you in 30.
Welcome back, everyone. How many people here are gamers? Like, played a game. I see some hands going up. Engineers among us. How many of you game on Web3? Playing any on-chain games? A few of you? Uh, it's, yes, yeah, fascinating stuff. But here, we're going to have a panel with Miko, who's going to introduce his panel, talking about the ins and outs and the latest and important things about Web3 gaming. Welcome, Miko and panel. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're here for the Web3 Gaming panel. We're very excited to be with you today. We have 20 minutes. We're going to really keep the thing moving. But what I did want to say is Web3 Gaming, what's the difference between Web3 Gaming and Web2 Gaming? So my personal definition is in Web2 Gaming, the games own the players. And in Web3 Gaming, the players own the game. So I think that's my little distinction that I wanted to make. So I wanted to relate really quickly and then go into round robin. But I think let's do the round robin first, which is let's do self-introduction. My name is Miko. I am an investor with Gumi Crypto's Capital. Gumi is actually a game company in Japan. My, my partner took it public. And we basically have invested in Seed Stage, Open Sea, Seed Stage, Yield Guild games, and a whole bunch of other ones. So we're definitely excited to be here. So that's my self-introduction. So let's just go uh, from left to right. All right. Uh, my name is Dee. I'm on the uh, Mist and Labs partnerships team. Uh, we're the builders behind the Sweet Network. Um, I came from a Web2 background, started at Apple, then ByteDance, um, then Facebook Gaming, entered Web2 entered Web3 in like 2022. Um, but yeah, super excited for the panel. Hey guys, um, I'm Kara. I'm a partner on the crypto investment team at A16Z. Um, I spend most of my time looking at the intersection between crypto and different kinds of games, but I also cover other media forms, including film, music, and IP, as well as anything to do with NFTs. Um, I have a background in math, computer science, and economics, and I spent some time as a software engineer and then as a product manager in and around the game space before joining the firm. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Powell. I'm the head of product marketing at Immutable. Immutable is a Web3 gaming platform that makes it easy for game studios to integrate digital asset ownership into their games. Great. So what I wanted to do is start with a Twitter conversation that I had with Hayden from Uniswap, which is he posted that, hey, when you add money to games, that means the games turn into either work or gambling, right? So his, it was a very downer type of tweet post, right? And part of what I was saying is really my retort was that actually really good games kind of start looking a little bit like work, right? That people in games, they grind, like they perform work-like functions, but that a lot of the dis distinction is, is that games have rules and they're more fair than work, and work may be a little less fair, and that may be why people want the escape of games, right? So I guess, to me, what I'd love to open to the panel, and I, I don't really do round-robin questions. I really want the panel to be reasonably assertive and jump in, but I'd love to kind of just open with a question about what happens when you throw money into games, and could it possibly be more fun? And if so, how? Or if not, then you could just be like, no, I don't think so. Money's bad. Kara? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, something that I hear a lot of our games founders talk about is like what makes a fun game. And universally, I hear three things. One is there have to be stakes. You have to care about the game world. You have to care about the context that these assets live in. The second thing I hear is there needs to be chaos. Human beings tend toward order. As a game maker, you want to sculpt agency and you want to sculpt chaos. And the last thing I hear is affinity. Obviously, in crypto, you get a little bit of a hyperdrive on all three of these fronts. If you do it really well, you can increase the stakes, you can increase the chaos, and you can increase the level of affinity people feel for these environments. But it takes like a really fine-tuned, excellent game designer or a lot of experiments being run in order to find that balance. So I think. It's, it's not a normative thing. I think that 
this technology has the potential to like really dial up the, the volume on the three things that are like really important for making great games. Um, I don't think like blockchains make things normatively good or bad either way. I just think that when you add ownership into the equation, people can get a lot more invested. Like modders, builders, user-generated content can get a lot more serious, and people will invest a lot more time into creating high-quality work because they know that they're not going to get rugged by the platform. I, I agree. I think Web3 technology is really serves as this validation to you know, the things that you have already been doing. You're grinding, uh, you're playing you know, thousands of hours of Animal Crossing, and in Chinese, we, we use the word, you're using your liver to play the game. Uh, you're already doing all of that. You're be building communities around the game, and um, at the end of the day, Web3 technology really powers real fun games to bring them closer to their community, to give a, set, a sense of validation, a sense of strong ownership to those people who are enjoying um, the, the games. And in return, they will see higher re retention or lower cost when, when it comes to retention, as well as lower churn rates, so on and so forth. So I want to I wanna provide a retort, right? Because the retort that I think is pretty valid that I've heard, actually, is that Blockchain is beautiful and wonderful by scaling, essentially solving trust problems, right? So in a sense, the issue that uh, I think is fair to say is that players tend to trust games and game engines, right? So there's very few cases where players actually have a real grinding, horrific problem that they got rug pulled by the game. You know, so oftentimes players are reasonably satisfied with Web2 game ownership, right? That I own something, right? So I think that in a way, that's a legitimate concern. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, if anyone has anything to add to that. Yeah, yeah, I think, and this touches on your first question as well, right? But when we're transitioning the gaming industry from really a one-sided marketplace where users are paying five dollars for a skin or an item, right, into an actual thriving economy, I guess that could be defined as work. But it's that mindset shift from being a player to being an owner. Right? And now there's economic value there. And not only that, but you're actually more engaged as a community member. You're more passionate. You have skin in the game, pun intended. Um, and that's ultimately going to make a more passionate community of players who are willing to spend more in your game. So there's an incentive from the game studio side. And then there's also economic incentive from the player side, which creates that thriving economy. And I would actually push back. I think there are lots of cases in which gamers feel disenfranchised. It tends to manifest as gamer rage on forums, right? When people are really angry at Diablo for ruining their auction house, when people are really angry at RuneScape for obliterating all their gold when they're using it as currency in replacement for a lot of the hyperinflationary currencies in, you know, in 2008 Argentina, right? I think like it's a privileged position to say that gamers trust the game. It's, it's very specific pockets of gamers who trust the game. There are plenty of enraged gamers who, who would probably go for a more credibly neutral platform if it were available, um, and certainly modders who create their own servers. Like, they're not seeing any of the fruits of their labors. Um, and I think there's like a great quote from my partner Chris's book, which is, developers know better than to build businesses on quicksand. And I think part of the reason why you, know, you don't see this kind of flourishing creativity is because people know that they can get rugged. Yes, and I do think that that does allow me to shout out a little bit of the project of Farcaster, right? Because Chris was talking about Farcaster in that context, which is you build on social media like Twitter and you get rugged, right? Whereas if you build on Farcaster, you're actually safe, right? So that's an amazing difference, and we'll see a lot of juice there. Uh, to throw the ball back to you again, though, like one of the things we were talking about is work, right? Which is, is it work, right? Our games work, and like, Games kind of are work, and it's fine, right? If, for example, like uh, CCP Games, the creator of EVE Online, right? If you're managing a guild, fleet, planet, or whatever, right? You're actually a very high-level manager, right? You're actually billions of dollars of in-game currencies of whatever credits, right? But like, to me, Hilmar said something very interesting, which is he said something that aligns with what Herman Narula said in uh, Virtual Societies, which is what he said is basically that, um, in in essence, like games and work kind of flow together, right? And Hilmar said something very interesting, which is he said that my job is to make games that are more compelling than real life. And I think EVE Online does that for some players. So I just want to like, ask you kind of how, how you look at CCP games 
uh, EVE Online and the work they're doing? Yeah, so um, for those who don't have context, CCP Games is the maker of the legendary game EVE Online, which was one of the very first MMOs ever. It has been a persistent game, so it's existed since its origination in, I think, 2003. And over the last 20 plus years, people have been building billions of objects in this game because it feels like a real economy. Um, within that game, there are corporations, which are the sort of guild equivalent. There are lots and lots of different roles that corporations can make for lots of different kinds of players. When we, we, when we went to FanFest in Iceland a couple years ago, I met this dude, Oz, who is running a multi-million dollar hedge fund in EVE. There's no trust guarantees. People just send him money and he manages it with the, like, the hope that they get it back. Um, and you can imagine, like, if that's fun for somebody in the context of this game, if you offered guarantees, if you offered escrow, if you offered any sort of belief that, that he was going to return your money, this kind of thing could become a real job. And it would be just as enjoyable for him in that universe as it is for him right now. I think, like, games are simulation engines. They're simulations of how people interact with each other, of governance, of human behavior. And stuff that starts out looking like a toy, Chris also says this, I'm just going to steal all of his lines, end up becoming some of the most important advancements in internet technologies. I think a great example is sort of GPUs. GPUs were originally just for gamers, and now it's sort of the back of all of scientific computing. And I think there's probably a lot of opportunity in crypto, too, for these kinds of simulation games to tell us a lot about monetary policy and governance and like human agent interaction. Yeah, I definitely think that it's an exciting frontier. One of the big questions that I have, especially since we have two kind of platform providers, right? Uh, you know, uh, Immutable and Mistin Labs represented on stage. Like, I'd love to kind of hear from platform providers, uh, you know, D, maybe you can go first, to really talk about like the games that you're the most excited about that have come to your platform and really try to explain like what is it that you're excited about with respect to these games? Yeah, uh, D first. Um, I think the games coming that, that are most exciting to us are really, at the end of the day, it's really good games that are, that are attractive to players. Looking for example. Um, so for example, we have one uh, studio called Ember Studio. Um, they're planning to launch uh, the game called E4C Final Salvation. Um, the game will be launching in H1 this year, and uh, I think the, the, what the company has been focusing really um, on this, uh, like right now, is really to fine tune their their in-game uh, kind of ac activity. Is really how do I uh, continuously engage with these players who are very interested in PvP, um, PVE, those type of aspect. And then on top of that, think about what's the right balance should I think about when it comes to tokenizing my in-game assets and leverage the the technology Web3, like for for example, the Sui Network provides um, to help them enable those asset ownership with their community and bring them and the community closer to each other. How about uh, Immutable? Uh, you know, what are you excited about in the pipeline? What are the yeah. games? What kind of genre? And tell, tell me what you think is going to work. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so um, at this point in time, Immutable has roughly 270 well-funded games that are building on our platform. And we believe 2024 is going to be an extremely exciting year for games going live. Um, and we have Shardbound, Metalcore, Blast Royale actually just hit 400,000 downloads and installs. Um, we have Treeverse, Capsule Heroes, uh, Guild of Guardians, uh, which actually we have over a million pre-reg users for that as well. So we have a whole slew of games that are set to go live over the next six months. So it's going to be a really exciting time. And those span different genres. And you know, we're still working on tweaking the different Sh product Shard flows. Shardbound is a tradable card game? Uh, correct, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know them. Uh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Excited for that one. Yeah, I think 2024 is going to be a really interesting year because the, the life cycle for game development is so long. And we have seen the wave of play to earn, so on and so forth, from the previous cycle. And this year is really going to be exciting where we're, we're going to see more and more games focusing on gameplay, focusing on true asset ownership. Yeah, so uh, in addition to having two platforms on stage, we also have two VCs on stage. And you know, one of the things that's interesting about kind of upcoming games that I just want to put a quick plug in is I'm really excited about actually a co-investment, which is Roboto Games. So we did Roboto Games, you know, with A16Z, and our excitement is, is that they're doing bite-sized survival and crafting uh, MMO, right? So this very kind of like 
uh, casual format and very, very short session times, but also the ability to kind of tap into the survival genre and the base building genre, I think is pretty exciting. So I think from a genre perspective, I'm excited about that. So I guess throw back to you, Kara, like what, what, what genres or what projects specifically are you most excited about? Um, I'm going to not be specific. I'm just going to reject that question. What I will say is I think we're at one of the most exciting periods in the life cycle of any new computing paradigm. Um, in the last year or so, builders have been really focused on infrastructure advancements. And I think it's happened, like computer has scaled much more quickly than anyone has expected on blockchains. Um, and while it's easy to look around and think, like, where are all the games, I think this is actually the leading indicator to the floodgates opening for lots more experimentation. Because it's, it's, it's not just about, like, do you have the throughput to process all of these actions on chain? In order to make things ergonomic for developers, you need to have way more extra compute. In order for React to have existed on top of JavaScript, machines had to have, like, way extra bandwidth. And I think the same is true of, like, on top of raw solidity, in order for lots of different hobbyist developers to start running experiments in building games, you need to have game engines. You need to have libraries. You need to have frameworks. You need to make it so easy for people to spin up something on the weekend and for college students to go to a hackathon and build a great game. And I think we're finally getting to that point, where it's not just that we have enough bandwidth to complete all of this logic on chain. We also have the bandwidth to make it easy for developers to run experiments. And I think that that's going to be the full force multiplier. I think that's a lot more high leverage than just like, you know, can we process that many transactions? It's like, can we exponentiate the number of experiments that we're running? And I think that's what's going to be so crazy about this cycle is like, we don't know what genre is going to work. It's probably out there somewhere. But if we have a million developers running those experiments, we're more likely to find it than if we've got 10,000 developers. And I do want to put a plug in there, which is that the idea of stimulating a developer ecosystem is definitely not unfamiliar to our platform partners here on stage, right? Which is that you can have a tokenized ecosystem fund. You can boost these developers, right? But the thing that I think Kara is saying that I'm super excited about is if you can increase the number of developers by increasing the tool chain and the ease of development, right? The thing that I think is so interesting about that is that the boundary between between UGC, user-generated content, and developer-generated content gets very thin, especially as you see things like generative AI boosting things like 3D modeling or creating much more ability to kind of create assets and objects that could be manifest as NFT, right? So I, I think that we are about to see kind of a laundry spin cycle around creativity in this space. And so I do think a thousand flowers can bloom. I think that's the natural evolution of games. And this is true of like every majorly centralized gate kept industry, right? Like film industry people did not take YouTube seriously. They did not see that as threatening. Like, you know, classic Hollywood entertainment did not take influencers seriously. But what these platforms allowed individuals to do was you can become your own filmmaker on YouTube. You can become your own influencer on Instagram. And people will become their own game makers on Crypto Rails. Yeah, I'll let the platforms have the final say. I think we're really at the time. So uh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Kara is, is exactly correct, right? That's kind of the sequencing of operations where the tooling, the APIs, the SDKs have to be there to make it accessible for devs who are already building in Unity, in Unreal. Then the content comes, right? And we're just kind of at that floodgate moment where there's going to be a bunch of great, compelling, engaging content going live. And then the users will come, right? So we talk about onboarding the masses. It's going to come from compelling content. It's not going to come from financial speculation or new technology for the sake of new tech. It will become because people actually want to play these games. D, final word. That is true. I think also one thing to mention is that uh, when we talk about Web3 gaming, we kind of unnecessarily put us, put ourselves into a, into a niche. At the end of the day, it's really having the powerful tools that makes it very simple for developers to build their game, leveraging the Web3 technology through simple clicks in an SDK, in a backend, um, so that they can get to market more easily. They can, they can visual, visualize and envision their, um, like the, the way that they want to engage with their community in a, new, in a new way, in a more intimate way, much, much more easy. Definitely makes a ton of sense. Uh, what I do want to say is just a quick response to the idea that it isn't about the money. But the thing that's really interesting is that I also believe that crypto can reinvent the game industry, right? And that the thing that I think happens when we have a blow-off top in something like Ether, right, is that 
ultra, ultra super whales in Ether become game producers, right? And they basically roll into town and they bankroll all these Web3 games. So the tail, actually, things like Bitcoin price can wag the dog of gaming and can transform the entire game industry. So, you know, it's a little bit of a counterpoint to your perspective, which is it's not about the money, but the money actually is part of it. It's part, the industry needs a, a reinvention and we are going to reinvent the industry of gaming. Thank you guys, that was great. Important stuff, I can't wait to play my next set of games I'm on the chain. So uh, we're gonna take a five minute break while we get set up for our next speakers who will need very little introduction. Uh, so stay tuned, uh, Chris Dixon and uh, Mac will be here shortly.
All right, the moment has arrived we've been waiting for. We're gonna have Chris Dixon from uh, A16Z Crypto and author of the new book, Read, Write, Own, talking about the next chapter of the open internet with Mackenzie Segalos from CNBC. Uh, really excited for this, can't wait. Hey guys. Chris, welcome to ETH Denver. Hello, it's great to be here. Uh, I think he's on the ground for five hours, flew in and out to be a part <laughs> of the ETH Denver community. Um, I wanna get right into one question that I keep coming back to, and that's whether VCs have been bad for crypto. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we're coming out of a real low for VC funding of crypto projects, but during the last bull cycle, I feel like VCs contributed to a lot of froth. Now, do you think that that froth was a good thing or this time around, are you thinking differently about the strategy when it yeah. comes to investing in the space? Can you all hear me? Yeah, I guess that's loud, okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like my, my view of it is, I mean, like I'm obviously very biased. I work in venture capital. I used to be an entrepreneur and I raise venture capital. And my view is that like there's, yes, there, a lot of, first of all, a lot of people get lumped in as VCs who do different things. Um, we, you know, we've been in the space for 10 years. We've been very consistently investing. We invested, you know, uh, through every winter. We've supported our companies through that. So I, I would argue, like I'm biased, I, I get that, but I would argue that sort of VCs who have actual conviction in blockchain and crypto play in a, can play an important role. Um, that said, there's, like anything, there's all sorts of different people. There's people that trade more, that, um, like our approach is, our funds are 10 years long. Um, and we invest generally pretty early and we have a very long holding period and we try to do a lot to help the projects that we're involved with. Um, and I think there's a bunch of other VCs who do that and I think those are the good ones and they're helpful, but there's also you know, a whole wide range of, of different types of behavior. So yeah, Bitcoin and Ether are way up, but do you even care? Like I, I'm thinking about the last few days and every single conversation I've had on the ground here has been about uh, Denkun and uh, like an imminent upgrade to the Ethereum blockchain. It's been about excitement in the builder space. Nobody has talked about spot Ether ETF. Yeah. So is that, does that factor in the way that you think about investments or your optimism yeah. around crypto? I mean, I think, so first of all, I think it's awesome. This kind of like ETH Denver and generally the Ethereum community is an awesome community and especially because it's so focused on real software and building and um, and I think that's, a, that's to me the most important thing. Like having been in technology for a long time, what really matters is that, is building applications, building infrastructure. Like this is how we, you know, I think what we all wanna do is make this movement go mainstream. Like my, not prices, but my kind of North Star is how do we get an application to 100 million users, to a billion users? I think that's how most people here think. Um, that said, like I go to DC a lot, obviously there's all these like regulatory questions that we're all dealing with. And I think the, you know, for us who've been in the space a long time, we see this as like, this is like probably the fourth cycle or something if you've been in Bitcoin and things like I have for 10 plus years. A lot of people outside, like in DC and Hollywood, to them, like crypto started in 2021. Like I, I'll just tell you this because I talked to them. Like they'd heard of Bitcoin and things, but like the real thing started in 2021 with like NFTs and and uh, and just all the kind of you know this talk in 21 and 22. And then you know FTX happened, Luna happened, and interest rates went up, and the narrative became crypto's over. Like it was this thing that popped up and then it ended. And that, is, that has had an effect on the policymakers because a lot of them, you, they literally will say, this is this thing that happened during COVID with low interest rates and now it's gonna go away. And we say to them, no, it's not gonna go away. Like instead you, you have to like think about this and grapple with it and like come up with smart policy that maximizes the good and minimizes the bad. So I do think in the sense that it kind of reminds people this is not going away and that it's a real thing and that there's, I think what people underestimate is like there's you, all of you and me and I think probably a few million people who are like true believers who believe in this movement, who believe in you know building digital services that are owned by communities that, that honor user ownership and creator ownership and all these other things. And I think a lot of people who aren't, don't come here and don't see this, by the way, I think it's awesome that you're here because I think most media doesn't cover these things and they just talk about the prices. But I think for those people that don't see this, they don't understand that this is a real tech movement, right? And, and so it's important to remind people like it's a real tech movement and it's not going away. And 
we're not focused on prices, but that prices do have that effect and it does, does remind people of that. So you just wrote a book. It's called yeah. Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet. Yeah. And he's doing a book signing after this. I'm giving him a plug right now if you want to go uh, talk to him afterwards. Uh, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a very good introduction of a complex idea, sort of a history of the internet and looking at how Web3 is a solid alternative to big tech. Before we dig into it, why write a book? Like, why not, you know, it's, it seems yeah. like kind of buttoned up, a corporate thing to do. Um, are, why that in terms of something more my, decentralized? Like, my friends, like, were like, why don't you, first of all, why don't you self-publish? Why don't you just do blog posts? It's, like, old-fashioned to write a book. Um, I, I thought... You know, like the, we, we've been doing podcasts and blog posts for years. The reality is, there's a lot of people, including policymakers and just other folks, who who want a book. Like a book is an API to a certain segment of the world. It's kind of how I think about it. Like, and literally, like I'd go to all these meetings and they'd say, like, what book should I read? And I was like, I mean, there's some great books on like Bitcoin and Coinbase history and stuff like this, but I didn't think there was like a book that kind of frankly described the vision here. I think Ethereum is the most aligned vision to my book. Um, and so I really felt like no one had written the book like that, that kind of contextualized all of this in the history of the internet. And really, I, I, it took me forever to write the book. I, I don't know if it's worth it to write a book, but I did it. So, but the, the work I did, a lot of the work I did was to make it really just accessible. Um, and, and so, for example, like, you know, instead of saying, like, I don't use the word decentralized very much because that's kind of a technical word, slightly technical word. Instead, I really try to explain through examples that non-technical people can understand like why that matters. So like decentralization really means decentralization of software production, which is like composability. It's the decentralization of economics, which is take rates. And so anyway, so like each chapter kind of goes through like why does this matter to you? So what I'm hoping is, and I feel like it's happening, is that hopefully all of you folks like it. Obviously you'll know parts of the book already, maybe some of section, I wrote it with chunks so you can jump around. And probably everyone here knows the blockchain section. I hope the history might be interesting to you. I hope some of the later sections might be. But really I wrote it so that you would have a book to give to your family and friends when they say, isn't crypto that thing that's like, you know, scammers and whatever. And like, no, it's actually this whole other side of it. Here's this book. That's what I'm hoping it becomes, is like a book that you can hand to somebody and, they, and explain to them. And they, they don't have to come away like, oh my God, I'm gonna quit my job and do this and devote my life to it, but at least they can understand that there's another side to the story, right? Because like that, I didn't feel like that was getting told. Like yeah, that. and you make this analogy of crypto as the casino and how that kind of obscures some of the larger yeah. use cases, but isn't that part of what has helped the industry scale a little bit, this like get rich quick scheme, this, this, this idea that you could be a part of something big, you could make it, um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think, it's a good question. I think it's a question of emphasis. So like the way I think of it is like, like ownership is a key aspect to, to, you know, that's what tokens enable ownership. And whether an NFT enables ownership of a digital object, a fungible token enables ownership of something more money-like. Um, I would sort of analogize it to like the housing market where in the housing market, you know, you, you have people that flip houses and you have um, mark, you know, people that trade and things like this, but the, but why do we want home ownership as a society? We want home ownership society not for that reason. We want it because it it's important psychologically. You can raise a family in your home. It's important to align incentives. Like it's it's well documented that people that own homes contribute more to their home and their community. So like my my argument, and then as a side effect of that, right, we have trading and speculation, and that does play a role, right? It, it's the reason you can go get a Zestimate on Zillow is because there's a liquid market. Like I'm not anti liquid markets. Like, the United States is generally, like, the regulatory framework in the United States is generally supported regulated markets and speculation and other things. Like, it's, it, it ha does serve a purpose in providing liquidity and price discovery. But I, my argument is just that the, that's been all of the emphasis from kind of a media point of view, and that shouldn't be, that should be the side effect, right? The core thing should be about ownership, enabling, empowering users, empowering developers, empowering creators through a new architecture of digital services, right, that, 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 shifts ownership to the edges of the network. You know, Web3 folks have been accused of being super hand wavy and, and not very specific in terms of what uh, Web3 is actually accomplishing right yeah. now. Jack Dorsey, Elon Musk, two big critics of, of Web3. Yeah. And I know that that was one of the things that you were looking to combat in your book. And I and you have these like actionable takeaways, you know, real world examples of, of things that are really working right now. Yeah. And you have so many developers and builders in the audience. I think they'd be keen to kind of hear what you think is, is tech that's working but also needs to be scaled yeah, so, sorry. Um, so, uh, I mean, look, these, my, my view, like I've been on the, working on the internet for almost 25 years now. I started, really started my career in earnest during the internet downturn, which 
you know, it's easy now to sort of dismiss that as like, oh, it was obvious the internet was going to be a big thing. It was not obvious. It was very much of a downturn. Um, the, these things just take, in my experience, these things take a long time. So AI, you know, the first neural network paper was 1943. Um, I actually personally started an AI company in 2008. I thought that machine learning was going to happen then. I was 15 years too early. Um, smartphones go back to the, you know, 80s and 90s. Uh, internet goes back, you know, go look up CompuServe and Prodigy. These were big internet, sort of internet services in the 80s. Internet goes back to the 60s. Um, so these things take time. Um, I think we were really set back by some of the stuff that, like, the FTX stuff and everything else. I think that on the positive side, like, the folks here know, like, I think there's a lot of really good stuff going on on the infrastructure side, which just, frankly, wasn't quite there yet. You know, you need low gas fees and great UX and, you know, embedded wallets, 4A, 4A44, uh, you know, like all these kinds of things are important. Um, and then you need applications, and there's a whole bunch of people, I'm sure many here, who are building a whole wave of new exciting applications. And look, I think also some of these things have been, like, like the death of NFTs has been exaggerated. There were, I think, 8.6 billion in sales last year of NFTs after the downturn. Stable coins have become, I think, I think are kind of sneaking up on people. I think it was 600 billion last month in stable coin transactions. Um, and then there's a whole wave of emerging applications, you know, people here, some of you might be on Farcaster. I, I was talking to some of you earlier probably. It's a new social network built on Ethereum. Um, there's a whole bunch of games and other kind of exciting things. So, it, it, look, I'm, in my ideal world it would have been faster, but I also think that, like, just because something's taking longer doesn't mean it won't happen. Yeah, I, I think that stable coins are especially interesting in emerging, certain um, emerging markets where the bank rate is so off of the yeah. black market. It, it's just uh, helping to fuel a shadow economy that's absolutely vital to survival. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's harder to see in the U.S. because we have a very, you know, we have obviously we have easy access to the dollar and good payment systems. But I think around the world it's much more, it solves much more of a problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one critique of A16Z that I've seen lately are, uh, relate to some comments that you made to the New York Times that your projects aren't allowed to sell tokens publicly. You know, some say that, well, you've got Axie Infinity, that's an exception with a token that they issue. Any response to that or th that narrative? Well, I think the comment I made was that they were talking about ICOs, I believe. I, I did a lot of podcasts. So I don't remember everything I said. But um, the ICOs, which were, you know, in the 2017-18 era when people were kind of launching and selling tokens directly to the market, and the SEC came out with uh, guidance that guided against that, and that basically ended. And so, like, we haven't been involved. Like, the, the norm now for projects, I mean, you can debate whether this is good or bad from a societal point of view, but, like, the norm is to raise money from, from exempted in or institutions like VCs, and then, and then later on to airdrop, tokens to um, regular users, but not to sell them directly. Um, and that's been, like, that, that's how every, I, I, I think, I, I should, I, I made a call. No, I think every project we've been involved with has done that. So um, anyway, so, so I, think that, I think it's just a misunderstanding. Like, that did happen with projects in 2017 and 18, but the SEC guided against it, and people since then have raised money from institutions and then, then airdrop. So people can still get tokens, but they get them for free for doing work, for contributing to the network, as opposed to buying them, which I think is just also a much better way to have a happy community, too. Uh, you told Kara Swisher that 94% of your portfolio is locked up, meaning mm -hmm. you haven't sold the tokens associated with your portfolio companies. It's not locked up, but we haven't sold it. Yeah. Haven't sold it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, how, it must have been a rough couple of years. <laughs> but, I, but what's your thinking, though, about like, because I, I know it's a part of the term sheets. You have certain lockup windows, and that's not required by um, any sort of larger regulator. So what's, what's your philosophy behind that? I mean, this is just based on, like... So this, this is just this is not new to crypto. Just I think people may not realize this about venture capital in general, which is like this is if you go look at all of our funds, like I have the data for all of A16Z funds, like all the way it works is you have this J curve, right? So you invest and then the fund value of the fund drops almost invariably. This and I've seen a lot of data from a lot of venture firms. It's that's why it's called a J curve because it drops and then it goes up. And just basically universally, it, it, you, the biggest mistake a VC can make is to, when things start to work, sell them too early, right? All of the value in venture capital that's ever been created in the history of venture capital has been basically years six through 12 in the portfolio, right? And so you, you, can, you can just, and every LP will tell you this, all the data analysis, every, you know, so it's just kind of 
widely understood in the venture world. And, and you do, yes, you do, it does go down. And, and if it's a little harrowing at times, because you know, like you can tell yourself, hey, it's a J curve, but like stuff goes down. But like, so it's not, this is not some like altruistic theory. This is just kind of standard venture capital, which is like it, these projects take a long time to build. And you know, when they work, sometimes, you know, many won't, won't work, but occasionally they'll work. And when they work really well, they just kind of start compounding. Yeah, um, I mean, so you wouldn't want to sell them. Yeah, I do feel like it's in contrast to like this other narrative that's out there. Like that, some people just think that you know you've got VCs that'll invest in projects and they get uh, they kind of exit the token when it's at peak value and then retail is kind of plowed in money and you yeah. know it's it, it's a, a troubling dynamic that some people point to um, just generally of the VC world, uh, which seems well, to be in contrast. I mean, to the thing is, there's a lot of different stuff that goes on out there. I mean, I think that there needs to be. I don't know if this will be controversial here or not. I don't know, but like. Our, our view is there needs to be poly regulatory kind of frameworks around this, yeah. including things like lockups and disclosures and other things. There needs to be a path, and we've said this for year, for many years, five, six years, long before like kind of the scandals and things. Very importantly, we believe there needs to be a path for you to create a project, and for you know every project by definition starts off centralized. So did Bitcoin was you know go read the Satoshi emails. That was one person building a project. Over time, these projects, if they're built properly, become decentralized, and that changes the regulatory classification. There needs to be, we, I, we believe, a path to get there, a very clear path, because everyone wants to be, everyone here, I'm sure, wants to be compliant, right? But that path can include things, and should, I think, should include things like lockups, disclosures, you know, required security audits. Like, there, there should, you know, there should be things in there. Um, and, and that would have the be other benefit, I think, for the regulators is that then they would have very clear black and white rules. And if someone's over the line, you can go after them. And if they're, but every entrepreneur we work with is dying for this because they just they want to all do the right thing. They just need to know what it is, right? And right now, it's it's the strategy of the policymakers to of some of them to deliberately make the line gray so that people don't know, right? So. I, you know, so so my my like we can't we're one firm in the market. We can't impose rules on the market. Like yeah. if we do that, people won't work with us. Like we can only ask for certain things. Um, it, some of this needs to come from the referees, so to speak, right? Like, in terms of uh, kind of shifting focus, in in terms of your investments, I feel like all the VC dollars have dried up for crypto in the last few years, and generative AI is like the new. Um, yeah. popular kid in the room. But I bring that up in the context of, I believe something like 25% of your investments are in the creator economy space. And, you know, it kind of is more important than ever to come up with new business models for creatives. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting strategy choice. Can you walk me through how, how your thinking has evolved in lockstep with the surge in popularity yeah. in AI? Yeah, I talk about this some in my book, I, in some of the, in the last third of the book. So the first third is like history, the, uh, the kind of history of the internet. Next third is kind of about blockchains and the benefits of blockchain-based services. And the last third are, are seven different application areas, uh, a couple, two, or, two or three of which are kind of social media and creator economy, that kind of thing. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's a really important area. Look, I mean, what's, what's about to happen, right, is the cost to create video, images, text is about to, if not already, drop to zero with generative AI. Um, and that will, that will create the need for new business models if you're a creative person. And so, like one example I talk about in the book, it's a really exciting idea, I think, is what, I, what some people call collaborative storytelling. And so this is the idea of a bunch of people getting together and collaboratively creating the next Harry Potter or Star Wars or universe, getting rewarded for their contribution with tokens, and then having an incentive to go out and evangelize and contribute and build out and fork. And so, you know, we have a few portfolio companies doing that. That's just one example. There's many great ideas. I'm sure people here are working on them, some of them, um, of, of like, what do you do? You know, have uh, musicians can sell digital collectibles to their audience. In a, you know, so in a world where content goes to zero, what you need are sort of complementary business model, other things that you can sell, right? Other ways to engage your audience and have a have a financial relationship with your audience, which I think is incredibly important because like, do we want an, in, like right now, if we don't have new business models, like if you look at the way things are headed right now, we've got five companies that control the internet essentially by all the data, I have stats in the book, and AI is probably going to increase that centralization because it rewards companies with, lot, with, with large stockpiles of data and capital and compute. Um, and, you know, and so what, you know, you look, it takes stack overflow. So the I used to be on the board of Stack Overflow. The, the Stack Overflow has this great programmer content. The AI systems went and, and 
used it in their training, and then they have Copilot, and now Stack Overflow's traffic is down 50%. Like, that's the canary in the coal mine. That's gonna happen throughout the internet, right? Every, all of these sites that were used for training data are now gonna become irrelevant because you can just go to one of these five big internet services and get a photo, get, a, get an image, get a movie, and you don't need to click through and go to those sites anymore. So my argument is we need new incentive systems, right? Like, we, do we want a world where there's five services, or do we want a world where there's a diverse ecosystem of creators and people building audiences? And, and that question comes down to incentives, right? It comes to, and crypto's very good at creating new incentives. So, like, what are, like, I think it should be, this should be a golden period where people are like, okay, we need to now go and rethink how the incentives on the internet work and make sure that we keep the internet open and diverse and kind of aligned with the original ideals of the internet. That's why I got involved in this, in the internet. The reason I, I used, I didn't, I probably wouldn't be in technology, I don't think, if it weren't for the 90s internet and the idea, this dream of an open decentralized network that anyone could build on was an inspiring vision and I would love to see it return to that. And I, and I think if we don't have new systems like blockchain based systems, we're at risk of having sort of an internet of like, you know, what's that movie, Wally? You know, he's like the five companies and you plug your brain into it and it's just like, dystopian and not, not, you know, not, not the internet that I want to see. Very, very last question, because we're over time. I, there are a lot of builders in this audience. Two things for you. What do you want to see them build, and how do they reach you directly to pitch you? <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm actually Chris at A16Z. It's super easy. So, um, and I, I generally, I'll respond in some way. If not directly, I'll, I'll introduce you to somebody. But, um, uh, uh, I, look, I think there's, I think this is the, this is the, my favorite, the reason I came here is I think there's so much great developer energy here and a lot of friends and a lot of projects we're involved with. And so I'm very excited about all the things that the Ethereum community is doing. And um, like, I would just love to see more, you know, more interesting products, games, social networks, things that aren't speculative. I think there's all these interesting other fe features of blockchain networks like composability, the fact that you can make, you can have developers all kind of coming, you're seeing some of that with like frames on Farcaster, but like there's a whole interesting product space that I don't think has been fully explored. There's the tokens and meme coins, people have explored that. Like let's go explore all the other things. Like I would love to see, and I'm not saying that, again, the tokens are part of this and I have chapters in the book on it, but there's a whole nother world out there of non-speculative use cases that I think a lot of people here are working on and I would love to see more, more development there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to everyone who joined us and to the ETH Denver yeah. Festival for having us. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mackenzie and Chris. Uh, so uh, next up in just a couple minutes, we're going to have uh, John Deaton. He is running for Senate against uh, Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts. He is going to tell us why. So without further ado, please welcome John Deaton. Thank you, thank you. So I'm John Deaton and I am running for U.S. Senate against Elizabeth Warren. Now, now, <laughs> now some of you know me from uh, me suing the SEC because of gross government overreach. 75,000 token holders came together with me and we beat the SEC. Now, people ask me why am I running? Let me tell you, I'm from a place called Highland Park, Detroit, one of the most violent neighborhoods in America for the last 40 years. A single mother on welfare and food stamps who struggled to put food on the table. And I'm telling you, I listened to my mother cry at night on the nights that she couldn't put food on the table. And I experienced that kind of pain and I experienced that kind of shame that she had. So when you look at me, I vowed to break that cycle of poverty and I worked very hard and I did it. So when you see me, you're looking at the living embodiment of the American dream and I see it dying before me. Now my foray into crypto is very personal to me. My mother on welfare, we didn't have basically direct deposit. She got a hard check. And the banks, as you know, put fees on you if you break the minimum deposit. She couldn't afford to keep $10 or whatever it was. So the predatory banks, of course, just add fees. So my mother at nine, 10 years old, I watched her go to the check cashing stores that you see in the hood. And I listened to my mother beg, beg them to take only half of the fee. 
when I was in college and I wanted to send my mother money home to help with my younger siblings, I had to go through Western Union. I had to go through MoneyGram, and they took 10, 12%. And so that was my first introduction to financial services in America. When I read the Bitcoin white paper in 2016, I thought of my mom, and I thought, wow, you can eliminate the predatory actions of the bank. You can eliminate the money grams and the Western unions. And it, to me, it became uplifting. I thought about capitalism and how freedom could be spread across the world. Now, my opponent has a bill that bans Bitcoin self-custody and crypto in the United States of America, okay? Now, I want you to ask yourself something. With illegal immigration, with the debt crisis, where half Americans don't have $500 set aside in case of an emergency, with the opioid crisis, with income inequality, why? Why is Elizabeth Warren running on an anti-crypto platform? And I'll give you the answer. 12 years ago, she said that she was going to Washington, D.C. to hold the bankers accountable. She was outraged that no banker went to prison from the 2008 financial crisis. Well, fast forward a decade, who just wrote her bill? Jamie Dimon and the Banking Institute wrote her anti-crypto bill. So, she is the epitome of Washington, D.C. You go to fight the bankers, you can't beat them, so you join them and you become their number one lobbyist. Listen, I know some of you think that she is entrenched Washington, D.C. elite and she can't be beat. She can be. I'm not the only one who believes that I can beat her. I put $500,000 of my own money to start this campaign because I know I can beat her. Now, I can't self-fund the entire thing, and I'm going to need some help. But you want to know who else believes I can beat her? Elizabeth Warren. Because since I announced, she has emailed five times. She's got senators from Connecticut saying, this guy, John Deaton, is a problem. Fox Business did a segment that was called, why is Elizabeth Warren so scared of this new guy, this unknown person? If I could fund it, I would. So my reason I'm here is I can't do it alone. And it's not my strength to ask for help. Trust me, it's probably my weakest part of being a candidate, but I have to get better at it. So I'm asking you to help me. If you go to John Deaton for Senate and make any donation you can, she won't outwork me, I promise you that. She'll outraise me, but if I'm competitive, I'm going to win this race. And if you go to John Deaton for Senate, you could donate regular, but I also accept crypto through Coinbase, Commerce, MetaMask, or whatever. So that's all I want to say. I know they're getting ready for RFK Jr., but thank you for having me, and I'll see you in D.C. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Thank you for being here. Thanks for bearing with us as we set up these wonderful security gates. We are going to take a quick break. We're going to come back here at 4.40 on the dot to hear a really cool talk from Ilya Polisukin of Near, And then at 5 on the dot, RFK Jr. is going to be in conversation with Caitlin Long about why he's running for president. So that is what is happening. Also, there is a book signing. Chris Dixon is doing a book signing. Over, see where that buffacorn is with the afro over on the wall? That's where he's doing the book signing if you want to go check that out. So that's what's happening in the next, you know, little bit. Uh, bear with us, and we are excited to close out another strong day of East Denver. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a bit. Thanks.
One more uh, final talk before uh, RFK for you. We're going to have uh, uh, Ilya Polisukin, uh, founder of Near and inventor of uh, Transformers, the technology behind uh, ChatGPT, Gemini, and all the AI stuff that's happening, talking about AI, uh, digital sovereignty in the age of AI. Welcome, Ilya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Uh, this is, I've been coming to East Denver since 2019. So it's been really exciting to see this event growing. So I'm really excited to be here. And uh, if you missed, uh, I've, before kind of my blockchain uh, journey, I actually was for about 10 years um, machine learning researcher and developer. I worked at Google Research and a team of us have developed a technology called Transformers. And for those who are not familiar, it is what powers most of the advancements right now in, uh, in AI. Now, Nier actually started as AI startup. We were teaching machines to code. We were trying to change how you interact with computing. And we had a challenge ourselves that as we were uh, interacting with different uh, participants to curate more data and do crowdsourcing, we needed to pay them. Uh, and they were everywhere in, in, around the world. And you would think that crypto is that global payment network that uh, can enable this. Back in 2018, it was not the case. And this is when we really focused on building out near protocol and a blockchain that can actually power um, global usage of cryptocurrency, as well as a lot of other use cases. Now, the vision we set out to do is really to build self-sovereignty. The way we define this is that we want all people to have control of their assets, data, and power of governance. And these are important uh, pieces to understand, right? We talk a lot about self-sovereignty uh, around kind of being able to control your own assets, but it spans beyond that. And it's especially important, you know, I grew up in Ukraine and, you know, kind of the failure of banks, the hyperinflation is something that I'm, I grew up with. Uh, I wouldn't trust you know, many banks in Ukraine with a lot of money, for sure. And uh, for, you know, we, I've seen kind of inflation of initially coupons and now Grivna as well uh, that continues to happen. But beyond that, it's also what we have now with data. Uh, and I'll talk about more of this. And so the, I think the important part, this is not just developing country problem. This is really a global problem that we have that we starting to lose our, our control over our lives. Uh, and kind of this is what the important part of power of governance is. So there are two major problems converging right now. There is one that is really about the incentives. And this is not a new problem. That to the kind of the beginning of Bitcoin was, you know, a global financial crisis was banks who leveraged and leveraged their position to really create new financial instruments without any transparency and then kind of to generate more profit and led to a financial crisis. Similarly, we have now with tech companies who are able to leverage their position, their access, their distribution to put high fees in App Store to really kind of uh, ha pretty much promote products and even manipulate the way you are perce perceiving products through advertisement. And these are, again, with the age of AI now accelerating. Because even before uh, you know, machine learning been used for a long time in advertisement, now you're able to have this advertisement being injected directly into the answer that you're asking ChatGPT or Gemini or any other chatbot, and you wouldn't even know if it was coming from a statistical model based on general data, or it has been affected by an ad auction and price and kind of sold for specifically you to you know, promote this product or this opinion or this idea. And this is extremely dangerous, and this is where we're starting to lose, in many ways, control of the reality, because the reality is now framed by you know, the media you consume, the uh, kind of products you're using. And if they are controlled by single parties that have kind of mo their motivations really driven by 
these incentives, you know, shareholder profits, they always will be continuously trying to increase that value extraction uh, and cha to change your opinion. Now, again, this is not a like uh, isolated problem. It affects everyone in the digital world. And this is just news from last week. This is like not even hard. It took two minutes to pull, you know. The, all kinds of ways that right now the current system is trying to uh, figure out how to deal with this, right? It's everything from, you know, OpenAI that was originally a nonprofit now making billions of dollars. You have people who are, you know, suing Google because it has such a manipulistic control over advertisements. You have, you know, approaches which are scaring people with Sora. So you have all of those things happening right now. And I would claim that companies don't do it on purpose, right? There's no like evil mastermind sitting there and, and saying like, hey, we really need to manipulate people. This is really the incentive problem. So the problem is that as a, you incentivize to create more revenue, you incentivize to figure out how to extract more value, and you will be continuously making these models to do that. Now, this is really combined with, you know, all the other world kind of challenges we have, right? And again, I'm from Ukraine. I see <laughs> a very uh, clear problems with dictators who are controlling countries, right? Being able to really change the world and perception of the population in such a way that they normalize the war and killing of people who are really their, you know, actually blood uh, relatives. And so we really need to actually address these challenges at a fundamental level. And I would say that regulators, the approaches that are top down that come in from boardrooms or from uh, kind of a small set of regulators trying to think how to improve the situation will not work for example the ai regulations right now the there is an executive order that came out of white house that makes no sense they are restricting innovation by saying that if you have more than some number of parameters, you're not able to do it unless you have like a team or, that will be ethically evaluating the models. They have not defined any of the criteria for what is ethical and what is you know, safe for the models. And what it means is they actually let, making the big, bigger companies being able to control that even more because they have the resources and funds to really set up these teams and market them as you know really important part of the process whereas startups and innovators are not able to whereas open source that is truly at the core of what we're doing is not able to do that and this is really kind of one of the most challenging thing and we see the same thing with regulations in crypto where like the regulators don't understand the fact that using crypto is the way to regulate this we have the opportunity to leverage this technology to actually self-regulate and provide transparency and visibility to everyone. And so we have this fork in the road, right? On one side, we have a black mirror state where we have few companies that really control the way people perceive reality, the way people buy products, the way people you know, consume content. Or we have a self-sovereign uh, route, which is really about each individual having the ability to do this, each community having their own right and way, and you have a choice. If you want to use, you know, centralized company, you have that choice, but you should be able to also switch to alternative. The alternative and startups should be able to innovate and create alternative products, not require, you know, ton of licenses to just start building a model in Python notebook. Like, that's, that's a level of regulations right now that's happening. And so, it's really important for us to AI proof our systems. AI is an extremely powerful tool. I'm really excited at what, you know, the progress we've seen and I'm excited to you know, contribute and, and see even more progress. But we also need to understand that this is, can be used to do all these bad things and we need our systems, which right now rely on paperwork, on unsecure connections, on you know, ability to look at the content and don't know where it came from, to really leverage cryptography, leverage blockchain, leverage all of the technologies we're building to AI proof it. It's about decentralized and transparent digital systems that will allow to have incentives to be transparent and clear to everyone. Instead of right now, you have opaque systems inside bigger companies and bigger banks. It's new collaboration structures that we can all come together to promote open source, to develop new tooling, to enable it to be used by everyone, and if you are making money off it, to contribute back in kind. 
And finally, it's about kind of scaling the markets and allowing anybody to participate in an open way uh, without boundaries, without you know, trying to prove your background or where you came from or what's you know, any other property, but really being able to participate. So we are kind of as near been always thinking about this. And for us, this all comes together as self-sovereign operating system. It's really something that as we kind of interact with computing, we need a different way of doing this. And now it builds up on traditional operating systems, Web2 operating systems. There's a huge component of private data and decentralized data. There's a huge component of user-owned AI, an ability for you as a user to have your AI that's on your side, being able to kind of shield and decide what content and how it should be summarized that you define. Similarly, you, can, you have user-owned AI that, is def that works for a community on behalf of community and powers that. You have trustless infrastructure, and you have experiences that are now more generated and less like by your own model and really provides to you uh, as a service. So the trustless infrastructure, this is something we're building here, right? We here at this Denver, a lot of us are building other infrastructure applications on top of it. And it's all about self-sovereignty, you know, that private key kind of cryptography that enables this. But now we need to push forward to enable communities to govern this, to enable to have a uh, really easy way to onboard new users. And this is one of the components why we've been focused on chain abstraction, on enabling really a way for anyone to onboard and use Web3 without thinking about the blockchain, gas fees, bridges, low-level infrastructure, ideally even wallets and uh, other pieces if you don't need to. And this is really how we bring the next wave of users. They're not going to come because of the uh, values per se, they're going to come because it's easy to use, it's new content, it's new opportunity, and they're able to do this. As near, we've been doing this uh, since mainnet, and we are proudly a home for top consumer applications. We have over 10 million monthly active users, most of whom don't know they're using blockchain. They use it through different applications like Kaiching and Sweatcoin, Play Ember and Hot Wallet to really interact with all of the Web3 without thinking about the kind of underlying details, gas fees, and other pieces of infrastructure that we all, you know, really working on. Now, the other piece is user-owned AI. I think this is extremely important because right now, the alternative is companies, centralized companies that fully control the model, that are able to provide you an answer really fast, potentially cheap, but you have no idea what you're getting into, right? You have no idea what decisions went in into training data, into how the systems prompts were affected, and how things actually uh, been processed when you see them, right? There's no way to ensure that the thing you're getting has not dropped a specific piece of content from the training data, which completely av potentially avoids a whole spectrum of thinking because of whatever political view or any other view that that company had. And remember, this company is a jurisdiction in a specific country, and they need to comply by those regulations. And so there always will be limitations on what these models can do. And so open source AI models are extremely important. Public data sets are extremely important. Figuring out how do we get models that run on your phone, that are owned by you, that are on your side and are not trying to manipulate you is extremely important. And this is where, even further, you can imagine community models that are uniting values of any specific community and providing way to kind of interact with the knowledge and experiences of this community. This is all important, and this is all need to work on. And so I'm inviting everyone here to think beyond just Web3, because we sometimes get really focused on the philosophy, on the kind of values we establish here. Or sometimes, as Chris uh, was talking before, we have you know, a casino, and it's, it's entertaining. There's a lot of fun. You, know, you can go DJ and the coins on, on exchange. But all of that is, serves a purpose. And it serves a purpose to create new economic opportunity, create new, really cool applications you cannot have in Web2, because it's new marketplaces, it's new opportunities that are global and enable new, like, new experiences for people. And so it's easy to get caught up in, in kind of our you know, market going up and everybody being excited about this. But I encourage everyone to think through, how do we get beyond this? How do we onboard 
new wave of users? What experiences can we build? As well as how do we bring and solve problems that exist in real world, right? Again, open source AI is something that is co being constantly squished right now because there's no incentives to actually build in open source. And you have so much more incentives building in, in uh, big companies. How do we leverage that? How do we leverage technology to bring self-sovereignty to everyone, make sure that intelligence as a tool is available to everyone at all times and is not controlled by single parties? How do we make sure that we have and continue having access to all the content and at the same time are not spammed by generated content that is fake and be able to discern and have a reputation around content. All of these pieces, we have the technology, we have now into the infrastructure, and so now it's really about building the applications. So I thank everyone. If you're interested to learn more about what I'm working on, follow me on Twitter, and uh, self-sovereignty is near. So I hope we can all work on this. Thank you, Ilya. That was great. Really important stuff. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go to a short break. And uh, then RFK Jr. will be here in just a little bit of time. Short break. Thank you.
to, 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 to. Two, two, check, check, one, two, 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 hey, 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 two, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, 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 hey, hey. What channel is this on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a day of affirmation, a celebration of liberty. This is a day of affirmation. We stand here in the name of a celebration freedom. of liberty. We stand. We are committed to peaceful and non-violent change. We must we recognize the full human equality of all of our people, not just to those of a particular religion, not just to those of a particular race, not just to the wealthy. Not just to those but to all of the people. Not just to the wealthy. We must do it for the single but and fundamental people. reason that it is the right thing to do. And fundamental reason that it is the right thing to do. A new twist this morning for the country's most famous political dynasty. Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the presidential race. On October 9th, in the state.
that it's time to heal a divided nation and return the power to the people. Robert Kennedy Jr. We are told today that our nation is hopelessly divided. But I found something different as I travel this country. I have witnessed an upwelling of optimism that I've never seen before. Something is stirring in us that says it doesn't have to be this way. And so I've come here today to declare our independence from the tyranny of corruption, which robs us of affordable lives, our belief in the future, and our respect for each other. But to do that, I must first declare my own independence. Independence from the Democratic Party. And from all other political parties. I haven't made this decision lightly. It's very painful for me to let go of the party of my uncles, my father, my grandfather, and both of my great-grandfathers. But my sacrifice is nothing compared to the risk our founding fathers took when they signed the Declaration of Independence 247 years ago. They knew that if their revolution failed, every last one of them would be hanged. They chose to place everything on the line. When John Adams put his pen down, after adding his signature to the Declaration, he turned to those present and he said to them, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, from this day on, I am with my country. I'm going to make that same pledge to you today so that I can stand before you, as every leader should stand before you, free of partisan allegiance, free from the backroom deals, a servant only to my conscience, to my creator, and to you. Every president enters office promising to unite the nation and to work with people from the other party across the aisle. None of them ever does it. They can't. They're already chosen aside. Well, I'm not going to have that problem. I'm going to build coalitions from both sides of the aisle. And except for the small minority of public officials who are actually corrupt, I'm going to tell you this secret. They, too, want liberation from the system that has captured them. And isn't that ultimately what we all want? Liberation from a system that robs us of our wealth, our health, our hope, our patriotism, our ideals, our freedoms, and ultimately our sense of ourselves as a good and capable people. Is healing our divided nation possible? Let's go take back our country. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. I declare my independence. I declare my independence. I declare my independence. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. I declare my independence. Yo declaro mi independencia. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. Few men are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence. It is the one essential, vital quality for those who seek to change the world. I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I approve this message.
you know, regulations on this, that, and the other. It's not working. And so we're here. Why? Because we biddle the decentralized future, which is supposedly the hope for this problem. So I'm going to welcome my friend, Caitlin Long, to the stage. So if, if y'all don't know Caitlin, if you don't know Caitlin, she's the only person to sue the Fed. Progress. We'll get there. In any case, um, you're about to have an um, amazing evening. There's literally no holds barred in questions. When we were discussing this, we want as much controversy and as much <laughs> truth as we can possibly muster. So with that, I'm going to hand the microphone to you, Caitlin, to introduce Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, John. Welcome, everybody. Let's rev up the crowd for Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Come on out, sir. Let's have a chat. All right. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Thank you. You've got quite a crowd here. All right, folks. Run of show is about 30 to 40 minutes of questions, of, of us chatting, and then we'll open it up to the audience. John Power is setting up a microphone. So if you have questions, you'll line up and uh, let's get started. I'd like to talk about freedom to innovate, corporate capture, and privacy. On your Twitter account last week, you tweeted a question. Are we moving towards a society where you have to get permission from the government to innovate? And you said, under your watch, that would not happen. How, as president, would you make sure that you don't need permission to innovate? To innovate. Um, well, first of all, I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you crypto fans. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I saw... Uh, I got, for those of you who don't know, who haven't heard my story, I got, I knew about Bitcoin and about the different cryptocurrencies, mainly from my kids who, who had bought some early on. Um, but I got, I did not pay attention. I was on the sidelines. And during the COVID epidemic, I saw what happened to the truckers in Ottawa. And in Ottawa, we had been following my organization. My, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my, my organization, Children's Health Defense, had been, had been following the truckers and had been supporting them. And we had a reporter who was embedded with them. Is somebody... Folks, let's give him the courtesy of an audience. Nobody's paying to be in this event. Let's give him the courtesy of an audience. Thank you. Uh, anyway, the, the, the truckers had, had the, the truckers had come from all across Canada and assembled in Ottawa to exercise rights that we all take for granted, the right to assemble, the right to petition their government, and the right to protest. <laughs> um, and the, the government of, of Canada responded by labeling them as radicals, as right-wingers, as racists, which was not true. If you saw the videos of the trucker strike, it was like Woodstock. There were people there who were, they were sharing water, they were playing music, they were picking up garbage, they were acting kindly towards each other. But the government used that as an excuse to use facial recognition system and other surveillance technologies to determine the, through the license plates to determine the, and, other, and other methods to determine the identities of the truckers and then to shut down their bank accounts. And 
Uh, they couldn't pay their mortgages. They couldn't purchase diesel for their trucks. They couldn't feed their children. One trucker told me that he, he couldn't pay his alimony and he was facing a prison term. And it occurred to me at that point that if a government has a right to shut down your bank account, that they have the, right, they have the capacity to enslave us, to commit any kind of atrocity. And that it occurred to me... Oh, come on. Okay, you made your point. Let's get back to listening to the presidential candidate, please. Hey, this is a peaceful crowd. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right, let's hear about the truckers. This is quite a story. Anyway. It occurred to me at that point that transactional freedom was as important to a free society as the guarantees of freedom of expression. As the First Amendment means nothing if the government, if you have the right to free speech, but the government has the right to shut down your bank account and to starve you to death if it doesn't agree with your speech. And that's when I started getting interested in, in cryptocurrencies and alternative currencies. And during the Great Depression, my grandfather was the commission, first commissioner of the SEC. And at that time, there were over 3,000 local currencies in this country. And some of them outperformed the dollar. And, uh, and it, uh, all of the... The more I learned about cryptocurrency, the more important it, it occurred to me that this is the off-ramp for our addiction to the Fed, to the printing of money. And to, this, and to the off-ramp from the monopolistic banking system, the globalist banking system that is, using, uh, that is using money printing to fund the wars and to shift wealth upward to this new oligarchy of billionaires while impoverishing the rest of us. And that crypto takes the, 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 the control away from the government and away from these monopolistic institutions and guarantees all kinds of freedom. And among the freedoms that we're concerned about is the freedom to keep the fruits of your labor, which inflation robs you of. And this is, you know, cryptos are the best hedge against inflation. And, and by the way, you know, I, after I went to the Miami conference, I bought a bunch of Bitcoins for my kids. And, and I'm going to buy some Ethereum after I leave this place. But, I, but I, you know, that, this is the way that we preserve wealth. And at that point, we've seen cryptos go up, very, particularly Bitcoin, radically in the last couple of weeks. And the reason for that, we had to, somebody had to sue SEC to remove the barriers against, uh, against crypto and to allow ETFs to exist. Now, when I bought my crypto, it was very hard to, diff, to it was very difficult to invest in cryptocurrency. And there's only, it was really only available to about 3% of the people in the world. And they were the people who were like libertarians, or they were cyberpunks, or they're people who were just curious about freedom or about innovative technologies and had the energy and uh, 
the drive to figure out how do you buy a Bitcoin? How do you buy an Ethereum coin? How do you buy a stable currency? Most people wouldn't do that. So there was only about 3% after the after SEC was sued and ETFs now come out and you have BlackRock and all these other companies who are investing in cryptos. We're now seeing price honesty. We're seeing the, the price and value discovery. So the value of these currencies is skyrocketing now because people are beginning to understand that this is a hedge against inflation, that it has an intrinsic value. And we're seeing that real value reflected in the prices, these, you know, these big spikes and the prices that we're experiencing in this space. So, um, you know, it's about freedom, all kinds of freedoms, the freedom to keep the, the fruits of your labor, freedom of speech, and all the other freedoms that we care about, the transactional freedom. That was, a, that was great. I have a theory that if we had asked for permission to innovate the innovation of a stable coin, the US government would have said no. This industry is who created the stablecoin. And Paul Volcker was famous for saying uh, about 30 years ago, the f financial system really hadn't innovated anything new since the ATM. I think stablecoins are a real innovation, but having formed a bank and <laughs> applied to the Federal Reserve and been denied, I can tell you from experience, I think there would not have been permission to innovate had we asked for it. So how, as president, would you ensure that all this regulation that has been built up to stop us, which we've had to go to the court system to sue in order to block, how would you ensure that that's all torn down? Well, I would say that the federal government at this point is making a war on cryptocurrencies and that it's doing everything that it can that it possibly can do to, to end the innovation in cryptocurrencies. And the impact is that it's driving it offshore, it's driving it to Asia, the parts of Europe, and we should be, as president, I'm going to make this country the hub of, of uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain innovate and stablecoin innovation for the world. And, you know, I'm going to do that I'm going to do that with a number of innovate of a number of things. I'm going to end the war by the OCC, the F FDIC on the banks that are actually trafficking in in cryptos. I'm going to I'm going to make sure that people can own their own wallets in Bitcoin. They can own their own nodes. They can, and that and that can I can I finish and. I, I'm, as president of the United States, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, and I'm going to, uh, and I'm going to make, I'm going to make regulation energy neutral. You have Jamie Dimon this week made a statement, and Jamie Dimon has more influence over the federal government than anybody, including Larry Fink. And Jamie Dimon said that his plan for cryptocurrencies was to regulate them out of existence. So, and I think that that is exactly what President Biden is doing now. I'm going to change that. I'm going to make sure that our banks are crypto friendly. Um, that, yeah, that are, and I, you know, I want to end the taxation of 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 uh, Bitcoin, which is now taxed as a security, and we sh it should not be a security. There are issues. There are issues with Bitcoin because I don't want to create a windfall for BlackRock and some of the other, you know, mega owners. But small transactions of all cryptocurrencies should be uh, should be untaxed. They should be. You should be able to buy. You should be able to buy an, a, an apple, a beer, uh, or a, an automobile using crypto without having it taxed for the value that it's accrued since you purchased it. And so those are some of the things that I'm going to do to free up transactional freedom. Well, you certainly got a cheer from the crowd on the taxation point, <laughs> obviously. 
uh, pretty much everybody here owns, owns crypto to some degree. One thing you said in your campaign really struck me, that in your career you've sued the government more than 500 times, and that as learning from that process, you know how to take these federal agencies apart, and you know the people. You, you said many of the people have, are, are well-meaning, uh, but they've been sort of forced into a corrupt system. So how do you dismantle those agencies, and what is your experience from having sued the government so often? I, I haven't sued the government 500 times. I brought over 500 lawsuits against uh, against polluters, against pharmaceutical industry. But um, probably about 20 percent of those, probably about 20 percent of those lawsuits have been against, been against government agencies. I've sued. I've probably sued EPA more than any other attorney. I've sued the Department of Agriculture. I'm involved in litigation right now involving the Department of Transportation. I've sued FDA, CDC, NIH, uh, USDA, uh, et cetera. And when you sue them, when you sue these agencies, you get a PhD in corporate capture, and you understand how to unravel it. And you, you know, for me, in many of these agencies, I understand who the particular individuals are who need to be moved. I could tell you their names right now, um, but also the perverse incentives that put agency capture on steroids. Now, I've never sued the Fed, but I know what I want to do with the Fed, which is to restore transparency, to restore sovereignty, to make sure that the Fed is not, um, is not a tool of Wall Street, that if the Fed is doing what it is, you know, either way, I'd love to dismantle the Fed altogether. Uh, but I'm also new. dealing with, and that's what my uncle also understood that, which is why my uncle, John Kennedy, launched right before he died the silver certificate and the and the gold certificates because he understood the importance of base currency he came from a financial family family and he understood how the fed had been captured even back then by wall street to create these inflationary inflationary cycles that were driving wealth upward and, and serving to consolidate wealth and to consolidate the power of the wall street banks the Fed originally was created by, in order to, uh, to make solvent, stable financial institutions during financial crises and to create liquidity. Uh, but it has devolved into a different function. And I am going to unravel that. And I'm going to, uh, and I, as I said, I'm going to restore sovereignty and transparency to that institution. And I'm going to make it so that so that Main Street is the focus of American political economy rather than Wall Street. And, and that, you know, that, that's gonna be the center of all of my policies, to restore Main Street and, and to, to, to put the reins on Wall Street. Thank you. That, that's news. I had not seen that that was your view of the Federal Reserve before, and I really appreciate that you shared that with us today because I think you're in a, a crowd that understands the significance of that and how the Federal Reserve has played a role in picking the pockets of the average American through the mechanism of inflation. And having worked on Wall Street and witnessed some of those mechanisms where people's pockets are being picked, not necessarily nefariously. Again, it's the way the system is set up. That's part of the reason why I left to come into this industry, because I understood that there are very subtle skimming mechanisms where people's pockets are being picked. The Dole Food case is a perfect example of it. The Wall Street ledger system created one third more shares than were actually issued. Anytime you get an excess supply of something, 
leaving demand and all else equal, what happens? The price drops. So the legitimate owners of Dole Food shares had their pockets picked, and some of it was nefarious, some of it was not, but that's the dishonesty of the ledger system of Wall Street. The fact that the SEC didn't do anything about that is shocking to me, and this is the system that we have. I think a lot of folks out there know that there's something wrong with it, that there is something nefarious, they're absolutely right, but it's subtle, and I really appreciate that you shared that, that insight with us today. Let's talk a little bit more about corporate capture because that is one of your big campaign themes, and you've witnessed it from your lawsuits against the government. How other than, than dismantling the agencies do you fix corporate capture? How do you get money out of politics? What would you do? Well, the, you know, the biggest contributor to corporate capture was the Citizens United case. And it's, it is, uh, unfortunately, it's hard to do anything about that. And for those of you who don't know Citizens United, we actually lost our democracy uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, the Gilded Age, where you had a, a handful of families, the Whitneys, the Morgans, the Carnegies, the Fricks, who were controlling these big trusts, the uh, steel trusts, the sugar trusts, the rail trusts, et cetera, the oil trusts. They had uh, overlapping boards. And they, and at that time in history, there, were, there was no direct election of senators. So the senators were chosen by the state legislatures. And the legislatures were easily purchased and owned by this cabal of families. It was said of the Pennsylvania state legislature that it was the only legislature in the country where nobody was for sale because John D. Rockefeller already owned them all and he wasn't selling any of them. But they could pick the Senate, they could pick the presidents of the United States. And there were no taxes at that time. There was no income taxes. There were no corporate taxes. Oh, you had a group of, you had a confluence of events. You had the progressive uh, movement, which was Republican form in the cities, the populist movement, which is Democrat form in the countryside. You had these, uh, these uh, muckraking journalists like Ida Tarbell and Upton Sinclair, who came along and started exposing John D. Rockefeller and the other robber barons as crooks. And they wrote these extraordinary articles for McClure's, which everybody in our country read. And you had the election of a president who was part of the oligarchy, but he was not intimidated by it. And he was a populist at heart, Teddy Roosevelt. And, Ro and, and Roosevelt created during those administrations, created the, uh, uh, the graduated income tax, the corporate income tax, so corporations had to pay their fair share of our national bills for the first time in history. They created the 40-hour work week. They, they allowed unions to organize. They gave women the vote. Uh, they, uh, they, and they created in 2000, and they created their Sherman Antitrust Act and broke up the Standard Oil Company. The most important bill that they passed to save democracy was a bill that they passed in 2008, or 1908, sorry, that made it illegal for corporations to donate to federal political candidates. And that rule, that, that rule stood for 102 years. And then a business-friendly Supreme Court threw it out in 2010 in the Citizens United case, and they said that monetary contributions to a politician are the equivalent of speech, and therefore they're protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. So because it is a constitutional finding by the highest court in the land, it is very, very difficult to unravel that bill. And that was when this real, this ex amplification, this acceleration of corporate capture on steroids really began. And so now there's things that you can do that I can do as president, because I've been in this space for 40 years thinking about how to unravel it, and I know how to do it by going agency by agency and fixing the problems. You know, there are generic problems like the revolving door, Right now, uh, I think 
six of the last seven FDA commissioners are now working for the pharmaceutical companies. And that's true across all of these industries. And you can fix that by saying, or by passing an executive order, saying that you have to wait five years before you go work for an industry that you regulated. And we should have that at least five years. You know, during, you know, President Trump promised that he was going to drain the swamp. Uh, but he came and he appointed John Bolton to run the NSA, who is the template for a swamp creature. <laughs> and he, he put Scott Gottlieb, who was a business partner of Pfizer, to run FDA. And Gottlieb did a $100 billion favor for Pfizer, and then he went back to Pfizer. So he's now on Pfizer's board collecting his payoff. And if you look at every one of those agencies, they were being run by swamp creatures, by people from, who were part of the industry that agency is supposed to regulate. And I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to bring in people who are honest. I know myself. I'm going to be directly involved in and in running and unraveling corporate capture in each of these agencies. I'm going to bring in people who, like you who are going to help me unravel the Fed and its control of our society. <laughs> and Catherine Austin Fitz. <laughs> For the record, I did not know he was going to say that, so thank you. But I, but I actually want to, want to pull on that thread. Richie Torres, who is one of the most popular representatives in Congress for defending the right to transact, the freedom to innovate, he made a comment recently that struck me, which is that in Congress, they're sending the, bill, the draft bills to the agencies, and the, draft, and the agencies are effectively drafting the bills. And I thought about that from my own experience, that the regulations have become so complicated that the elected officials can't possibly know them all. And that puts an incredible amount of power in the hands of the agencies. And Richie was openly questioning on the stablecoin bill why they're, they're, they're consulting with the agencies who have tried to kill this industry. So how do you literally tear down the regulatory structure to simplify it so that the elected officials can have the power again? Yeah, I'm actually more worried about, um, about the industrial, about industry's control over, the, over Congress. Oh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, the oil industry, the coal industry, the chemical industry, which I've seen firsthand throughout my career. But also, if you look who's controlling, you know, each of their, their agencies are captured. They become sock puppets for the industry they're supposed to regulate. And if you look, the CIA is a sock puppet for the military-industrial complex. Its function is to provide a steady pipeline of forever wars. or Raytheon and General Dynamics and Northrop Grumman and Boeing and Lockheed. That's who it's working for. It's not working for the American public. My uncle understood that in 1961 when he came into power. Four months in, you know, when the, during the Bay of Pigs, when he had been, he realized he'd been lied to, to his agents, by his agency and by the, the military brass. He said publicly he took blame for it, but privately he said to his aides, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And, but also, the Fed is a captive agency by the banking industry. Jamie Dimon and Larry Fink run the Fed. It's not working for you and me. It's working for it to enrich, you know, to flood the canyons of Wall Street with money. And that is, you know, that, uh, that's much more concerning to me than the agencies. The agencies, you know, have, the agencies have too much power because they're owned by the industry. It's not because the, the agency didn't have too much power when it was working for the American public. But they don't do that. The health agencies are not working for public health. They're working to keep us sick because the agency, the, the, the group that controls them, the pharmaceutical industry, 
profits from chronic disease. It's now $4.3 trillion a year we're spending on chronic disease, and nobody's even doing research on it at NIH. So that's a big problem. And, but, you know, I, I, like all of these agencies are controlled by an industry, and I think that is the biggest threat to American democracy. Yeah, th thank you. That is, that, that, what struck me when I saw that interview was you said that you were the man for the time because of the need to take power out of Washington, D.C., and the experience that you had had from suing an agency, which, uh, which I've only done once, but, uh, and we don't know the outcome yet. Uh, let's talk a little bit next about privacy. Y you started by talking b uh, at the beginning of this with, uh, about the story of the truckers in Canada. Everybody, all the shadowy super coders in this room are working on creating a more honest financial system by using a more honest ledger. It's really that simple. And the, the, what happened with the, the truckers in Canada that struck you has, is happening a lot. And a lot of it has to do with privacy. Yesterday, most of you don't even know this, I sat up here on this stage yesterday talking about regulation and mentioned the Corporate Transparency Act. Well, the, last night, an Alabama federal district judge struck down the Corporate Transparency Act as unconstitutional. Now, the, the impact on all of you is that DAOs would not be able to comply with the Corporate Transparency Act. That was an attack by the Biden administration on our sector, and a federal judge set, struck it down last night. So let's talk a little bit about financial privacy and, and the right to transact. Yeah, I mean, the, first of all, I think that's one of the great, um, you know, uh, one of the, the, the role that this group, that's very, very critical for this group to, uh, to play, particularly as AI comes on the scene, and that, um, which really, you know, is an is a opportunity for innovation, an opportunity to benefit our lives, but also a real threat to human freedoms and human sovereignty over our own lives and existence. And one of the things, one of the safeguards, the bulwarks against the, these encroachments by AI is, to, is the requirement for open source um, algorithms. And, uh, and then, you know, and, and the potential also for smart contracts and all the other benefits that we can get from smart chain for, uh, I mean, from, um, from blockchain for our economy, but also for our freedom. The, the reigning case in privacy now is the Carpenter case, which was a good case in that it said that the, the Carpenter case was a case about, uh, about uh, using cell phones and GPS systems to, to track somebody. And the court said that that use, that the, that the federal enforcement agencies needed to get a warrant to get your GPS tracking information from your cell phone or from other GPS sources. That, that was a protected privacy right. But they also said at the same time, and that's, that was a very good decision, they also said in the same decision that um, if you voluntarily give your information to a company, then that is not protected from federal investigations. Oh, you all know that if you rent a car, or if you buy a cell phone or whatever, that you have to sign these, uh, these terms and condition contracts. When you rent a car, you are giving all of your information, the speed you drive, the distance you go, the, the places you go, but also the conversations that you have in that car that are picked up by microphones. That is all owned by Hertz or Avis or Budget. And what this federal case said is that since you voluntarily gave it to them, that it is now discovering, it is that the federal enforcement agencies, the FBI, can get that information from those companies without a warrant. So I think that is a really catastrophic decision because you and I all know 
that we sign these terms and condition contracts with our, our companies and that they're, they're using that to, to harvest information. It's the new oil rush. You know, Siri knows everything about you. You voluntarily allowed, signed a contract for that. Siri is not working for you. They're working for Bill Gates and you know, all these people are harvesting information. And now all of that information is available to the government enforcement agencies without a warrant. And that's wrong. Um, they need, they should get a warrant. It is a, it, a real incursion on all of our privacy. We have the, uh, the, the ability to overturn that. The, Congre uh, the Supreme Court has at least opened the door to that. I think we've seen the abuse of it from both, both parties. We saw the abuse of it uh, when General Flynn was unmasked. They got every financial transaction and every cell phone ping he'd ever, his cell phone had ever pinged. And we're witnessing it right now with the Biden family's finances being spread out in the newspapers because the government was able to get access to all of these transactions without a warrant. It used to be that the ACLU fought for these things. The ACLU did fight for uh, the, the, the uh, uh, defendant in the Carpenter case. And the Supreme Court held that the data, the government needed a warrant and said, you cannot live in a modern society without giving your data away. And that doesn't mean that the government should be able to go to private sources and just buy it and prosecute you without a warrant. Uh, so uh, how, would you, how would you weigh the, the policy of, of law enforcement against the need for privacy, especially speaking to a lot of folks in this audience who are experts in cryptography? Well, I, I would do a, a number of things. One of the things as soon as I get into office, my first day in office, I'm going to issue an executive order against, um, against any federal agency participating in censorship with the social media companies or the media companies and <laughs> restoring, restoring the prohibition, which is in its charter of the CIA propagandizing Americans. Uh, but I'm also going to work on legislate. I'm going to use the White House as a bully pulpit to explain to the American public the importance of privacy, the, uh, the, the dangers of having these companies that can, that, that can take our information and turn them over to the government. And I'm going, to, I'm going to use the power of the executive order anywhere that I can to prohibit under my administration any federal agency from harvesting that kind of data without a warrant. And I'm going to try to persuade Congress to pass a law making that kind of data harvesting illegal by U.S. enforcement agencies, and particularly the CIA. Thank you. Wow, I think that got uh, more applause than even the tax, uh, the tax policy announced earlier. All right, I'm looking out at the audience to see where the Q&A is starting. Uh, let's see. Um, it's over. It's, all right, here we go. Can you guys hear me over here? Yes, we can. John, far away. Hey. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to ask a question, but I'm going to be helping curate over here. So we got some interested folks to ask some questions. We're going to go for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll say our adieus. Okay, so after the 20 minutes, I'm coming up on stage, though, so don't go anywhere. Okay. Okay. All right, do we have number one? Okay, who has got the first question? Go ahead. All right, well, first off, thank you for being here. Um, I, th I think I speak with all, all of us. Thank you for being here. Um, my name's, yeah, seriously. My name's Tyler, TY Crypto. Um, I got a question for you here. So in terms of elections, we hear a lot, of, a lot of bull with elections. You can put elections on a blockchain. Is that something that you would look into as president so that we can have fair and free elections for the first time in... I can't even tell you how long. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea. You know, my objective is to get, is to have elections in this country that everybody has faith in, that it make it as easy as possible to vote, and that it, nobody, nobody in this country suspects that the vote is rigged or fixed. So if you can come up with me, to me, with a, with a plan for doing that, 
I will do everything in my power to, um, to promote it. And if blockchain is the answer, then that's a great answer. Thank you. You said that you said that your grandfather was the first commissioner of the SEC. Uh, so, based on that, what are your thoughts on politicians doing insider trading, like Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> I, I would want. I, I think that should be forbidden. She's an incredible investor, though. And I, <laughs> really, I know. That, so my kids showed me a site the other day that just follows her investments. It's like a, a fund. Um, because she's such a genius. Uh, yeah, I think it should be illegal. Thank you. Uh, uh, just, just one last thing, one last question. If it's... So, I, I just want to say I work for a company that, in, that called Inside4, and what we do is we track uh, inside trading. I have the website on the back of my hoodie. Inside4.com, it's a good domain. Hear. So we, we actually track inside trading. So check it out, Inside4.com. Okay, thank you. Hello, how's everybody doing? Um, so my question is, if uh, you're elected president, what would you immediately do about the 17,000 orphans that are in Palestine killed by Israel's unjust bombing of their country? You mean, what would I do about, the, about ending the war in Gaza? Is that what you're saying? Specifically or, around the orphans that have had their family members killed and don't have anybody to rely on. The 17,000 well, of them since October, specifically in the thousands more since before then. Yeah, I mean, I would do everything I can to make sure those orphans are taken care of, that they're not starving, that they're receiving medical care. And I think that should be a priority of U.S. policy in the region. Uh, given your inclination towards privacy and security, would you support repealing the Patriot Act? Yeah, I would have repealed the Patriot Act the first day it was passed. You just made news again. Uh, you know, the Patriot Act also has a provision in it, you know, it's 342 pages. There's only one member of Congress that actually read it, and that was Dennis Kucinich, who was running my campaign. And he voted against it, as did, I think, a couple of other people. But, you know, they passed it, and it was just an assault on the Constitution. It was the beginning of this assaults, of all of these assaults that uh, culminated in COVID. In COVID, we saw the First Amendment abandoned. I just want to lawsuit a week ago against, uh, against Biden um, for censoring my speech and for censoring other people's speech. Uh, but we saw um, President Biden 37 hours after he took the oath of office, and this is in the federal judge opinion in my case, he was contacting his White House was contact, uh, contacting Facebook, Instagram, Google, YouTube, and telling them, and Twitter, and telling them that, that if they didn't remove me from their platforms, that, um, that the White House was going to try to abolish their Section 230 protection. So Section 230, as most of you know, is a, a section of the Communications Act, and it makes it so that those companies are immune to defamation suits from people who are defamed by posts that they put on their platforms. I, I used to write a lot of op-eds for the New York Times. And whenever I wrote an article, these only 800-word articles, I would have to spend about an hour on the phone with lawyers at the New York Times who were going through every factual assertion to make sure it wasn't defamatory. So when the, when the social media sites started, 
they realized that they could not be responsible for vetting every post. If they had to have a, a lawyer look at every post, their model simply couldn't exist. So Congress collect, um, uh, created a provision called Section 230 that said, because if, some, if I wrote something defamatory in the New York Times, the person who I defamed could sue not only me, but they could sue the publisher. Oh, they, 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 this was existential for the social media sites. They could not, they would, they would not exist if that rule applied to them. So Congress gave them exemption saying that if somebody publishes something defamatory on their site, you can sue the guy who posted it, but you cannot sue Twitter or Facebook or Google. And their, their whole business model is dependent on that. Well, the Biden administration was saying, we are gonna end that if you do not censor these people. And it wasn't just me, it was many, many hundreds of people. And the companies caved in and they gave portals that were used by the CIA, the FBI, DHS, and IRS. I don't know why, but IRS was also using those portals where they could go in and the agency could actually censor material. And I was removed from Instagram. I lost almost a million followers. And then from then on, I had to, you know, I, I had to self-censor on Twitter and these other platforms. So for two and a half years, I was, you know, publishing pictures of unicorns and kitty cats and, you know, uh, and I was not putting anything controversial on my site because I knew they were going to throw me off and then I'd lose all those followers who I wanted to com communicate with. So anyway, that, you know, we need to end that. We need to end the censorship and we need to make it, you know, and, and by the way, in Europe, it's even worse than it is here. In Europe, the European community has recently adopted a rule in France and Germany that if you criticize a, um, a, a, an mRNA vaccine, that it's a penalty of up to $50 million. So, you know, none of these sites are going to allow anything on there that is controversial at all. It's the end of free speech. And we need, you know, the, the, the Trump administration was doing it too, the Biden administration, and we need to have free speech back in this country. I deeply appreciate your views on the freedom to transact. And my question is, does that apply only to Americans or to everyone everywhere? Uh, in this room, we're no big fans of the SEC and Gary Gensler, but the organization that's probably caused more harm would be FinCEN and OFAC and regulations would say hundreds of millions of people on this planet are designated as basically terrorists. This is what got Binance in trouble with their multi-billion dollar settlement. It's what was used for basis for uh, the founders of Tornado Cash in prison. And so, would love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I, I could not hear the question. What it, yeah. can you, you? The, the freedom to transact, does that apply yeah. only to Americans or to people everywhere? This was the basis it, for, you know, Tornado Cash founders being thrown in prison, for the Binance founder having a multi-billion dollar settlement because of OFAC violations. Yeah, I mean, I, as President of the United States, I'll only have control over what happens here in this country. Other countries are going to have their own rules and, you know, countries like China are going to have very, very different regulations than we have here. You know, right now, um, there are many countries, Switzerland, Belgium, Portugal, Singapore, that have better laws than we do. They do not tax transactions in Bitcoin. And, um, and you know, they, if their industries and their, their, uh, uh, their cryptos have a big economic advantage over us. I want to bring the hub of innovation back to this country, and that means stopping the taxation of small transactions for, for cryptos. Could I ask a follow-up to that? How, how do you balance 
No, none of us wants human traffickers using our technology. How do you balance that against the legitimate privacy uses of those technologies? And related to that, the, uh, could you comment on the policy of weaponizing the US dollar against, uh, against our enemies and weaponizing the US dollar system in particular? The weaponization of the US dollar has, uh, has, uh, has degraded its position as the global reserve currency. It's one of the reasons for the emergence of BRICS. And that is an enormous threat to the American economy. If we lose that status as the global reserve currency, we'll see the absolute collapse of the American dollar, which could happen anyway. I mean, I saw, it, it, we, we now have $34 trillion in debt that we're loading on our children. In the last 100 days, we've run up an additional trillion dollars in debt. Oh, that alone, you know, we're now, the service on our debt, even at the current interest rates, which are, are historically pretty low, um, we are paying more to service our debt than the entire military budget. By 2030, at this rate, our every dollar that's going to be collected in taxes is going to be go, is going to go to service the debt, and that obviously is not sustainable. Oh, there are other threats to the U.S. dollar that I think are even more grave than the weaponization of foreign policy, but I think. It's a very dangerous game to weaponize the dollar as a, as a tool in foreign policy. It's very tempting, but it's very, very dangerous because it's going to cause these nations to walk away from the dollar. And related to that, how about the, the privacy point uh, of the question that the, the questioner well, asked? I mean, listen, you know, I don't know exactly how Ethereum works, but I know in Bitcoin, every transaction ultimately is traceable. Oh, if you want to stop the black market, there are ways for law enforcement agencies to, you know, to track that down. What I would say to you is that if it comes to law enforcement and stopping bad things from happening around the globe, you know, drug trade, even human trafficking, or our protection of our constitutional rights and privacy, I would put constitution and privacy first. And I would say, if we, if we have to choose, if there's no other choice but that, I would have to go with the constitution and privacy. Oh, you know, I think that, you know, America has always made this deal that we tie one hand behind our back when we function around the world um, because in order to protect what's great about this country and what's great is the United States Constitution and it was written for hard times. It wasn't written for easy times. There's no pandemic exception in the United States Constitution. And and the framers of the Constitution knew all about epidemics. There was two epidemics during the Revolutionary War. One of them, the armies of Virginia were decimated by uh, a malaria epidemic. There was a, a smallpox epidemic that, that absolutely debilitated the armies of New England at the very time that Benedict Arnold's army had conquered Montreal. So he had made it into the inner city, he had taken the city, but he had to withdraw the troops because, and give up Canada because he couldn't support him because so many of his people were, his troops were down with, with smallpox. And if that hadn't been so, Canada today would be part of the United States. And all of the framers, when they gathered at Philadelphia, knew that. Plus, between the end of the revolution and the beginning of the uh, and the ratification of the Bill of Rights, there were epidemics in every city in our country, smallpox, yellow fever, cholera, that killed tens of thousands of people, including family members for most of the people who were at the, uh, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Everybody was aware of it, and yet they did not put a pandemic exception, epidemic exception in the Constitution. They just said, you know, these are rights and nothing could stop them. During the Civil War, 
which was a much worse crisis for our country there, you know, than COVID. There was 659,000 Americans died. It's the equivalent of 7.2 million people today. Plus, our country was at the, at the verge of, of being torn apart. And at that time, the Confederates were sending agents provocateur to the northern cities to incite draft riots. And this was absolutely demoralizing northern morale. So Abraham Lincoln knew who those people were who were coming up from the south. And when they started to incite riots, he would arrest them put them in jail and suspended their rights to habeas corpus because it was a national emergency. That case went up to the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Roger Taney said he can't do it even if the life of the nation is at stake, even if millions of people could die, you can't do it because the Constitution is more important than anything else. And I believe the same thing. The Constitution was written for hard times, not for easy times. The First Amendment is not there to guarantee the speech that we all want to hear. It's there to guarantee the stuff that none of us wants to hear, the stuff that is <laughs> offensive and obnoxious and repellent. You know, all of that. I remember 1978, the ACLU went to bat for the Nazis who wanted to march through Skokie, Illinois, which is a Jewish neighborhood where there are a lot of Holocaust survivors. We all understood that because, because even though we were absolutely appalled by what they were saying, we had to be willing to die for their right to say it. That's what our country is about. And you know, it's not, free speech in the Constitution did not come for free. It came at a cost. And we all have to be willing to pay that cost. And you know, a government that can silence its opponents has a license for any atrocity. And uh, you know, and we have to be willing, even if you know there's tragedy, even if we have to die, we have to understand there's a lot worse things than dying. And one of those things is to live like a slave. Thank you. That was great. Uh, we're getting the hook here. I want to thank you, um, Bobby, for, for your presence here today. I also want to congratulate the audience. We had some agent provocateurs at the beginning of this, and you handled that with grace. I especially want to thank you guys here in the front row for respectfully escorting the gentleman out when he had, made, when he had said what he was going to say. That's a part of this community. We, we actually handled it with respect and grace, and I think that is the, the uh, evidence that we'd like to, to show here uh, going forward. So, John, thank you for having us. Thanks, Caitlin. Don't go anywhere real, real quick, guys. So, please, big round of applause. Thank you. So, everybody knows that we're really big on memes around here. And there was a, there was a meme that got shared on, on X yesterday. And you go you. Bruh. The Biddle meme. So when we come to Eat Denver, it's not about hodling your Bitcoins. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. Yes. But Biddle is the rally cry of the Bufficorn. Now, at opening ceremonies, we created a new club this year for those that have contributed deeply and greatly to this community in an extraordinary way. It's called the Bluff Club. And I am charged by our board to induct the both of you into the Bluff Club, which means our next two Bufficorns right here. <laughs> And we're going to biddle something. Do you want to say it? We're going to biddle back better. <laughs> now that's a... So to have that, we have a couple of little... Uh, we're big on swag here too, memes and swag. So um, Sporkdow is the 
parent of East Denver. It's community owned, it's a co-op. I'm the founder of that, but the, these guys are the owners. And we have a custom engraved golden spork. And it's numbered, there's only one of 300. And the original tokens from 2019 that were charged with the Buffa tokens to use on the food trucks, these are collector's items. They're numbered as well. And our deepest gratitude to you guys for, for having this conversation. Honestly, it exceeded my expectations. Anybody else? Now, if you are interested, we still have a little bit of space at the reception, the meet and greet that's happening near the Buffacorn Biddle Brigade Lounge right now. So if you do want to come in, Again, memes, it's $528 for the meet and greet. And if you want to get into, I'm not sure if we have any room in the VIP, but it's 5,280. Anybody know what the meme is? Mile High City, thank you. We do that all the time. So um, thank you for coming. This is the final piece of content for the weekend. So with that, we bid you Biddle. <laughs>